Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy blessing upon this parliament, direct and prosper our deliberations to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The Chief Government Whip. Uh, Mr Speaker, I present the report of the recommendations of the whips relating to committee and delegation reports and private members' business on Monday, the 9th of February 2009. Copies of the report have been placed on the table. I move that the report be adopted and indicate to all honourable members this report, of course, enjoys the support of um, the Chief Opposition Whip, the honourable member for Fairfax. Order. The question is that the report be adopted. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The clerk. Government business. Notice number one. Motion for the suspension of standing and sessional orders. The Leader of the House. Thanks, uh, Mr Speaker. I move the motion relating to the suspension of standing orders numbers 31 and 33 for this sitting and the suspension of standing and sessional orders for the consideration of bills in the terms in which it appears on the notice paper. Mr Speaker, the global financial crisis has had an enormous impact on the world economy. Australia is not immune from it. The government will not be sitting back and watching. The government will take decisive and strong action. That is what yesterday's announcement of the $42 billion nation building and jobs package does precisely. That is what the six bills that are about to be introduced into this chamber do precisely. There is an urgent need for these bills to be carried by the House of Representatives today. There is an urgent need for these bills to be carried by the Senate this week. That is because, as part of the economic stimulus, uh, tax bonuses need to be paid through the Australian Tax Office to eligible taxpayers by the beginning of April 2009. But there are also four household measures, the single income family uh, bonus and back to school bonuses. They are meant to be paid through Centrelink in the fortnight commencing the 11th of March 2009. The training and learning bonuses and the farmer hardship bonus are, are meant uh, to be paid by, uh, in, the, uh, in the period commencing the 24th of March. Centrelink, Centrelink indeed the, uh, the CEO, has advised that their strong preference is for the bills to be passed this week to enable the system changes to be made, which would enable these payments to begin in March. The nation building and jobs measures are contained in the appropriation bills with $1.7 billion of funding estimated to occur in 2008-2009. Prompt passage of the legislation is needed so the approval and administrative processes which involve other levels of government can be established and the measures begin as soon as possible. Mr Speaker, these are not ordinary times. These are times that require urgent action from the government. The government has done that. The government on the first day of sitting of this year has indicated that we are, we are prepared to take the action that is needed in the interests of the national economy and in the interests of families throughout Australia. The need for the passage of these bills uh, will be facilitated by the resolution which I have moved before the House. 
members uh, would note that uh, the resolution that I have moved before the House uh, is similar to other uh, motions that were moved uh, over the period of the previous government, with the exception that it does not contain a cut-off time for debate and a gag facilitation. We are quite prepared to engage uh, in debate uh, with the opposition uh, over the need for these measures to be carried. And I appreciate uh, the fact that, uh, that the, uh, the manager of opposition business and myself have had discussions uh, yesterday uh, about uh, these circumstances. If that means uh, the parliament uh, not rising at 8 o'clock tonight uh, in order to facilitate an increased uh, participation uh, by members, then, then so be it. Uh, I have uh, requested certainly of members on this side of the House that they do what they can to restrict uh, the time in which, uh, in which they speak uh, to these bills. We would certainly not expect uh, shadow ministers uh, who have particular uh, responsibility for uh, measures to restrict uh, their time. Uh, but uh, we would say that the more, uh, the, the, the shorter the period in which uh, backbenchers on both sides of the House uh, speak, then the, the quicker we will move to a determination of these measures. But move to a determination of these measures we will, because there, there is a need to not stand in the way of these payments. And uh, to, uh, to do that would be, frankly, totally economically irresponsible. So I commend uh, the motion uh, before the House uh, to honourable members and uh, ask for their cooperation uh, today in uh, uh, what will be uh, a difficult day but a historic day, one in which the Australian government and I hope the Australian House of Representatives, all of the House of Representatives, recognises the need to take strong action uh, as a result of the global financial crisis. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the House be agreed to. The Manager of Opposition Business. Mr Speaker, we have endeavoured to cooperate with the government uh, in having these bills introduced today. We have not seen the bills. And yet we are expected to declare a position right now on this package. We have not seen the six bills that are going to be introduced into this place today, debated in this place today and voted on in this place today. And those six bills take us into $100 billion of debt. And the government, the government has not provided us with anything more than a 45-minute briefing from Treasury where numerous questions were asked and they couldn't answer those questions. We'll get, back to you. You. we'll get back to you, says Treasury, but they want us to support measures totalling $100 billion and, from what we hear, an extension of the nation's credit card from a limit of $75 billion to $200 billion. And you know what, Mr Speaker? The government has had this in train for some time. We have not been party to this process. They never invited us, other than us offering to be party to it. They never engage us. This, this, this piece of paper, this document, updated economic and fiscal outlook, there weren't enough copies to go to all the members of parliament. We couldn't even get copies of the document that is the basis for the argument of $42 billion of spending. You know what, Mr Speaker? Order. This is panic from the government. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, you know what we're going to do? We're going to facilitate the government's passage and debate of this bill. But I tell you what, we will not be gagged. We will not, under any circumstances, 
be in a position where the government rams through, through the biggest spending initiative in Australian history and they do it at their convenience and they tell us to shut up and sit down and just vote for it. They're telling us, the government is telling us, this is a take it or leave it package and we're not going to show it to you, but you just support it and shut up and sit down. Well, I tell you what, Mr Speaker, if this chamber has to sit till five o'clock tomorrow morning, and so far as we're concerned, we'll go through the night, but no member of the opposition will be denied the right to speak on the biggest spending initiative in Australian history. We will not be silenced. And I promise, Mr Speaker, whilst we recognise that there is an issue to be dealt with before the chamber, I say this. The government's attitude on this has not only been immensely uncooperative, the fact that they have brought before this House bills we haven't seen, the fact that they have demanded that we support those bills, bills that we still uh, do not have, that we have to declare a position on $42 billion of spending, which we have not seen the details of and cannot be explained, for us to support all of these initiatives and to vote on it in one day means that they are saying to us, you have to support $42 billion in 42 hours. And you know what? We care more about taxpayers' money than doing that. So, Mr Speaker, I will cooperate with the Leader of the House. This is going to be a very long day because the government has said to us, take it or leave it. And by doing so, by not giving us copies of the bills, by simply saying, please give us carte blanche to spend every dollar that is not only available today, but $2,000 for every man, woman and child in debt, not just uh, this year, but next year and for many years to come, they are saying to us, we are holding a gun to your head, pass these bills or we're going to shoot. And you know what, Mr Speaker? Uh, that is very dangerous politics for the government. But we will, we will cooperate by allowing the government to have a cognate debate. We look forward to seeing these bills, which no one has seen to date. Order. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the House be agreed to. The Leader of the House. Thanks, thanks Mr Speaker. If I could just sum up uh, the debate and uh, respond to uh, my colleague, the Manager of Opposition Business, some of the points that, uh, that he has made. There is um, an enormous difference between the way that the government handles procedures in this House and the way that the former government handled procedures in this House. Yeah, yeah. The former government, the former government, would have brought on these bills and had a debate and a vote before two o'clock. That's what the former government would have done, because that is, that is, that is, and 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 the former government made it a uh, a, a, a a regular procedure to come in here, to come in here, table bills move them, gag them within hours of them being introduced with no briefings. Opposition, the opposition received full briefings yesterday about this legislation. Full briefings. Full briefings. The shadow minister for family and community services wasn't in his office last night, nor was anyone there when the minister attempted to uh, deliver the bills, the bills and uh, and they were left there last night. Left there last night while pa while Parliament while Parliament was sitting. The 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 manager of opposition business raises the issue of of gagging debate of gagging debate. As the manager of opposition business knows that a majority in this chamber, this chamber enables, enables that majority to be used to gag debate at any time. That was something that was used uh, regularly by uh, the former government. 
I have indicated on behalf of the government it is our intention to sit after 8 p.m. this evening in order to facilitate, facilitate debate um, in, this, in this chamber on these bills. But these bills will be carried today because I know that regardless of the position that the opposition takes, I know that each and every member who sits on this side of the chamber who represents the Australian Labor Party wants to deliver for people who they've been elected to represent. We should remember one thing. These bills actually aren't about us. They aren't about us. There are about 21 million Australians who need, who need protection, protection from the impacts of the global financial crisis. The fact is that uh, the, uh, the Shadow Treasurer's Office, as I understand it, did get the bills uh, last night, as I understand it. Um, so they were certainly delivered to the Shadow. The Shadow. Well, well, she has got it. The, the Shadow Treasurer confirms that she did indeed get the the bill that was that was relevant to her. She has just confirmed that that is the case. And the fact is, order. The fact order. is, order. The fact is that when the opposition speak about uh, about process, what they will be holding up, what they will be holding up or seeking to hold up in the House of Representatives and uh, and in the Senate is nine hundred. $950 going Order. to single-income families through the bonus. What they will be seeking to hold up is $950 going to families for the back-to-school bonuses. What they seek to hold up is $950 for the training and learning bonuses. What they seek to hold up is the $950 for the farmer hardship bonus. Let's be clear. Let, let's be clear. The member for Kalgoorlie indicates, indicates, laughing, that it is a joke that $950 will be paid to farmers. Let people in the electorate of Kalgoorlie know that the member for Kalgoorlie thinks, and he puts on the record again, a fat lot of good that will do. That is the attitude to walk from the member for Kalgoorlie. Because what this out of touch opposition don't get, just don't get, is that it's not about them. It's also not about us. It's about the public. It's about the 21 million Australians, 21 million Australians uh, concerned about the impact of the global financial crisis. So the manager of opposition business suggests that we demand that they vote for this legislation. We do no such thing. We do no such thing. It is up to them to determine their position on this legislation. <laughs> however, however, we do give them we do give them a bit of constructive and helpful advice, which is when you have no alternative plan, when you have no solution to the, the crisis that confronts us, when you simply stand in the road and say, don't give bonuses to working families, don't give back to school bonuses, don't give bonuses to, to farmers, don't engage in economic stimulus, then we simply say that that is an unwise course for the opposition to take. And they take that road at their peril, at their peril because there will be a political price to pay if they stand in the way of this $42 billion package, which has been welcomed by families, which has been welcomed by community organisations, which has been welcomed by the business community, which has been welcomed by the National Farmers Federation. They can isolate themselves if they wish to do so. And when they vote on these bills, that is what they will be doing if they oppose these bills, but that is their choice. 
their choice. But already we've seen last year an opposition incapable, incapable, regardless of how much time they're given to look and peruse legislation, to get briefings. We saw them in the Senate, in the Senate on the last night of Parliament, whereby on the nation-building legislation before that chamber, they voted three ways. Some voted in favour of it, some voted against it, and some went to the toilet. That was their position on nation building. Three way split across the Liberal Party, across the National Party, no idea. Well, I say learn the lessons of the Senate debacle for the coalition at the end of last year. Learn the political lessons that are there. Have the debate today. Engage in constructive dialogue uh, across the chamber, but bear in mind, bear in mind that when you're talking about blocking, for example, for example, the back to school bonuses, you're actually not talking about blocking the back to school bonuses for our kids, because none of us have got family tax benefit aid. You're talking about the people who elected us in this chamber to represent. So I commend the resolution uh, to the House. I also commend uh, the bills that will be introduced to the House. Order. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the House be agreed to. All those with that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order. I have received a message from Her Excellency the Governor-General recommending, in accordance with section 56 of the Constitution, an appropriation for the purposes of the Appropriation National Nation Building and Jobs Bill No. 2. 2008-2009. Treasurer. I present the Appropriation Nation Building and Jobs Bill No. 2, 2008-2009 and the explanatory memorandum. Clerk. First reading, a bill for an act to appropriate money out of the Consolidated Revenue Fund for a certain expenditure in relation to nation building and jobs and for related purposes. The Treasurer. Uh, Mr Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a second time. Mr Speaker, the unfolding global economic story reminds us daily that we find ourselves in the midst of the most significant global economic crisis since the Great Depression. And as our international circumstances get harder and harder, the government gets more determined and more determined. Its severity has grown since the release of the government's $10.4 billion economic security strategy in October last year and has become even more serious since the mid-year economic and fiscal outlook that I released in November. Projections of world growth, including by the International Monetary Fund, continue to deteriorate to a much greater extent than many envisaged at that time. The largest advanced economies in the world are already in recession, bringing the loss of millions of jobs. This global recession, the slowdown in the mining sector and among our trading partners, particularly China, has serious consequences for Australian jobs and for Australian growth. Mr Speaker, while we find reassurance in knowing that Australia is better placed <laughs> than almost any other developed economy to withstand this fallout, we also know that we are far from immune. Although Australia has weathered the early stages of the global recession better than many other countries, the weight of the global recession is now bearing down on the Australian economy. The global mining boom that drove large increases in the terms of trade and in our national income has come to an end. Australian growth, as a result, is expected to be significantly weaker than previously anticipated. Growth for 2008-09 has been revised down from 2 per cent in my IFO in November to 1 per cent in the updated economic and fiscal outlook. And of course, unemployment will be higher. And that is precisely why the government has introduced the Nation Building and Jobs Plan 
which incorporates a $28.8 billion fund or $28.8 billion to build the schools and roads and homes and communities and energy efficiency we need for future prosperity, and $12.7 billion to boost consumption so we can support jobs right now. Jobs now and the building blocks of growth and prosperity for the future. That's the absolute essence of the nation building and infrastructure plan the Prime Minister and I announced yesterday. It's a plan that we expect to boost growth by around half a per cent in 2008-9 and three quarters to one per cent in 2009-10 and to support up to 90,000 jobs over that period. There is no guarantee our economy will not deteriorate further. Even slower growth remains a genuine threat. The only certainty here is that our country will be worse off and more Australians will be out of work if we do not act in the way that I will outline here today. Mr Speaker, the Nation Building and Jobs Plan is based on the reality that now is not the time for half measures. It's a time to be bold and it's a time to get on with it. It's weighted towards productive investment. It meets the crucial conditions for effective fiscal stimulus. It is temporary, timely and targeted. It will allow the swift construction of the schools and roads and communities we need for future prosperity. And like the economic security strategy, which boosted demand in December and January 2008, this plan will keep Australia ahead of the curve. The measures we are introducing today are critical, Mr Speaker, and they are urgent. Our plan seeks to support jobs and growth immediately through a further round of targeted tax and transfer payments. It also lays foundations for higher productivity and future prosperity through a program of infrastructure investment. The plan will contribute to our long-term productivity reform agenda, an agenda that embraces the education revolution, investing in advanced infrastructure, COAG reform and making the transition to the low-carbon economy of the future. The infrastructure investment in this bill accounts for $28 billion of the overall $42 billion cost of the plan, more than two-thirds of it. This investment will provide lasting benefits to local communities and to our national economy, as well as supporting Australian jobs during these tough times. The bill that I introduced to the House today will fund the largest and most ambitious school modernisation program in Australian history. This is the centrepiece of our nation building and jobs plan. The, build, build, the Building the Education Revolution program will fund a $14.7 billion investment in educational infrastructure over three years. It will benefit each and every one of Australia's 9,540 schools. Every single community, every single school, every single PNC, all, within a, all with a role in the nation's economic future. This is a critical investment in the education revolution. And of course, nothing is more central to our longer term economic and social development than the education of our children. We cannot provide our kids with a 21st century education if they are stuck in cramped, decaying classrooms designed for a generation of Australian children that left school many years ago. Schools that were built in the 19th and 20th centuries reflect the design standards, equipment and the needs of a different era. Under the Building the Education Revolution program, we will invest $12.4 billion in the construction of assembly halls, knowledge centres, indoor sports centres, performing arts centres and similar major improvements for all Australian primary schools, special schools and K-12 schools. Funds will be allocated to reflect school size, with $250,000 provided to small primary schools of up to 50 students and up to $3 million for large primary schools with more than 400 students. A further $1 billion in 2009-10 will be available for the construction of science laboratories and language learning centres in approximately 500 secondary schools based on assessed need. Primary and secondary schools will also be able to apply for one-off funding of up to $200,000 for maintenance and infrastructure at an estimated cost of $1.3 billion over two years. 
This package of investment will provide tangible benefits to all local communities and will provide a major boost to key educational infrastructure for Australians' children. Mr Speaker, this bill also contains vital measures to tackle the crisis in affordable housing inherited by this government after years of underinvestment. Improving the supply of affordable housing is a key part of achieving the government's goal of halving the level of homelessness by 2020. Across Australia, individuals and families in the bottom 40 per cent of earners are struggling to find affordable housing. For these people, the social housing system is a key element of Australia's social safety net. A cumulative real cut of $3 billion to public housing over the last 10 years has reduced the social housing stock and contributed to, this, to a state of poor repair. As a result, many people who needed public housing have been forced into the private rental market. This has contributed to a situation where 150,000 of the poorest households in Australia pay more than half their income in rent in the private rental market. The Commonwealth Social Housing Initiative will provide up to $6 billion to the states and territories to fund construction of approximately 20,000 new dwellings. This is a significant investment that will accelerate our progress to our 2020 goal and reduce the number of low-income households paying more than half their income in rent. The Commonwealth Social Housing Initiative will also provide an important immediate stimulus to the housing construction sector through $400 million for repairs to get existing social housing up to scratch. We have received strong support for this initiative from industry. For example, the Property Council of Australia has said every dollar that goes into const the construction sector has a multiplier effect. It is spent three times over in the economy. This makes for an ideal measure of a well thought out stimulus package. Mr Speaker, a third priority of the nation building program is community infrastructure. There is a desperate need for renewing and upgrading the infrastructure of local communities around our nation. Our nation has a large backlog of essential infrastructure projects in local communities. Much of our community infrastructure was built in the 1950s and 1960s and is in urgent need of renewal. That is clear from the response to the $300 million regional and local community infrastructure program that the Prime Minister announced at the meeting of the Australian Council of Local Government in November last year. The competitive component of that program, $50 million for strategic projects, is already heavily oversubscribed. That's why the bill I introduced to the House today includes a $500 million investment over two years to help councils to invest in critical lo local projects through the Community Infrastructure Fund. This will include community halls, tourism infrastructure, sport and recreation facilities. It is in addition to the $300 million investment announced last year, and it will provide an important boost to local economies of regional centres, towns and suburbs right across the nation. The bill also provides an additional $390 million over two years for black spots, boom gates and regional infrastructure. This will bring forward and boost capital expenditure in regional areas. It will also improve safety standards for motorists and passengers. I note the remarks yesterday from the National Roads and Motorists Association, and I quote, the NRMA warmly recognises this additional funding, particularly the fact that a substantial portion of the money will be immediately available to be spent this financial year. Black spot funding has been a major factor in improving road safety on many roads around Australia. Additional funding for these projects is fantastic." End of quote. This and the other community initiatives the government announced yesterday will provide an immediate boost to jobs and businesses in regions right across Australia, as well as providing a lasting benefit to local communities. Mr Speaker, or Mr Deputy Speaker, there will be no quick fix, no quick fix to this global recession and many of its effects are still to be felt. But the government is doing what it can to help to see Australia through. This is the first of the package of six legislative bills to give effect to its nation building and jobs plan announced on the 3rd of February. It shows the government will do, it shows the government will do whatever it takes to support Australian jobs during this difficult time, while still laying the foundations of the next generation of prosperity. 
Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, with the Rudd government's dedicated nation-building program, with initiatives like these that I've outlined today, with national unity and with national purpose, there's no reason we can, cannot emerge from this global recession stronger and more prosperous than before the global financial crisis began. I commend this bill to the House. In accordance with the resolution agreed to earlier, the debate is adjourned and the resumption of the debate is made in order of the day for a later hour this day. I have received a message from Her Excellency the Governor-General recommending, in accordance with section 56 of the Constitution, an appropriation for the purposes of the Appropriation Nation Building and Jobs Bill No. 1, 2008-2009. I call the Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I present the Appropriation Nation Building and Jobs Bill No. 1, 2008-2009 and the explanatory memorandum. Clark. First reading, a bill for an act to appropriate money out of the Consolidated Revenue Fund for the ordinary annual services of the government in relation to nation building and jobs and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill be now read a second time. Mr Deputy Speaker, this bill contains a key component of the nation building and jobs plan the government announced yesterday, the new Energy Efficient Homes Program. This program delivers on the Rudd government's commitment to comprehensive action on energy efficiency as a key plank in our response to tackling climate change. And effective action on energy efficiency will help reduce cost of living pressures for households, help reduce carbon pollution and support green jobs, driving demand in clean, green Australian industries. The program provides a $2.7 billion time-limited investment in the modernisation of Australia's housing stock, a measure that will see almost all Australian homes insulated by the end of 2011. Ceiling insulation is typically the most cost-effective energy improvement that can be made to homes, providing real, tangible and immediate benefits to Australian households. An uninsulated roof cavity can lose up to 40 per cent of a building's heat and installing installation, insulation in many cases could deliver reductions of more than 2.5 tonnes of greenhouse gases per year for the life of the dwelling. A typical household could also save around $200 in their energy costs each year through the installation of insulation. Despite this, up to 40 per cent of Australia's homes do not have insulation. The Energy Efficient Homes program will see ceiling insulation offered to all uninsulated owner-occupied homes over the next two and a half years. In the majority of cases, homeowners will not need to pay a cent. They can simply make a phone call and the government will arrange for the installation of insulation in their roof. Mr Deputy Speaker, the government is aware that those in rental properties and those who have already installed insulation in their homes will also want to play their part. This bill includes enhancements to two existing energy efficiency programs, the Low Emissions Plan for Renters and the Solar Hot Water Rebate. The Low Emissions Plan for Renters program provides rebates to landlords installing insulation in their rental properties. The government's original commitment was set it up to $500 and limited to 300,000 rental homes. This bill provides for an increase in the maximum rebate to $1,000 until 30 June 2011 and removes the cap on the number of properties that can be insulated under this program. Mr Deputy Speaker, this is an additional investment of more than $600 million and represents an unprecedented opportunity for landlords to do the right thing by their tenants and install insulation in their rental properties. This bill will also increase the maximum solar hot water rebate from $1,000 to $1,600 for households who do not access the insulation program and who replace their existing electric hot water systems with a solar and heat pump 
hot water system before 30 June 2012. Households that access this rebate could save $300 to $700 each year on their energy bills. The Energy Efficient Homes Program will see an additional $3.9 billion invested in the fight against climate change and delivers on the government's household energy efficiency commitments in the Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme white paper. Once fully implemented, these measures could reduce cumulative greenhouse gas emissions by as much as 49.4 million tonnes by 2020. That is the equivalent of taking more than one million cars off the road. This investment in energy efficiency will modernise Australia's existing housing stock and contribute to meeting Australia's 2020 target for emissions reductions. And in addition to long-term long environmental benefits, this package supports the jobs of tradespeople and other workers employed in the manufacturing, distribution and installation of ceiling insulation and solar and heat pump hot water systems. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, there's already some early indication from business that our plan will have an impact. Let me read a quote from one insulation fitter on ABC Radio yesterday who said, Our own company had to lay off a shift in one of our plants just before Christmas. We'll be putting that shift back on. Mr Deputy Speaker, this bill also provides the enabling funding necessary to see this package implemented immediately and effectively. This includes $50 million allocated over the forward estimates to ensure that the one-off payment for working Australians is delivered expeditiously. Mr. Speaker, Mr Deputy Speaker, with carefully designed initiatives like these contained in this bill, there's no reason we cannot emerge from the global recession stronger and more prosperous than we were before it. The Energy Efficient Homes Program has a role to play in supporting jobs now and building the low pollution economy and the growth and prosperity that Australians deserve for the future. I commend the bill to the House. In accordance with the resolution agreed to earlier, the debate is adjourned and the resumption of the debate is made in order of the day for a later hour this day. Clark. Notice number two, Household Stimulus Package Bill 2009. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I present the Household Stimulus Package Bill 2009 and the explanatory memorandum. First reading, a bill for an act to amend laws in order to provide payments relating to the Household Stimulus Package and for other purposes. Minister. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that this bill be now read a second time. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Treasurer has provided clear context for the government's decision to further support economic growth and jobs through the Nation Building and Jobs Plan. Demand in the economy needs to be fostered, and our economic circumstances provide the opportunity to boost necessary economic and social infrastructure. We are particularly pleased with the Building the Education Revolution initiative which will offer all Australian schools an unprecedented opportunity to enhance their level of amenity and renew and develop facilities with expected flow-ons for educational outcomes. However, our nation building and jobs plan goes beyond the rollout of key infrastructure investment. The government will provide $12.7 billion in tax bonuses and payments to low- and middle-income Australians as part of its plan to help provide further immediate stimulus to the economy and to continue to support Australian households. Widespread support will be provided to households through bonus payments under the tax and transfer system, including additional support and incentives for people to engage in education and training. These payments will complement those made in the economic security strategy and seek to broaden the spending base covered in the government's overall response to the economic crisis. Approximately 12 million individuals will benefit from the bonus payments, which will not be taxable and will not be counted for income testing purposes. The household stimulus package includes five key bonuses. 
Our back to school bonus will assist over 1.5 million families and 2.8 million children in meeting the costs of education during these difficult times through a one-off bonus of $950 per child to families with school-aged children between 4 and 18 who are eligible for Family Tax Benefit Part A. In addition to those who will receive the back-to-school bonus because they are eligible for Family Tax Payment Part A, the government has decided to extend the bonus to children aged 18 or under on 3 February 2009 who receive carer payment or disability support pension. The $2.6 billion bonus will provide an immediate boost to consumption to help support growth and jobs. To give additional assistance to families with children that have one main income earner, the government will provide a $950 one-off payment to approximately 1.5 million families who are entitled to Family Tax Benefit Part B. This measure complements the $950 tax bonus for working Australians announced as part of the government's plan, which is provided for in a separate bill. The government will further support education and training through a $513 million training and learning bonus comprising two elements. A one-off bonus of $950 will be paid to eligible students, those returning to study or training, and to certain other income support recipients to assist with costs for the 2009 academic year. The government will also provide a temporary additional incentive for eligible social security recipients to return to education and training in the form of a $950 supplement to the education entry payment and relaxation of the eligibility criteria. The training and learning bonus will assist Australia's recovery by providing for a more equipped workforce into the future. The global financial crisis is not just a city phenomenon. Our regions and rural areas will also feel the impact of the slowdown. So as part of our nation building and jobs plan, we will provide support for growth and jobs in rural and regional areas already experiencing difficult times. The government will provide $20.4 million in 2008-2009 for a one-off bonus payment of $950 to farmers and small business owners receiving exceptional circumstances related income support payments. These payments will benefit approximately 21,500 recipients. These one-off bonuses are necessary to provide an immediate stimulus to the economy given the severity of the global downturn. It is a critical part of the government's nation building and jobs plan and I commend the bill to the House. In accordance with the resolution agreed to earlier, the debate is adjourned and the resumption of the debate is made in order of the day for a later hour this day. Clark. Government Business Notice number three, tax bonus for Working Australians Bill 2009. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. On behalf of the Treasurer, I present the Tax Bonus for Working Australians Bill 2009 and the explanatory memorandum to this bill and the Tax Bonus for Working Australians Consequential Amendments Bill 2009. Clark. First reading, a bill for an act to provide for a tax bonus and for related purposes. Minister. Thank you. I move that this bill uh, be now read a second time. A key part of the government's nation building and jobs plan is to provide financial support to taxpayers. The measures contained in this bill do just that. This bill delivers the government's tax bonus for working Australians announced by the Prime Minister and the Treasurer on 3 February 2009. The plan was introduced to assist the Australian people 
deal with the most significant economic crisis since the Second World War and provide immediate economic stimulus to boost demand and support jobs. This measure, at a cost of $8.2 billion, provides financial support to around 8.7 million taxpayers and is one of five key $950 one-off payments for low- and middle-income households and individuals. The government is providing these cash payments to immediately support jobs and strengthen the Australian economy during a severe global recession. To immediately stimulate the economy in the shortest possible time, the five groups of one-off cash bonuses will be paid in March and April 2009. The tax bonus for working Australians will be paid to resident individual taxpayers who had taxable income of up to $100,000 and who paid income tax for the 2007-08 financial year after taking into account any tax offsets and imputation credits. A payment of $950 will be paid to those who had a taxable income of up to and including $80,000 for the 2007-08 income year. A payment of $650 will be paid to those who had a taxable income exceeding $80,000 to $90,000, and a payment of $300 will be paid to those who had a taxable income exceeding $90,000 up to and including $100,000. Eligibility for the payment will be determined by the Commission of Taxation, with all payments being automatically made by the, the Australian Taxation Office. The bonus will be available from April 2009 to Australian resident taxpayers who have already had their tax returns assessed. This will be the vast majority of eligible taxpayers. Taxpayers who have not yet lodged their 2007-08 tax returns will have their bonus paid following the ATO's assessment of their returns. Importantly, taxpayers should lodge their 2008 tax return by 30 June 2009 to be eligible for the bonus payment. I commend the bill to the House. In accordance with the resolution agreed to earlier, the debate is adjourned and the resumption of the debate is made in order of the day for a later hour this day. Clark. <coughs> Tax bonus for working Australians, consequential amendments, Bill 2009. Minister. Thank you. On behalf of the Treasurer, I uh, present the uh, Tax bonus for um, working Australians, consequential amendments, Bill 2009. Clark. First reading, a bill for an act to make amendments consequential on the enactment of the Tax Bonus for Working Australians Act 2009 and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill be now read a second time. This bill pro provides for consequential amendments to various acts in relation to the tax bonus payment provided for in the Tax Bonus for Working Australians Bill 2009. It ensures that the tax bonus payments are not to be treated as income for tax and welfare-related purposes. In particular, the bonus payment will be non-assessable and non-exempt income, which means that it will be disregarded for income tax purposes. In addition, the payments will not be treated as income for the purposes of social security and family assistance benefits paid by Centrelink. The bill also makes other consequential amendments relating to the administration of the bonus payment. I commend the bill to the House. In accordance with the resolution agreed to earlier, the debate is adjourned and the resumption of the debate is made in order of the day for a later hour this day. Clerk. Government Business Notice No. 4, Commonwealth Inscribed Stock Amendment Bill 2009. Minister. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. On behalf of the Treasurer, I present the Commonwealth Inscribed Stock Amendment Bill 2009 and the explanatory memorandum. Clark. Thank you. First reading, a bill for an act to amend the Commonwealth Inscribed Stock Act 1911 and for related purposes. 
Minister. <coughs> Thanks, Mr Deputy Speaker. I move that this bill be now read a second time. The outlook for the global economy has deteriorated sharply. As a result of the global financial crisis, the global economy is now facing a much deeper and more protracted recession than previously expected. Advanced economies are expected to experience the sharpest collective decline in gross domestic product in the post-war period. The key emerging economies of China and India are now forecast to slow markedly, with growth in China is expected to halve in just two years. And as a result, the global commodity boom, which has provided significant stimulus to Australian growth and incomes over recent years, is winding back. With the weight of the global recession now bearing down on the Australian economy, growth is expected to be weaker than anticipated and unemployment will be higher. It will also direct imp impact directly on the budget bottom line. The global recession has wiped out $115 billion of tax receipts across the forward estimates and moved the budget into temporary deficit. To support jobs and growth in the face of the global recession, the Rudd government has announced the $42 billion nation building and jobs plan. This will temporarily add to the deficit. This bill will ensure that the government can raise the funds required to meet this temporary deficit. The Commonwealth inscribed Stock Act 1911 provides the Treasurer with a standing authority to borrow. This standing authority to borrow is limited to $75 billion. This amendment proposes to supplement that limit by providing that, in special circumstances, the Treasurer may increase the cap by $125 billion. The current global recession and its impact on Australia is clearly such a special circumstance. The overwhelming majority of the increase in net debt is due to the collapse in tax receipts as a result of the global recession and the unwinding of the commodities boom. Rises in payments, also associated with a slowing economy, are contributing to net debt. The government's measures to support jobs and growth will also contribute. Australian government net debt will remain very low by international standards. At the end of the forward Order. estimates, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. At the end of the forward estimates, Australia's net debt is forecast to be just 5.2% of GDP, while the average net debt for OECD countries in 2010 is estimated to be around 45 per cent of GDP. The Order. government remains com Thank you, Joe. The government remains committed to its medium-term fiscal strategy of achieving budget surpluses on average over the cycle. As soon as the economy recovers and grows above trend, the government will take action to return the budget to surplus. These surpluses will be drawn upon to retire debt as rapidly as economic circumstances permit. But now, in the face of deep and protracted global recession, the government must be focused on supporting jobs and growth while investing in nation-building infrastructure, and we make no apology for that. I commend the bill to the House. Clark. Oh, in accordance with the resolution agreed to uh, early today, um, the debate is adjourned and the resumption of the debate is made in order of the day for a later at uh, this day. Clark. Uh, government business order of the day. Uh, appropriation, nation building and jobs bill number one, 2008-2009. Resumption of debate on the second reading. In accordance with the resolution agreed to early at this day, this order of the day will be debated concurrently with the Appropriation, Nation Building and Jobs Bill No. 2, 2008-2009, the Household Stimulation Package Bill 2009, the Tax Bonus for Working Australians Bill 2009, the Tax Bonus for Working Australians Consequential Amendments Bill 2009, and the Commonwealth Inscribed Stock Amendment Bill 2009. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Every time I meet a school group visiting this place, I tell them that every member and senator is working hard to make Australia a better place for them to grow up in. I say that we often disagree, 
but that everybody is focused on them. And I tell those children that this place, this parliament, belongs to them, that everyone is committed to a better future for them. I wonder today if I can say that to them again. Because every billion dollars that we spend, every billion dollars of debt we incur will have to be repaid by those children. In government, we sought to take financial burdens off the next generation, and we did so. The Future Fund did just that, relieving those children, those school children, of the burden of over $100 billion of future payments for public sector pensions. And now a Labor government is piling those burdens on those children once again. In four years, net debt will be $70 billion, around $3,300 for every man, woman and child. And the government has asked for the right just a moment ago to borrow up to $200 billion, $9,500 for every man, woman and child in Australia. Now, Mr Speaker, the plan we were presented by the Prime Minister with yesterday reeks of nothing more than panic. Far from a steady hand at the tiller, we have a government led by a man who lurches from one ill-considered, ill-thought-out economic decision to another. We have seen the catastrophic unlimited bank deposit guarantee <coughs> developed without even speaking to the Reserve Bank. We have seen the enormous harm that it did through the community, the hundreds of thousands of Australians whose savings were frozen as a consequence, the finance companies who couldn't raise money and the motor dealers who couldn't get finance. All of that, all of that flowed from an ill-considered decision, but there have been so many others. We saw the cash splash just before Christmas, and of course we have the incredible uh, proposal of the Rudd Bank to prop up commercial property values for the benefit of the big banks uh, and their profits. And in the light of all of that, all of those errors, acknowledged errors, not, not, not in dispute, even the Prime Minister's defenders acknowledge that he's made mistakes but hope that he'll make few in, fewer in the future. But in the light of all that, instead of carefully compiling a comprehensive response to this crisis over the summer, the Prime Minister spent his time writing a bizarre ideological treatise. It was as though he stepped into another world, a parallel summer fantasy dimension where Australia's economy has been wrecked by excessive regulation, by, liberal, by lack of regulation, I should say, by Liberal governments. Anybody reading his treatise could reach no other assumption, and yet we see his own deputy, the Deputy Prime Minister, saying Australia's financial and prudential regulatory system was better than world class. And his small business minister writing in The Australian today, and I quote, that Australia's financial regulation is the envy of the rest of the world. His own ministers are boasting, boasting of the stability of a financial system and its prudential and financial regulation that was put in place by the very men and women that their leader denounces as neoliberal extremists committed to letting the market rip and opposed to any form of regulation. It, it says a lot about the delusional nature of the Prime Minister at this time that not even his own ministers are prepared to sign up to his rantings. Now, we have said again and again that we are prepared to sit down and discuss with the Prime Minister the form of the responses to this economic situation. All of those offers have been rejected. Yesterday, the government presented us with its package at 12 noon. We were briefed by a handful of bureaucrats who were not able to answer even basic questions about the details of the package. They're still coming back to us on some of those issues. At 2.30 p.m., the Prime Minister read his statement, 
which we had been given at 1 p.m. And the government then, of course, went on the attack. It was irresponsible of the opposition not to immediately endorse the $42 billion package. Moreover, it had to be passed through the House and the Senate by Thursday. In other words, the Parliament of Australia would be given about 48 hours to consider and approve the expenditure of $42 billion. Now, Mr Speaker, we believe the Senate and we support the Senate coming back next week, deferring estimates to go through this plan in the greatest detail. It is vital that we do so. And one can well imagine those children, those school children of today, who as adults years hence are paying high taxes to pay off the debt, when they complain about the high taxes they're told by governments and ministers, well, we've got this big debt, you know, you've got to pay higher taxes to pay it off. And they'll, they'll ask us, what were you thinking when you spent all that money? Why did you do that? And we'll have to answer, well, we didn't have much time to think about it at all, really. <laughs> Mr Speaker, the opposition will vote against this package in the House and in the Senate. We know that this is not going to be a popular decision, but it's the right decision. The Prime Minister has made one easy decision after another. He has not made a hard decision since he took up that high office. But somebody has to stand up for what is right. Somebody has to stand up for fiscal discipline. Somebody has to stand up for the taxpayers of Australia and ensuring that we do not impose staggering levels of debt on future generations. And we will make that stand and we'll make it knowing it is unpopular but recognising that the Australian people expect us to do what is right, yeah. and we will do that. Now, this stimulus represents about 4 per cent of GDP, almost all of which is spent over the next two years, following up on the 1 per cent of GDP cash splash in December last year. Now, despite the protests of the Treasurer, the fact is the fact that this stimulus follows so hard on the heels of the earlier one indicates that the December cash splash did not work. The, uh, the general view among economists is that at least two-thirds of it was in fact saved. Now, I'm sure that much of the balance, or most of the balance, was well spent, but not all of it was, as poker machine and hotel takings demonstrate. The fundamental problem, which the government refuses in its arrogance and in its blindness to acknowledge, is that if you give people one-off windfall lump sums in uncertain times, they are more likely to save it than to spend it. That is a perfectly rational and prudent response. And indeed, the Prime Minister's call at the end of last year on Australians to spend, spend, spend is jarring. It was a jarring statement, because most Australians, all of us, I'm sure, know full well that at the core of this global recession, at, the, at the, the instigation of it, was too much debt. In other words, whether governments like to hear it or not, a good old-fashioned conservative value of thrift and saving is going to come back into fashion. And it is coming back into fashion, and it ought to come back into fashion. Now, we do not reject the need for a stimulus at this time. The big question the first question is, how big should the stimulus be today? Our judgment is that $42 billion is more than is, than is appropriate right now. The government is looking increasingly like a frightened soldier who fires off all his ammunition in a panic in the first minutes of an engagement. This downturn may be very long-lasting, and we cannot possibly afford to spend larger and larger sums like this every quarter. Just think about it. We've, if this package goes through, Australia will have spent, the government will have spent about 1 per cent of GDP in a cash splash in December, it's the December quarter, and then there will be, just in the cash payments alone, there will be another 1 per cent, somewhat more, spent in the March quarter. 
And it should not be overlooked by anybody that just as the government times its announcements to coincide with news poll, so it is timing its handouts on a quarterly basis to avoid, no doubt, a quarter of negative growth. But where is that going to lead us? If we look at the cash handouts that the, that alone that the government is giving away in proposing to give away in March and that it gave away in December, what are we to expect in the budget and beyond? Are we going to rack up 40 or 50 billion dollars a year in cash handouts alone? Now we do not have access to any more financial information than that contained in the government's updated economic and fiscal outlook, which as I said we were given yesterday afternoon. But if the Prime Minister wants our support to a fiscal stimulus, then he must be prepared to sit down and talk with us. He must be prepared to put the cards on the table. He must be prepared to negotiate. His, his uh, recent or well, current political hero, President Obama, probably the most popular political leader in the world, sits down with his political opponents. He's prepared to negotiate. He's prepared to engage the members of his legislature. This Prime Minister is so vain, so arrogant, so convinced that he and he alone is right that he is not prepared to do any more to his political opponents than hold a gun to their head and say, stand and deliver and you've got two days to do it. Unlike the Prime Minister, we do not contend that the approaches we favour are the only way to go. There is an infinite range of policy options available at this time, and all of them have detractors and supporters. None of them are certain of success. But let me give the House now an indication of our views of the particular elements in this, in this uh, package and the elements that we believe would be more appropriate. But as I say, this is a basis for negotiation with the government. First, as I said a moment ago, we believe the package is too big. We do not rule out supporting further stimuluses in the future, depending on the economic circumstances and their composition. We need to keep a few shots in the locker. Mm -hmm. Our judgment is that a more appropriate level of stimulus is in the order of one and a half to two per cent of GDP, or between 15 and 20 billion dollars. Mm -hmm. Now that is a matter of judgment. There is no mathematical formula that gives you the right answer here, but our judgment is that that is where the stimulus should be. That's the band within, it, within which it should be. Now, if people believe that we are more prudent, more conservative in spending taxpayers' money, and we err on spending less than more, then they're absolutely right. Uh, that is our. That is our philosophical approach to these issues. It's not a question of, of uh, letting the market rip. It is a question of taking other people's money seriously, guarding it, protecting it and ensuring that it is spent wisely and well. And that is our commitment. Now, we do not support a further round of cash handouts. That is very a very unpopular thing to say, and I acknowledge that. But it's the right thing to say. And I think most Australians will recognise in their hearts that it is the right thing to say. It's extraordinary that the government would embark on this when there is no basis for concluding that the cash splash of December was effective. At the very least, the impact of the December payments needs to be taken on board. We need to know precisely what it is. Now, I should note that, objectively, if two-thirds of the December payments were saved, as many economists contend—and bear in mind these were paid two weeks before Christmas—and I said at the time this was an interesting economic experiment and if ever a one-off handout, one-off cash payment was going to be largely spent, it would be this one, because the timing, uh, if you like, was perfect for those people that wanted that, that outcome, because it was just before Christmas. Nonetheless. It appears that it was not. And bear in mind, the recipients in December were, for the most part, on low incomes, pensioners and, and others. Now, the beneficiaries of the payments in the government's package today will include many Australians at middle income levels. 
Furthermore, the economic climate is much more uncertain, or more uncertain at least, than it was in December. The incentives to save rather than to spend are therefore a lot greater. So we would support, as an alternative, the bringing forward of the 1 July 2010 tax cuts to the 1 January this year. This will have a budgetary cost. It's not uh, as much. It's obviously spread over time, and it is not as much as the uh, cash payments in the Prime Minister's plan, but it is temporary. It's a timing difference. It will benefit all taxpayers, but most significantly those on low and middle incomes. It's therefore very well targeted. It does not put $950 in everybody's pocket today, but that's the point. It increases permanent income and it therefore provides a greater incentive to work and to invest. And by the middle of next year, households will have more money in their pocket and the prospects of uh, more money to come. They'll have more money in their pocket immediately, of course. Now, the Prime Minister and the Treasurer have tried to portray anybody who doubts the, their analysis of uh, quick cash handouts as some kind of economic quack. But that is just underlines both their lack of reading in this area and their incredible arrogance. There are many voices all around the world questioning whether the immense scale and scope of the fiscal measures being hastily implemented by many governments are the appropriate response. There are many reputable economists that wonder whether they will be effective and whether they represent the best use of taxpayers' money. The Treasurer yesterday derided the views of the Stanford economist John Taylor as irrelevant and extreme. It's very interesting that the Treasurer of the Commonwealth of Australia would so personally and viciously attack one of the most distinguished economists in the world. Given the influence Taylor has had on central bank thinking around the world, this is simply, this is simply outrageous. But more importantly, there are plenty of other economists who are similarly sceptical over the headlong rush to huge deficits and heavy debt. They include Robert Lucas and Ed Prescott, both past winners of the Nobel Prize for Economics, Robert Barrow, Eugene Farmer and Gregory Mankiw, among many others. These are not quacks. These are not extremists. These are not irrelevant. These are great economic thinkers who have a view that is respected around the world but not apparently by the all-knowing treasurer that we have on the other side of the House. Nor is it right to portray as ignorant extremism the coalition stance that tax cuts often provide a larger boost to the economy than public spending. Indeed, one of the most powerful and persuasive empirical studies in the United States, which has been much quoted in the financial media, saying that tax cuts have a high multiplier, that is, they provide a larger bang for the buck to the economy than, than outlays, comes from none, none other than Christine Romer, now a senior economic official in the Obama White House. Now, clearly, these are very difficult and very difficult times, and there are a range of economic opinions and interpretations. Nobody has all the answers. So it's the height of arrogance and intolerance for the Prime Minister and the Treasurer to declare that the only way is their way. Uh, it, is, it just indicates their lack of willingness to engage in a constructive way, both with the wider community and the wide range of views, uh, not to speak of other members of this parliament. Now, another element, another very larger, this, the next large element in the proposal and the plan is an investment in schools. Now, in government, we very heavily invested in schools. Indeed, one of our most successful and, I'd say, popular programs was the Investing in Our Schools program, which the Rudd government has terminated. The $14 billion schools investment component of this package seems to have been selected largely because the government believes this building can be undertaken quickly. Now, experience suggests this will not be the case. Its plan to work hand in glove with state governments reinforces everybody's scepticism about that. Now, we would welcome a renewal, indeed an acceleration, of the Investing in Our Schools program. However, we have to ask this question. 
Is the most urgent infrastructure deficiency requirement in Australia primary school assembly halls and libraries? What about hospitals? Yes. What about nursing homes and aged care? Yes. What indeed about the national broadband network? Yes. What, about, what, about broad, what about water infrastructure? And what, what, Mr Speaker, about expanding and above all maintaining our national transmission network? Now, Labor's response to this, of course, will be there's more money to come for these measures. But there's the point. The finances of the Commonwealth are not a magic pudding. Everything has to be paid for at some time. Think of the faces. Look into the eyes of those school children that come to Parliament every day and remember that as these debts are piled up billion upon billion, it is they who will have to pay them off. So, in an indication of the specific responses we would bring to this uh, plan, we would support a renewed investing in our schools program. Based on our experience, we believe that $3 billion over three years could be and would be well spent. And depending on demand and, of course, on the economic conditions, consideration can always be given to allocating more funding. And that's a very important point, Mr Speaker. The parliament is not going into perpetual recess. The parliament is always here. We can come back and, if circumstances require a greater stimulus of a different kind and a different time, we can do that. The prime minister is in a panic. He's firing off all his ammunition at once. We need to keep more in reserve. Prudence demands that. Now, the biggest gap in this package, by far, is jobs. The three top priorities, the three top priorities this year must be jobs, jobs, jobs. Where is the assistance for small business in keeping employment high? The government will say that the insulators and the builders will be supported by these programs, and so they will. But most small businesses will not benefit from these spending measures. Fiscal stimulus should aim to invest in the Australian economy in a way that makes the whole economy more productive, efficient and competitive. Picking off one sector after another will always result, will always result in dislocations and discrimination against those sectors that are not privileged. That, of course, is why tax cuts are so effective, because every business, every household benefits. Now, we believe an element in a stimulus package should be one which lowers the cost of employing Australians. That should be a key focus, making it easier to keep Australians in their jobs and especially for small business. The accelerated investment allowance proposed has some merit, but a small business which is struggling with declining revenues would be better off with additional cash flow than it can deploy as it sees fit. Now, we want to discuss practical measures uh, with the government that will put cash into the hands of small businesses. One proposal which we have seen, which has considerable merit, would be for the Commonwealth to cover for a period a portion of the superannuation guarantee levy, appropriately costed within the framework of a more prudent stimulus. This would provide support for small business, it would lower the cost of employment and it would provide an, a dis, an incentive across the board to every small business. Now, we do welcome the government paying attention to the value of insulation. It is a great disappointment, as I noted in my speech a few weeks back, that the government's uh, election policy on insulation was left in complete abeyance. Nothing was done on it uh, at all. Uh, and indeed, it's, uh, as of the 20th of January, the government's website uh, dismally told anyone who was interested that the program details had not yet been developed. So much, uh, so much for efficiency. Now, insulation, however, is an energy efficiency measure that pays for itself. Government subsidies for insulation should recognise that. The $1,600 subsidy will, according to Mr Peter Roos of Fletcher Insulation, who is quoted in the newspapers today, mean that over 90 per cent of jobs would be completed at no cost to the owner. The subsidy is not means tested. Now, we would support an insulation subsidy of a lower amount, 
and I'd suggest for the government's consideration one that is, for example, for $500 for all houses and increasing to $1,000 subject to a means test. That would reduce the cost of the measure considerably but remain a very significant incentive to the insulation industry. And a similar approach can be taken to solar hot water. Mr Speaker, the object of this stimulus has to be twofold. Firstly, to provide the appropriate level of economic stimulus. So it has to be directed in a way that is effective. Now, while these, the cash handouts will be popular, we do not believe they will be an effective economic stimulus. We believe that bringing forward the 2010 tax cuts will have much greater effect, will also cost less, but, will, but it will have a much greater economic effect and it will benefit households, small businesses right across the board. We believe that the key issue for the government is the scale of this stimulus, the size of it. We believe it's too large. We believe it is not composed of sufficiently effective measures. I've given some indication of ways in which those measures could be more effective. Above all, the government must ask itself, as it looks at this and no doubt other measures it will bring forward, are they going to provide a benefit across the board? Are they going to make Australia's economy more efficient, more productive, more competitive? Because if they don't do that, the money will not be well spent. The reality is that while these times call for governments to invest more than they normally would, we recognise that. The investment and spending decisions must be of the highest quality. We should not be investing in things or in measures or in programs which do not stand up on their, on their own merits. They have to be measures that we would, we would invest in in good times or bad. Otherwise, we are literally wasting taxpayers' money at a time when, depending on the development of this global recession, we may find ourselves in greater need of those resources in the years to come. Now, Mr Speaker, I recognise that much of what I've said will not be popular, but it is right. We must, we must stand up for prudent financial management. Every dollar that this parliament approves as spent, as being spent, belongs to somebody else. We are dealing with other people's money. And more significantly than that, we are dealing with the future, the future of those young Australians that come here to visit this parliament. And I do not want to be looking into their eyes in the years to come and say, be saying to them, when you grow up, you will be paying higher and higher taxes because of the debt your parents' generation racked up today. We recognise these times call for investment. We recognise they call for action by government. But it must be the right action, and governments must be prepared to take tough decisions, be prepared to take the right decisions, have the courage of discipline. The Prime Minister has shown none of that. He's wanted to be Santa Claus. Everybody gets a prize. The problem with that, the problem with everybody getting a prize today, is that the children in the years to come will be carrying a very heavy penalty. And we are committed, on our side of the House at least, to ensure in so far as we can that every dollar that is spent this year and in the years to come is spent wisely and always always remembering those children, because it is those children who will have to pay off Labor's debt. Yeah. Yeah. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the honourable member for Blacksland. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, we stand here today in the middle of a global economic emergency. And Listening to the Leader of the Opposition, you'd almost be forgiving, forgiven for thinking that it doesn't exist, that the government is doing this just on a whim. It's 
perhaps worth reminding the House that this is the worst global economic crisis since the Great Depression, something we only ever read about in history books, uh, something that we were told by our parents or by our grandparents. Economies now around the world are being swallowed up by a global recession. So what do we do? Mr Speaker, there are two options. There's the merchant banker model and there's the government model. Merchant banker model says let the market take its course. The merchant banker model says the market will fix itself. The merchant banker model says Thanks. capitalism got us into this mess and it will get us out. Sure, a few people will suffer along the way, but a few people will get rich as well. It's the model that says don't use the economic stabilisers, avoid deficit at all costs, vote against this bill even if it costs jobs, the kind of jobs that the opposition leader was talking about when he spoke about those young people, even if it cost them their jobs. Then on the other side, Mr Deputy Speaker, you've got the government model, and the government model says the market generates wealth and creates jobs, but sometimes it can spin out of control. It's the model that says the market needs to be better regulated. It says merchant bankers created this mess and we can't rely on them alone to get out of it. It's the model that says government should step in and help out when markets fail. Mr Deputy Speaker, we know who the architects of the merchant banker model are. They're economists like Milton Friedman and they're politicians like Herbert Hoover, the President of the United States, who said prosperity cannot be restored by raids upon the public treasury. And it's the model that's now being espoused by those opposite. We heard it from the Leader of the Opposition today. This is their model, that the market should take its course. That's what the Leader of the Opposition said two weeks ago, and that's what he is talking about again today. But I think the events of the last few weeks and months, spawned by the greed of merchant bankers, has proved that this is not the right approach, that markets spin out of control, that markets need to be better regulated and better managed, and that there is an important role here for government. That's the approach that this government is taking. It's the approach that the new US administration is taking, and it's the approach that's been adopted and recommended by the International Monetary Fund. The depth and the nature of the crisis before us makes for very ugly reading. Over the Christmas break, the news continued to get worse. Every time you opened the newspaper, there was more bad economic news. Last week, the IMF released a report that projects that growth worldwide will fall to half a per cent this year. Amongst the advanced economies, it's going to go backwards, backwards by 2 per cent. Here are some examples of what I'm talking about. In the United States growth will contract by 1.6 per cent. Germany will go backwards by 2 per cent. Japan, negative 2.6 per cent. The United Kingdom contracting by 2.8 per cent. Because of all of this, Australia is affected. We're caught in the vortex of this global economic recession. We're in better shape than most and better prepared than most countries, but inevitably our fate is tied to theirs because we live in a global economic community. The businesses here in Australia rely on businesses overseas in this interconnected world in order to trade, to do business and to hire new employees. Uh, our, our biggest trading partner is China, and China, we're now told, is going to contract in growth by half over the next two years. Our second biggest trading partner is Japan. We now know that Japan's in recession. Our third biggest trading partner is the United States, and we all know what is happening there. Last year, 2008, they lost three million jobs. In the last quarter of 2008, they lost one and a half million jobs. And in December alone, they lost half a million jobs. In that quarter, the December quarter, the United States economy shrunk by 3.8 per cent in annual terms. They're just three examples, China, Japan and the United States. Six of our ten largest trading partners are now already in recession. And that is what is punching a $115 billion hole in the budget. So we've got two options the merchant banker model or the government model. We can sit on our hands, we can sit on the sideline and we can let the market take its course 
or we can get in there and we can help and we can protect Australian jobs. The world economy has now stalled and I think that the second model is the prudent one, that governments have to get in there and start the world economy up again to protect jobs. It also just happens to be the orthodox economic opinion. That's what we have to do. I think it would be irresponsible if we didn't. It would be irresponsible to sit on the sidelines and just rely on the merchant banker model. If we do that, then all of the evidence, all of the modelling by Treasury suggests that things will get worse, that growth will be lower and that more jobs, 90,000 of them, will be lost. And I'm acutely aware of just how important this is because I happen to represent an electorate where unemployment is already 50 per cent higher than the national average. It's also a place where more people are struggling to pay their mortgages already than anywhere else in the country. And you can't pay the mortgage without a job. And that's why the priority of this government and this parliament has to, has to be to do everything that we can to protect Australian jobs and to keep this economy growing. That's not just the opinion of the government. It's the opinion of every reputable economist in the country. It's the opinion of Treasury. It's the opinion of the IMF. It just so happens to be the opinion of the Business Council of Australia and a lot of other organisations. And it's their opinion because it's the right thing to do and it's the responsible thing to do. Here's a quote. This is Ray Brooks from the IMF. He's their Asia-Pacific Division chief. And he said on the weekend, quote, we emphasise spending. We emphasise spending, in particular infrastructure spending. Temporary measures on the tax side, I repeat that, temporary measures on the tax side that should be targeted towards those who are likely to spend it, such as low-income low earners. Now that, that is exactly what these bills do. One, temporary measures on the tax side targeted at low-income earners. And two, funding of infrastructure that is badly needed and ready to go now. That's why it's backed by almost every organisation in the country except the opposition. And we've heard today from the Leader of the Opposition that they are going to vote against these bills. They've said they're going to vote against it, and I'm glad that they've finally revealed their true selves. They spent all last year hiding behind the veil that they no longer support work choices. That, uh, that that's a thing of the past. Well, today we've found the true wolf that hides under the sheep's clothing, the true position of the opposition, and that's a model that adopts the model I've been talking about here, the merchant banker model. You bet what they're about to do will be unpopular. Well, it'll be unpopular because it's also irresponsible. It's everything that the IMF is telling us not to do. It's everything that every other country in the world is not doing. Have a look at what every country in the world is doing, and they're injecting money to stimulate their economies. And the opposition's effectively coming in here and saying, too big a package, too big a risk, don't do it. Well, they can explain that to the people who won't get those one-off tax bonuses, $950, and they can explain that to every school in every electorate around the country where there won't be a library built, or there won't be a hall built, or there won't be roads being built, or boom gates being installed or insulation bats being installed because of the actions that the Leader of the Opposition in this place and in the Senate are intending to undertake. They, they, they have spent a lot of time, not just in this debate but throughout the last few weeks, criticising and trashing this idea that one-off tax bonuses, one-off payments are not an effective way to stimulate the economy. They say they don't work despite the fact that all of the data that is coming in indicates that they do. Remember December. December, only a few months ago, the rest of the world effectively fell off a cliff. The US economy went back by 4 per cent in annual terms. World trade collapsed by 45 per cent in annual terms. In the United States alone, they lost half a million jobs. Now, at that time, when all of this is happening, profits and demand grew here at home. But yet the opposition say that the things we did with the $10 billion stimulus package didn't work. And they've said it again here in this debate today. Well, and I'll make one point, a point that was made yesterday. The evidence from Westfield alone points in the other direction because their profits grew by 2.5 per cent last year in that December, December month when 
in the United States, they went backwards by 14 per cent. Now, uh, if, if you care not to accept that argument, have a look at what Ray Brooks said on the weekend. This is the, the, the IMF Asia-Pacific chief. He said, quote, I'd emphasise that what has been done so far by the authorities, namely the Australian government, was a very timely policy response. It has helped to cushion the blow. This is an extraordinarily sharp contraction in global demand that has caught forecasters by surprise. So that's the government's position. Uh, there is a lot more that could be said of this, of, of this debate, but uh, time is cutting me short. Let, let me uh, just make this point here, and that is that uh, what the government is doing is being backed by every major organisation in the country because it's what the economy needs. It's what we have to do and it's what is right. And the opposition forgets that at their peril. Order. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. I call the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Coalition, through long experience, knows that prudent management of the Australian budget has in the past and will in the future be the key to a strong economy, to higher standards of living for all Australians and for jobs for Australians now and into the future. The Coalition also knows, as does the Australian public, that Labor governments, state and federal, are reckless when it comes to spending other people's money. And there's something eerily familiar about the new Rudd government. It is building on a long tradition of Labor governments, state and federal, and their addiction to debt. The Whitlam government spent so recklessly it ended up mired in the Kemlani loans affair. This might be a footnote of political history now, but it reminds us of the Rudd Labor government. In the Kemlani loans affair, the Whitlam government came up with a bizarre plan to shore up their budget bottom line with dodgy loans from the Middle East. The Keating government went into temporary deficit, so-called temporary deficit, that grew exponentially until the nation was saddled with $96 billion in debt. And it would have kept going had the coalition not been elected in 1996 and then took 10 long years to pay off that debt in painstaking budget measures that step by step, year by year, rebalanced the budget, put it back into surplus and then started providing savings for the future benefit of all Australians. And the history of Labor governments I'll point to New South Wales state Labor government. The history of these governments is repeating itself. Before the election, the night before the election, the Prime Minister gave a clear commitment to the Australian people that he was an economic conservative. He said, I quote, being an economic conservative means a fundamental belief in budget surpluses. And you go back to my experience in this respect. I worked as a, at a senior level in the Goss government in Queensland in the first half of the 90s. And the Prime Minister said, Quote, when national economic circumstances were difficult, when there wasn't a lot of money flowing into the economy particularly, there wasn't the presence of a global resources boom, and budget after budget we produced budget surpluses. Let us cast our mind back to the time of Labor's election win in November 2007. Labor inherited the best economic and budgetary circumstances of any incoming government in Australian history a $20 billion surplus, zero government debt, $70 billion in savings, the lowest unemployment in more than 30 years and relatively low inflation. That is what set Australia apart from the other economies in the world. That is why Australia is now better placed than virtually any other comparable country at this time of economic slowdown. Because in November 2007, consumer and business confidence was strong, and people were generally optimistic about the future, and the Rudd government promised to do what the Howard government had done 
and that is bring fiscal prudence to the handling and management of the budget. But what did the Rudd government do with that legacy? And this is, this is a measure by which to judge the Rudd government's ability to make prudent economic decisions. What the Rudd government did was immediately embark on a course of trashing the economic legacy of the previous government and embarked on a deliberate scare campaign about inflation. This had a devastating impact on confidence. Despite the strong economic conditions at the time, confidence fell further and more rapidly in Australia than in comparable countries during the first half of 2008. And think of what was happening elsewhere in the world. Yet in Australia, confidence fell further and more rapidly. And many Australians locked in home loans at, highest interest, at higher interest rates because the Rudd government convinced them that inflation was out of control and interest rates would continue to rise. And these people are now paying the price of that reckless action by the Prime Minister. The Rudd government simply got it wrong. And they've continued to make poor economic decisions. They continue to get it wrong. And this package, the $42 billion spending package, fails to take into account the lessons of history. It fails to take into account the experience of other countries which in the past have attempted to stimulate their economies with large spending packages of taxpayer funds. Think of Japan in the 1990s. They have failed to take into account the lessons, the harsh and bitter experience of other countries. The package fails to embrace initiatives that will protect Australian jobs at this time. The package fails the government's own test, which it set itself for fiscal stimulus. It said, based on the views of others, particularly the IMF, that fiscal stimulus packages should be temporary, targeted and timely. Now, Even if you accept this as the test, and many don't, the government fails its own test. It is not targeted at keeping people in their jobs. It's splashed across the economy. And if you look at the cash handouts, there is clearly no strategic thought at all as to how those handouts will keep one person in a job. No apparent thought as to how the handouts will actually stimulate the economy, because they have been proven not to work elsewhere. There is no evidence that it will do what the government claims. This package is not timely, in the sense that much of it is long-term infrastructure spending. And whatever the merits of that spending, and whatever the merits of infrastructure spending, the government should not try and con the Australian people into believing it will provide an immediate stimulus that will boost GDP and ward off recession. It is not temporary. Now, that is the biggest lie of all. It is not temporary. This government is potentially taking out a $200 billion mortgage on our future and that of the next generation. This is the biggest con of all. The Prime Minister and the Treasurer saying the massive budget deficit into which they wish to plunge Australia is temporary. It is not. The actions of the Rudd government represent the biggest budgetary turnaround in Australian history. We should remember that in May last year, this government was forecasting a $21.7 billion surplus. We're now looking at a $22.5 billion deficit. And if you take it over the economic cycle, the turnaround in the budget goes from an $80 billion surplus to a $118 billion deficit. That's a $198 billion turnaround over the economic cycle. One of the most infamous budgets in Australian history was the 75 Whitlam budget, where its gross mismanagement resulted in a turnaround from a forecast budget of 0.3 per cent of GDP to a deficit of 1.8 per cent of GDP. The Rudd government's turnaround is far more reckless, taking a forecast surplus of 1.8 per cent of GDP to a deficit of 1.9 per cent of GDP in just a matter of months. A matter of months. And the amendment that was so quietly brought in today by the Finance Minister to the Commonwealth Inscribed Stock Act reveals the lie behind the Prime Minister's claim that this is just a temporary deficit. 
for this legislation would increase the cap on the issuing of Commonwealth government securities from $75 billion to $200 billion. That's this is what we're facing—$200 billion. And this government wants us to give them a blank cheque to mortgage the future of Australians to the tune of $200 billion without giving us any opportunity to properly scrutinise these bills. Think of the scale of this. The previous Labor government left a debt of $96 billion, and this Labor government is on track to leave a debt twice as large, no doubt with the intention that down the track another coalition government with the experience and the credentials and the know-how will have to pay it off. But where will the money come from? This isn't government money. Governments don't have their own money. It's not Labor or coalition money. It is taxpayers' money. Any, in debt, any debt incurred by this government will eventually be repaid out of the efforts and earnings of wage and salary earners and through businesses. They will pay for it in higher taxes in the future or through reductions in public expenditure in health and education and roads. But it will be the next generation who will bear the burden of this government's reckless profligacy. And this will be particularly the case if the debt has funded unproductive expenditures that don't increase gross domestic product, which would increase the capacity to repay the debt. Now, the coalition has made it clear that public expenditure on physical infrastructure requires serious assessment of each project. And it's important that at this time the government has a measured plan for infrastructure spending over time. It doesn't panic, it doesn't choose projects that have political appeal but which are poor choices in promoting long-run economic growth and the welfare of the Australian people. It is deeply concerning that the announcement of $21.4 billion in public expenditure on schools and public housing doesn't give any explanation as to why these projects were chosen instead of many other alternative public and private projects that could have been undertaken. Of course spending on schools is good public policy. Of course the coalition believes in schools and in housing. But at this time, when you're taking the country into debt with a $200 billion blank cheque, are these the best investments at this moment with this amount of money to stimulate the economy and to create and protect jobs? Because that is what the focus should be, keeping people in jobs. And there's no evidence produced by the government that any of these measures will protect any jobs or create any jobs in Australia. The government's latest forecast states that unemployment will rise from the current 4.5 per cent to 7 per cent in 2009-10. It estimates that about 100,000 more people will be out of a job by 30 June this year. What is in this package to encourage small business, for example, to keep people on, saying to small business, we will help you keep on your workers? There's nothing. There's no incentive for that. The government doesn't know how to come up with a package that will protect and create Australian jobs, because this government chooses to make decisions on the run without research or modelling to support its decision, without sensible assessments of what works and what doesn't, without consideration of failed policies in the past, what other countries have done what has worked for them and what hasn't worked. But worse still, it's clear that the government doesn't want to discuss alternatives. It will do anything it can to stop this parliament or indeed the public from discussing alternatives. The Prime Minister said, take it or leave it. The Prime Minister says, it's his way or no way. The Prime Minister reminds me of the leader of a bushwalking group who's lost in the bush and they're trying to find the way home. He doesn't have the answers, but he insists on going down the path he chose, knowing that that path hasn't taken you home in the past. 
but he insists on taking everyone down that path. And if somebody in the party says, well, maybe there is an alternative path, he turns on them and accuses them and abuses them of not supporting his efforts to get home by his route, even though he knows it won't get them there. He just wants to be seen to be doing something, to continue to walk. He doesn't want to be questioned, doesn't want the logic, doesn't want any analysis of what he's seeking to do. Perhaps he thinks that democratic government should be command and control. Perhaps that's what the Prime Minister thinks. Command and control. But that's not the way government in this country works. That's not the way a free and open democracy works. One of the primary roles of the opposition is to scrutinise the decisions of the government to ensure it makes the best possible decisions in the national interest. And it's easy for an opposition to just roll over and say, oh, well, the government's come up with a package that will be popular and the media will say that this is a good policy. Nobody will say that it will create a job. Nobody will say that it supports more business. Nobody will say it will stimulate the economy. Nobody will say that it wards off recession, but everyone will say it's popular. Well, oppositions have a responsibility to the Australian public to stand up and say that a policy is wrong, that a policy is ill-considered when they truly believe that to be the case. And the coalition is firmly of the view that in the circumstances that Australia finds itself at this time, taking into account what is happening overseas, this huge spend of $42 billion on track to be $200 billion is too much money at this time. It is bad public policy, and we must say so, and we do. And in their heart of hearts, the Australian people know that, fine, another $950, who wouldn't, who wouldn't say, yeah, I'll put my hand out for that? But in their heart of hearts, they know that somebody has to pay for this one day. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Somebody has to pay for it. And it is going to be the taxpayers of the future. It's going to be their children. And this is precisely what the coalition was faced with when we came into government in 1996. And that is precisely why we set about paying off the $96 billion debt left by the Keating government, because we did not want future generations of Australians to be saddled with the profligacy of a Labor government. And we made some really tough decisions in 1996, really tough decisions. And they weren't popular, but they were right. They were. Because 10 years later, we'd paid off that debt. The standards of living in Australia had risen. The government had the ability to invest in schools and hospitals and infrastructure because we didn't have to pay the $9 billion in interest that accumulated every year on the $96 billion debt. And there hasn't been any mention of that in the Prime Minister or the Treasurer's comments to date. They have studiously avoided telling the Australian public that when the government starts borrowing in this fashion this amount of money, plunging the country deeper and deeper into debt, they're going to have to pay interest on it. And a $96 billion debt attracted $9 billion in interest. Just imagine what a $200 billion debt will do. And that's money that can't be spent on future infrastructure projects. It can't be spent on schools and hospitals. It can't be spent on government services, because you've got to pay off the interest. Now, that is why. We are so gravely concerned that this government refuses to acknowledge that Australia's particular circumstances have to be the basis of policy responses to the pressures we face from the deteriorating international financial and economic conditions—Australia's particular circumstances. We don't need to import 
the problems facing other countries by adopting poorly thought through policy responses. And we've seen that with this government. They have panicked every step of the way in relation to the economic slowdown. The unlimited bank deposit guarantee, which led to the freezing of investment accounts of hundreds of thousands of Australians and caused disruption in other areas of the financial system, was a classic example of how this government, in reading the overseas circumstances, imported them to Australia and applied an ill-thought-through policy that caused more harm to the Australian financial markets. And this, we fear, is what will happen if this government is given a blank cheque to spend $42 billion now, leading up to $200 billion in the future, and the legacy of this government will be massive debt and a burden on this country that will be unsustainable. Well, I, for one, am Order. not going to stand here the and see Deputy Australia's Leader economy the deteriorate has in that way. Expired. Yeah. Yeah. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Isaacs. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, the true measure of a government is not its performance during a time of prosperity, but its response in a time of crisis. The National Building and Jobs Plan coming on top of the Economic Security Strategy delivered in December shows the depths of this government's commitment to doing all we can to protect Australian jobs and families from the maelstrom that has engulfed the global economic system. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition, as we've just heard in her speech, wants to attack all this. We now know that the Opposition wants to oppose this program, and it's clear that at least the Deputy Leader of the Opposition is simply out of her depth. This package is designed to stimulate the economy in the short term, to help support up to 90,000 Australian jobs and to ensure that low- and middle-income families and households receive the assistance they need during these tough economic times. But, Deputy Speaker, it does more than that. It commences the process of building Australia's post-crisis economy and a fairer society. The Energy Efficient Homes Program will help to prepare Australian households for a low-carbon future. Building the Education Revolution builds on the education revolution we commenced last year to ensure that our children are equipped with skills that will, need, that will be needed in an open, dynamic, high-skill, high-wage economy. And the Commonwealth Social Housing Initiative is fairly described as the most significant federal government action ever undertaken in the field of housing. These are carefully thought through packages. It is worth dwelling on some of the detail of these packages so that we are clear on what the House is debating here with the bills that are before the House. The household stimulus package is timely, it is temporary and it is targeted. And it includes with the tax bonus for working Australia up to $950 for eligible taxpayers, with the single income family bonus $950 for families that have one main income earner, with the farmers hardship bonus, uh, the matter which the Leader of the Nationals didn't want to hear about in the House yesterday, $950 to farmers and others receiving exceptional circumstances related income support, with the training and learning bonus $950 to assist students those returning to study or training and some income support recipients that will benefit some 4,737 students and young people in my electorate of Isaacs. And there's the back to school bonus, that's $950 to assist low and middle income families ed eligible for family tax benefit A with school aged children that will benefit 11,154 families in my electorate of Isaacs. With the education package, known as building the educational revolution, we will see a stimulation of demand in the economy. It will provide a much needed boost to the construction industry and in the longer term it will help provide every single child in every single primary school, including all 38 primary schools and the secondary schools in my electorate. There are some, a total of 54 schools in my electorate with world-class facilities that are necessary for a 21st century education. It will provide $12.4 billion to 
to build new infrastructure such as libraries and multi-purpose halls in every primary school. The package includes another billion dollars to build 500 science and language centres in our secondary schools, and I know, having been to each of the secondary schools in my electorate and all but a couple of the primary schools in my electorate, just how uh, well used these funds are going to be and indeed how much they are needed to ensure that an appropriate level of facilities is provided in our schools. The Energy Efficient Homes program uh, will be a support or further support to manufacturing and construction industries and will help prepare our economy for a low carbon future. Uh, there's an investment of almost $4 billion in the Energy Efficient Homes program. And as we've heard yesterday and heard again today uh, from the Minister for the Environment, it will enable around 2.2 million Australian homes to install free ceiling insulation. Uh, this is uh, something uh, close to my heart because my electorate is home to two of Australia's major, uh, major insulation manufacturers. Uh, it's going to be an important shot in the arm for local jobs. Uh, and at, at already, um, in the short time that there's been since the announcement was made, uh, the insurance, the, sorry, the Insulation Council of Australia, with whom I spoke this morning, uh, they have their office in my electorate. I spoke to the CEO of the Insulation Council of Australia, Dennis Darcy, and he told me that uh, their rough calculations already have indicated that it's expected that this measure will uh, generate some 4,000 jobs in installation, supply, fixing. Uh, office staff deliveries, uh, trainers to, in, uh, to install, uh, to train those who are going to install insulation um, across the nation. And uh, that's before one gets to uh, the possible increase in manufacturing jobs uh, at the CSR plants in Brisbane and Sydney and the Fletcher uh, plants in Sydney and Melbourne, the Melbourne plant being located at Dandenong South in my electorate. There, uh, it's worth perhaps repeating for the uh, benefit of the House what Dennis Darcy, the CEO of the, Insurance, sorry, the Insulation Council of Australia, uh, said to me on this. He said, and I quote, we welcome this move, and I continue to quote, energy efficiency is probably the most important step in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Buildings are the most important component in improving energy efficiency. Australian buildings have, by international standards, low levels of energy efficiency. These measures will have an impact on reducing emissions. They will help meet the 2020 targets and, more importantly, said Mr Darcy, will help every family without insulation to reduce household energy bills. Mr Darcy went on to tell me, and I quote again, it will create jobs. It is a bold and welcome measure. In addition, this package includes the Commonwealth Social Housing Initiative which is $6.4 billion for public and community housing, $6 billion over three and a half years. It will include also at least 20,000 low-income households being assisted by uh, having access to housing. And I haven't mentioned, I spoke about this yesterday in the House, the regional and local government program, which is seeing an expansion from the uh, $300 million announced at the uh, local government conference held uh, in this building in November. Uh, attended by mayors and uh, chief executive officers of councils from all over Australia. Uh, I've heard uh, repeatedly, both at that conference, which I attended with the uh, mayor of Frankston, the mayor of Kingston and the CEO of the city of Greater Dandenong, I've heard repeatedly from them and from others who attended the conference just how welcome was this initiative of the Rudd government to give a direct access uh, for local government to uh, the Prime Minister and senior ministers and indeed the whole of the federal government, uh, what the regional and local government uh, package that's part of the package that's contained in this legislation will do is to permit directly the federal government to fund uh, larger scale projects that have been selected by local government. They are local capital projects chosen by local people that are going to generate local construction activity and generate local jobs. Now, if I can come briefly, Deputy Speaker, to the approach of the Liberal Party, which we've seen unfolded here today, the Liberal and the National Party, those opposite, 
Greg Evans, the Director of Industry, Policy and Economics at the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, was quoted in The Age newspaper this morning as saying this, and I quote, the fiscal stimulus package combined with the significant rate reduction announced by the Reserve Bank of Australia will go a long way to alleviating the worst aspects of the economic downturn and indeed places us in a better position than every other advanced country around the globe. That's Mr Evans from the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. The opposition does not, clearly does not, understand that very plain language from the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry and, indeed, seemingly, Deputy Speaker, do not understand the seriousness of the crisis that this country is confronting. Last night, Deputy Speaker, we were subjected once again to the member for Higgins, Captain Smirk, talking on ABC TV, and his only interest would appear to be in defending his own reputation as Treasurer. He is apparently not even interested in assisting the opposition to develop a coherent response which, as we've seen even here this morning, is assistance that they desperately need. The member for Higgins has no constructive criticism, and his attempt to create a supposedly glorious past and superlative economic performance on the part of the Howard government is simply false. This is the man who blew the prosperity of the resources boom, the man who had the opportunity to future-proof our economy as a result of the unprecedented revenues generated by the best terms of trade in a generation, and instead the member for Higgins and the government of which he was part wasted it by failing to rein in spending and fuelling inflation. It was lazy, it was politically expedient, and along with the failure to invest in infrastructure, Deputy Speaker, to invest in skills, it helped fuel the inflation that the Reserve Bank had to fight with one hand tied behind its back. At least one can say, Deputy Speaker, that the member for Higgins has consistency in his favour, which is more than can be said for the present opposition leadership. They appear, finally, to have come to the conclusion that there is no role for fiscal policy in dealing with this economic crisis. And we heard more of that from the Deputy Leader of the Opposition in her speech this morning preceding me. In her speech, uh, we had some extraordinary suggestions, for example, that there was no explanation as to why the particular projects that have been funded by this package have been chosen. Uh, she said also that uh, there was no evidence that these projects will create any jobs. The merest imagination that she could bring to bear on this would show her that these projects have been chosen because all of them are aimed at improving circumstances in our schools, aimed at improving the availability of housing in our country, aimed at getting local projects built and are aimed at getting money spent and construction being commenced as quickly as possible. And as for the suggestion that there is no evidence that these projects will create any jobs, clearly the Deputy Leader of the Opposition has not the faintest understanding of economic activity, because when a government announces projects of this scale, uh, obviously they are going to both create and support jobs. The Opposition has failed to understand that fiscal policy and monetary policy need to work together, particularly in times like this they need to be responsive to economic conditions. The Liberals and the Nationals did not understand this when they were in government, and they do not understand it now that they are in opposition. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. I call the Leader of the Nationals. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker. Money can't buy happiness, the old proverb, proverb wisely says, but the Rudd government is certainly trying its hardest to prove that wrong. What the Prime Minister announced yesterday was a plan to use our children's money to fund five minutes of sunshine, indeed probably 30 seconds of sunshine or even less. Of course the majority of Australians will be grateful to receive any kind of cheque in the mail. They'll be grateful to have any kind of assistance. But where do we go when the money runs out, when there's no more left for Labor to borrow? This is not money that is being simply manufactured out of thin air. It is debt being accumulated today, which must be paid back and paid back by our future generations. We have just espoused from our memory Labor's last $96 billion worth of debt. 
It took 13 years to accumulate under the Hawke and, and Keating governments. This Rudd Labor government will eclipse that in one term. In one term, an extraordinary, extraordinary uh, expenditure spree. The, the, the title is called, of this package is called National Building and Jobs, but it doesn't build and it doesn't create jobs. The timing's wrong. It repeats the failures of the past package. There's no lasting investment or leverage for the future. There are handouts, no permanent fixes. At the end of this package, the pension will still be too low and taxes will be too high. We're stealing from our children. This package of bills steals $200 billion from our children so that we can enjoy some, some sunshine for a few seconds. There are no new jobs. The government admits that this package creates no new jobs. All it does is sustain 90,000 90, jobs sustained. That's something like $450,000 for every job sustained. Not a new job, no new, no new permanent impetus for our economy, no new jobs, just 90,000 sustained at a cost of $450,000 each. How were these options chosen? How did we come to a situation like this? It is Labor pork barrelling on a grand scale, pork barrelling on a grand scale, with no clear plan, no vision for the future. It's, ca it's cash splashing around following a decade of, or more of, of, uh, of, of progress in our country, but it will lead to an eco economic uh, gloom and debt repayment at least for another decade. As I said yesterday, little or none of this money will ever be repaid while we have a Labor government in office. Yeah. They simply don't repay debt. They create debt. They create burdens that future governments have to repair. The job of paying back this debt will dwarf into insignificance uh, what was ne needed to be done when the, uh, when the Hawke and, and Keating government <coughs> left power. Now, of course, people will like to get a $950 handout from the government that's being offered to them. But in return for the $950 handout, they're also being given a $2,000 debt. What we are borrowing to fund this package is the equivalent of $2,000 for every man, woman and child in Australia. So, ladies and gentlemen of Australia, when you get your $950 cheque, there, there are some red pens on that paper as well. $2,000 you will have to pay back in the future with your families to fund what's happening today. Uh, the Prime Minister is looking more and more like Paris Hilton running a mucket with his visa card in a Melbourne's clothes shop, except the Prime Minister doesn't have Daddy's credit card to fall back on. He's got yours and he's got mine, and we're going to have to pay for this spending spree, and it will be a constant burden on our economy for decades ahead. Taxes in the future will have to be higher because we're paying back this debt. Government expenditure will be lower because a bigger bite of the budget will have to go into interest. We will be further behind and we'll have less money to spend on schools and education and health and defence and the important responsibilities of the Commonwealth in the future for decades because we'll be paying off this debt. Now, the Prime Minister is already talking about a third stimulus package even though the first one last October was a certified failure, except if you're perhaps a, a Chinese trinket manufacturer or you own a few poker machines. And what about the $81 million of, last year's, of, the, of the last package that was sent to people who are living permanently overseas? How did that stimulate the Australian economy, to send $81 million in cash grants to people who live overseas? The government hasn't learned from these mistakes. In fact, the spending is getting out of control, and perhaps the most alarming pa package, piece of uh, legislation that's in this package before the parliament today is the proposal to increase the limit on the government's bank card from $75 billion to $200 billion—$200 $200 billion. The, the, the bank card is about to be loaded to the gunwales with more and more debt, and there's no end in sight—$200 billion. That is $10,000 for every man, woman and child in Australia. 
So in addition to having to pay off your own home, in addition to having to pay off your own credit card bill, you now have to pay off Kevin Rudd and the Labor government's credit card bill. And your share is $200,000. Your baby's share is $10,000. Your grandmother's share is $10,000. This is real money that will have to be paid for by Australians, ordinary Australians, working or not, for decades ahead as Labor spends monumentally out of control. Now, the Prime Minister has even admitted that he doesn't even know whether this package is going to work. It's a, it's a gamble. It's a wager on our future. And that confirms that, uh, that we're right when we say that thousands of Australians who are going to be losing their jobs will be loaded with the additional benefit of massive government debt and years of deficits and new taxes. But what if he is wrong and the package doesn't work and the evidence suggests his first package hasn't been successful? Well, then we have a real fire sale of our national economy. Now, I'd like to look at a bit more de in a more detail to this, about this uh, stimulus package. Now, I'd like to be able to talk in detail about the, uh, about the legislation, but the reality, like all members in the opposition, I'm speaking about bills I haven't read. I haven't even seen a copy of the statement that the Prime Minister made last night, because the government didn't print enough copies for opposition members to be able to even read it. Shame. This is contemptuous Shame. treatment of the parliament. They, show it, they don't show us the bill. There's no copies of the documents. The only briefing that the opposition had was a 45-minute uh, talk with some Treasury officials who couldn't answer the basic questions. And we're being asked to approve $42 billion worth of expenditure, which we don't know the detail about, in 42 hours. The biggest spend now pay later program in history, and we're expected to rush it through without proper consideration. We do know that the fundamentals of this package are wrong. Now, world debt was at the heart of global, uh, the global financial crisis, and Australia has avoided the worst of the crisis because we have less debt, because we had a government who paid off the debt and was able to put, put money aside. So now we're going to join the rest of the world, throw away our advantage by spending huge amounts of money and we don't know whether, whether it will even work. We acknowledge that the government acknowledges that it's not going to create jobs and they acknowledge that it won't, that it won't provide stimulus in the form of lasting benefit for our national economy. Now, uh, what in fact uh, we, we need to look at in relation to this package is the various measures and what they're expected to achieve. I'm interested that the centrepiece is a schools building program. Now, a clear bailout for the failed Labor sta state's unwillingness to, to, to meet their responsibilities for school maintenance over the years. Peeling paint and unusable equipment is evident in almost every school in the country. And so now the Commonwealth is going to bail out the states. But this is supposed to be a stimulus package, now, something we want to spend quickly. Have you ever found a state government that can build a school building quickly? Yeah. It takes them years to do the planning. They stuff around. They, 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 they change the plans. They, they fiddle with here and there. They usually build things the school doesn't want in the end anyhow. And so this, this will take years to deliver a package of this nature. And I've also noted that, uh, that, that those parents and families who go to, to small schools are not going to be treated very generously by comparison with those who go to the large schools. Now, if you go to a primary school with 400 students or more, you'll get $3 million out of this package. But if, your, but if your children go to a school with 50 students or less, you'll only get 250,000. So the small country schools that have been particularly badly treated by Labor state governments over the years were going to be badly treated again by the federal Labor government. Now, when we had our investing in our schools program, which was so very successful, one of its features was that it treated all schools alike. The little battling schools that struggle so much to raise funding with their PNCs got the same money as the rich city schools, who didn't need it so much. And that's why it's one of the many reasons why that program was considered to be so successful. Then there's, there's also to be money spent on competitive grants for science and language laboratories in, in, in secondary schools. Uh, how many small country secondary schools are likely to get a competitive grant for a science and language laboratory? Uh, where we'll, we'll be watching closely the electorates where this, is, where, where, this is, uh, where this money is to be spent. But what it does do is certainly will concentrate the expenditure even further on education in the larger and more prosperous areas. 
Uh, there's also to be $1.3 billion for minor maintenance in some kind of a, a pale shadow of the, uh, the investing in our schools program that even members opposite would acknowledge was very popular with PNCs and with school communities. But the large school will get $200,000 under this program, where the small schools with 50 students or less will get only 50000 So the PNCs that find it hardest to raise the money will get the least help from this government. Uh, it would be better if we were to spend and reinvigorate the new investing in our, uh, and, and establish a new investing in our schools program, because it works, it works quickly and it delivers the results that schools actually want. But when you look at the way in which the government has targeted its expenditure and its assistance to the, to the states, why didn't we look at other areas where there has been serious neglect by the states of their, of their obligations? Why are we just bailing out the, the, the dilapidated school system? What about hospitals? Uh, what about the, the work that needs to be done on water infrastructure? Why weren't some of these key issues funded? And what about, from a federal perspective, doing something more about respite care and nursing homes? That would have really delivered permanent benefits for the community, but that's been discarded and not even considered in this package. And let's look to small business. There's a, there's a proposal in this scheme to have a short-lived investment allowance, and that, of course, will be helpful to small businesses who would like to buy new equipment. Uh, the problem, of course, is that most small businesses will be so stressed under the years of Labor government that they can't afford the debt that's associated with buying new capital equipment. Now, you can't invest and get a, a tax concession if, in fact, you haven't got the money in the first place. But if you are a small business and you're going to go out and buy some office equipment or some machinery, that'll be good for the local business. Uh, might even uh, boost the the, uh, the income of the supplier. Virtually all of that equipment is going to be imported, so it's not going to have any lasting flow-on benefits uh, through to the to the economy as a whole. Very few, uh, very little, of the equipment that's likely to be purchased under the under this investment allowance will be purchased in Australia. And of course, it's a very small window uh, until the 30th of June 2009. So you've really got to be ready to go now if you're going to get any advantage of it. Did the government consider perhaps paying the super guarantee levy of businesses to improve their cash flow, lowering income tax rates? What about delaying the emissions trading scheme, which is a, which is a new $11.5 billion tax on industry that they can ill afford? Getting a, getting a tax deduction for an investment allowance on a, on a new photocopier is very little help if you're going to have permanent, ongoing extra costs as a result of an emissions trading scheme. And what about abandoning its unfair dismissal laws? What about in regional areas, abandoning its scheme to abolish the Enroute subsidy scheme, which has helped to keep regional air services in the air, but Labor is now going to just simply get rid of? There are many things that they could have targeted this expenditure on which would have provided lasting benefits. Can I turn also to the grants to farmers of $950 and small businessmen and, and women in drought-affected areas? The government says there's potentially 21,500 people will receive this benefit. The government is wrong to say that this is something that's going to go to all farmers or to go to farmers. Only a small, very small proportion of farmers will be eligible to receive this $950 grant. And what guarantees are there that when the farmer gets the money, the bank won't simply swallow it up to pay off somebody's debt? Uh, how, how, is it, how can we be assured that this money will actually be available to families to help to do something that is meaningful for them? It's the equivalent of about one day's uh, the, the cost of about one day's fuel for a tractor. One day's fuel for a tractor. That's the size of this benefit, and most farmers will not even get, of it, get it. Now, I'm hearing repeated stories of scores of Australian farmers who are being told that their credit is to be withdrawn. Now, part of that is because they've had they built up extensive debt over the years of the drought, and that there's trouble with their equity, and their equity will plunge. If the, if, the, uh, if, the government, if the government succeeds in plunging our economy into a recession, there will be losses in values of farm property and therefore farm equity, which would, may have been adequate to cover debt previously, will be, will be brought into question. Now, scores of farmers are also being told that, they, that their financiers, second tier financiers very often, won't be able to obtain the money they need to be able to, to, to support their, their farming customers because of the government's botched bank guarantee system. There's no money to help these people. 
$950 is no help in a uh, check in the mail is no help to you if your bank is going to foreclose. And the government seems to have done nothing in this plan to help those people who are facing such stress. Did the government consider uh, abandoning its plan to uh, massively increase quarantine charges for Australian exports? Did the government consider reinstating the farm apprenticeship scheme, which it axed uh, on, on, in its very first uh, raise again? Uh, it, will it consider abandoning its plans to axe exceptional circumstances assistance for some of the most stressed people in agriculture? And what about the dairy farmers of Australia, who are facing reductions of up to 40 per cent in their incomes, partly as a result of uh, overseas price wars, which this government has done nothing to seek to intervene to stop? When the Europeans and the Americans are subsidising their dairy products, that affects Australian farmers too. And the government has done nothing to intervene in that regard. And then can't they end, can't the government end its cruel water buybacks, which are destroying the potential for these farmers to survive into the future uh, by, by, by putting pressure on farmers to, to, to sell their water so that they are permanently out of agriculture to achieve some kind of other spurious agenda that the government has on its mind. So the, the government has also proposed to spend some money on roads, uh, on road maintenance, uh, just $150 million. That won't even make up for the cuts in road maintenance that Labor's in instituted since it's come into government. You could spend all of that on one road in my electorate and you still wouldn't have the, the, the backlog caught up on just that road. It's a, it's a, it's a paltry effort. It's a paltry contribution towards uh, improving those roads and ensuring that they're available to, to support Australian industry. So the reality is this package has not been well thought through. There's no evidence that the government has suggested uh, or considered other options. There's no evidence to suggest that they have any, any plan or vision for the future. Now, if you title your package nation building, you would think there was a vision or there was a plan, but there's not. There's no coherent strategy to, to drive recovery. It's a short-term package to buy popularity for a government that's floundering to find a way through the economic crisis. There's little or no leverage for business to harness their, their in interest and financial viability for the long-term interests of the nation. There's nothing in this package which will provide a permanent role and, sh and strengthened position for Australian business. It's just about handouts. Short-term checks in the mail, which, once they're gone, leave little or no lasting legacy. How can you build a nation when that nation is going broke? Billions of dollars a year for years and decades to come, and it will have to be spent on the debt repayments rather than building the roads and the railway lines that we need for the future. Labor talks about its, its infrastructure spending, but it will come to naught if, in fact, future generations are unable to fund the maintenance and, and, and ongoing effectiveness of our national infrastructure network. And there's nothing, of course, in this package for pensioners and self-funded retirees. There are no tax cuts except for the short-term uh, uh, short investment allowance. Thousands of jobs are being lost in industries around the country, and there is no hope for those people in this package. The government only expects to sustain 90,000 jobs. 90,000 jobs as a result of an expenditure of $42 billion. Their own estimates say there will be hundreds of thousands of Australians thrown out of, this, out of work. This package offers no hope for those people. All it does is spend money for a moment's happiness, which will be paid back by, through, through years of hardship and denial by future generations, our children and our grandchildren. The question is that this bill will be now read a second time. I call the member for Petrie. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I certainly rise to support these bills before the House today. This nation building and jobs plan is not just needed, but it is demanded. It is demanded by the global economic crisis. It is demanded as a consequence of the crisis facing, facing our national economy right now. The opposition appears to be in complete denial. We have seen this over many years, and this certainly hasn't changed. There have been in the past uh, climate change deniers. Climate change doesn't exist. The comments we heard in this chamber yesterday, the Australian people need to question seriously whether those in the opposition benches 
actually believe there's a global economic crisis going on right now? Because certainly the comments that were said yesterday, you would think that this is something that is just a stunt that is made up by this side of the government to initiate these sorts of packages. It is unbelievable that members, including shadow ministers, would stand up here in this chamber and make the comments that we've heard not just yesterday but today. We've well, just heard from the member from Wide Bay and the leader of the Nationals talking about these are just handouts. They're not about long-term initiatives. They're not about investment into infrastructure. Clearly, they have not opened a newspaper, turned on a television in the last six months, or picked up a piece of paper since yesterday and read what this package is about. I shouldn't need to do this, but I will do it anyway, just so the people sitting on the other side of the chamber understand and can go and tell the 13,000 students in primary schools in my electorate that this is just a cash splash. It's not long-term initiatives for these students. It's not long-term initiatives for these schools. You go tell Aspley East State School. You go tell Aspley Special School, a school who received an award of excellence last year for their initiatives. Tell Aspley State School, Bald Hill State School, Bracken Ridge State School, Clontarf Beach State School, Craigsley State School, Everton Park State School, Hercules Road, Humpybong, Kipwing, McDowell. Norris Road, Redcliffe Special School, Scarborough, Somerset Hills, Stafford Heights, Tell Queen of Apostles Primary School, Southern Cross Catholic College, St Joseph's Catholic Primary School, Grace Lutheran Primary School, Mueller College, Northside Christian College, Prince of Peace Lutheran Primary School, St Paul School and St Benedict's. Go tell them this is just a stunt, that this isn't going to improve the education that's provided to these students into the future. They know differently, as do many other people across this country, including a lot of well-recognised organisations who have come out in support of this organisation. Uh, sorry, this plan today. Heather Ridout from the Australian Industry Group states that the package targets consumer spending, which is absolutely critical to our near-term economic prospects and boosts capital expenditure, looming as one of the real casualties of the downturn. We've heard from the member for Wide Bay that the initiatives for farmers is worthless, that it will provide no help. Yet David Crombie from the National Farmers Federation released a press release only yesterday saying the government's $950 tax-free bonus for all drought-affected farmers will reach some 21,500 farmers in need and will be much needed families to families and regional economies. Likewise, the regional infrastructure package, which the member for Wide Bay seems to think there is no investment in infrastructure by this government, uh, Mr Crombie states will see a major revamp of country services and shore up jobs in local communities. We have heard that this government is being accused in this package of not investing in important initiatives like road building, national infrastructure, health and nursing homes. I have not heard more hypocritical comments in the last 12 months than what I've heard this morning. This is a government who 11 years not just ignored health, not just ignored nursing homes, not just ignored national infrastructure, and especially in Queensland, where apparently we don't have any national roads that need repairing or building, um, according to the government over the last decade that they did not just ignore these areas, they ripped money out of the state governments to ensure that they were not able to deliver on previous commitments as far as the monetary demands in these areas to deliver to the local economy. We've heard one solution. We haven't heard a lot of alternate propositions put up um, in the last 24 hours by the opposition, but one solution is we should delay the emissions trading scheme. What a surprise to hear the leader of the Nationals suggesting we should delay the emissions trading scheme. We know the confusion in this chamber and our colleagues in the other chamber 
about where they stand on the emissions trading scheme. The solution to the economic crisis is not to ignore climate change. That will not fix the problem. These are issues that we need to deal with, and we cannot shelve one to deal with the other. They are both important initiatives that affect not just our environment but our economy into the long term. And Ken, as been, has been shown by this National Building and Jobs Plan, can actually work together to grow the economy, to support the economy, to support jobs. And we've seen that in some of the initiatives for household, providing insulation, providing an increased rebate uh, for water, um, hot water systems. Uh, these are initiatives that not only address the climate change that is so important that needs to be done now and into the near future, but also helps to support jobs. This national package at a local level will do a lot for my electorate, Madam Deputy Speaker. When you look at just even two of the initiatives, social housing and not just what that will provide at a social level to the community that is so needed, but also what that will do to support jobs in the area. In building new units, new houses, what you get is a demand for carpenters, plumbers, electricians, painters, trades assistants. I put to the member for Wide Bay, you go tell those people in my community and any other community around Australia that this is just throwing money around and it's not going to support jobs. I'm sure those people will disagree. I know locally my schools are going to welcome this initiative. There are many schools who for many years have done without having halls, without having state-of-the-art libraries who need um, maintenance done, who need shelters. Uh, there are so many things we can be doing to support our schools. And it is not just up to the state governments to do that. We have a responsibility as well as a federal government to stand up and to acknowledge the worth of our young people and that they are our future. And if we do not invest in their education and the schools and the teachers who support them and their families, then this country doesn't have a future. So that's where we must start, and that's what we're doing. So I welcome this initiative in relation to the schools at many levels, in relation to investment in local government community infrastructure. Not only will this support jobs, once again, in my local community, but it will also provide necessary community infrastructure and services. One example, which I will be um, working closely with this organisation to lobby the local government to consider this as a worthwhile project is the complete refurbishment of the Redcliffe PCYC. This is a facility that has over 3,000 active members, young people in the community, who deserve good facilities to keep them active and to help them learn and to socialise within the community. And the PCYC do a fantastic job in doing that, but we need to do more to assist them. And I, I welcome in the gallery today Alan Sparks, Chief General Manager of East Coast Apprenticeships, who's absolutely committed, not just locally, not just in Queensland, but nationally, to creating job opportunities, training opportunities, particularly in this country. And Alan has spoken to myself this morning uh, and representatives of this government about the importance of when we're talking about building, when we're talking about maintenance, we also need to make sure that we're looking at our skills shortage and the need for further training and how we can make these initiatives complement each other. Because no matter what happens in the jobs market, we still have a skills shortage and we still need to address this problem. And that's the point we need to keep making to this opposition, that these issues don't just go away and you can't put them on the shelf and think we can come back to this at another time when the economy is looking a bit better. It is never, there has never been a more important time to deal with these initiatives. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, this bill and these bills before us this morning are important. They're necessary 
This country not only needs it, but demands that this government acts. And I call on the opposition to support these bills. I call the member for Sturt. Thank you, Madam Ac Acting Deputy Speaker. Madam, Ac Madam Acting Deputy Speaker, while the opposition may be taking the politically unpopular course with these bills, by not immediately acquiescing to the government's demand that we pass them without proper scrutiny, which is what they are demanding, we are prepared to take the courageous line because at least one political party in this country has to act responsibly. At least one political party in this country has to do what is right, not what is easy and not what is populist. On the government side of the benches, since the election in November 2007, they are yet to make a difficult decision. They are following the advice of their senators from New South Wales, who advise them to be prepared to go into deficit and to go into deficit deeply if it would help them win the next federal election. They are doing that. They are being profligate with taxpayers' money. They are making the easy decisions to spend, spend, spend. But the opposition, led by Malcolm Turnbull, the member for Wentworth, is prepared to stand up for what is right. And in the end, in the long term, the Australian public will see this debate for what it is. One side of the House prepared to take out the taxpayer's credit card and run it up to the absolute limit, and the other side of the House prepared to stand up for what is right, to stand up for proper scrutiny, to stand up for uh, no debt and low deficits or surpluses. This side of the House believes in fiscal rectitude. The other side of the House believes in spending in order to buy their way out of difficulties in the same way as they have since time immemorial. Labor's way, Labor's way has always been to tax and spend. There is not a spending idea that most members of the Labor Party don't think is a worthy spending idea, because they are not spending their own money, they are spending taxpayers' money. The pattern has been the same since the Whitlam government in 1972. And they, this, this government are the sons of Gough, the sons of Jim Cairns and even, literally, the sons of Frank Crean. There is a Crean in the Rudd government. And unfortunately, he is allowing the government to pursue the same policies that his father Frank allowed them to pursue in the Whitlam government. Sons of Cairns, sons of Crean, sons of Gough. To those Australians who might look at this package and see an advantage for them today and wish that the opposition would immediately support the package, I'd ask them to consider the long-term consequences. That this package will put the Australian budget into tens of billions of debt overnight. Within four years, the country's debt will be $70 billion. That's the conservative estimate. In the longer term, our debt will be, on, will be beyond our wildest nightmares for those of us who are dismayed by the Hawke Keating government's $96 billion debt when we took over in 1996 and had to fix up the mess that had been left to us by the Hawke Keating government. And isn't it always the way? Labor spends and the Liberals and Nationals have to fix the mess. And it'll happen again. It happened in 1929 to 1932, when we had to fix the mess created by the Depression, exacerbated by the Scullin government. It happened again, 72 to 75, when the oil shock crisis brought economic conditions to Australia that were unprecedented exacerbated again by the Whitlam, Cairns, Crean government, and we had to fix the crisis. It happened again in 1996, and it will happen again in 2010, <laughs> when in the longer term the Australian public look at this package and think, thank God one side of the House showed some responsibility, while the other side of the House, the Labor Party, were prepared to spend into debt and deficit. This debt will dwarf the Kim Beasley black hole of $10 billion that we inherited in 1996. We're talking about a debt that will lead to higher taxes, 
and reduced opportunities for our children and not only our children but our grandchildren. I'm not prepared, as the father of four children, all aged under nine, to saddle them with such an enormous debt into the future. Other members of the House, on the Labor side of the House, they seem prepared to do so. And I know that many members of the government have young children. They've obviously decided that saddling them with the debt gets them out of a short fix, gets them out of a fix, helps them win in 2010, they hope, and their children and their grandchildren can wear the consequences of the decision that they're making today as long as they win and get their backsides back on the government side of the House in 2010. That's all that's ever mattered to the Labor Party. That was the advice of Mark R. Bibb from New South Wales when he went to see Rudd and Swan and told them, spend into deficit if we have to win. That's the New South Wales way. That's the New South Wales way. That's why New South Wales now is a national disgrace economically, and their government is almost as bad as, almost as, bad as Hugo Chavez's government in Venezuela. The fine detail of this bill, the fine detail which never made it into the Prime Minister's set piece speech, which he'd obviously spent weeks preparing and then gave the Leader of the Opposition an hour and a half to prepare a detailed response, the detail that didn't make it into the Prime Minister's set piece speech for the media and for the spinmasters was that the government is raising the legislated limit on the government credit card from $75 billion to $200 billion. The government is essentially asking the parliament to give them a $200 blank check. $200 billion blank check. But my greatest concern, Madam Acting Deputy Speaker, is in my own portfolio area of education, where the government has announced a package of $14.7 billion of spending. This will be welcomed by the school sector. Who wouldn't welcome it? Uh, the schools will be delighted that this money may be spent in their schools and their institutions. But I say may be spent, and it may be, they may have the estimates correct of how much this is going to cost. But we can't, on this side of the House, give a big tick to a package, no matter how seemingly generous, given the track record of the Minister for Education in delivering the policies that were announced before the last election. In two key areas, in the trades training centres and in computers in schools, the minister has hopelessly failed to deliver on the promises that were made by the now Prime Minister before the last election. The part-time Minister for Education, with her eye on the ball of industrial relations rather than her eye on the ball of education, has been manifestly unsuccessful in delivering trade training centres for schools and computers in schools, and everybody knows it in the sector. And while many of them are too intimidated to say so, because the government is, of course, the biggest spender in education in Australia, the truth is they all know it. Computers in schools has been a manifest failure. It is in free fall. It is costing twice as much and delivering half as much as was promised. Trade training centres were supposed to be one for every one of the 2,650 secondary schools in this country. How many have been delivered? 34. 34 have been delivered. My honourable friend hasn't seen one in his electorate. 34 have been delivered across the country, and not in one in each of those 34 schools. There is evidence that schools have to pool their resources. Up to 10 schools in an area are pooling their resources to create a trade training centre, because the principals in those schools know that a lathe in the corner of the classroom, in the back of the school, is not going to make the slightest difference to building skills and training and encouraging apprenticeships and vocational education and training in this country. And they know they have to pool their resources. So I think we can say with confidence that there will never be a time when there will be a trades training centre in every school across Australia under the Rudd government. There will never be a time where there will be 2,650 trades training centres in secondary schools because it is out of the question that the money that has been allocated by the federal government will be able to deliver 
a trades training centre in every school, and we're already seeing the need for principals to pool their resources. And amazingly, coincidentally, of course, the amounts of money that are being pooled and the kinds of resources that will be created have an eerie a co coincidental mirroring of the old Australian technical colleges that my venerable colleague, uh, the member for Goldstein, and before him the member for Morton, established in the Howard government, which of course the Labor Party have essentially abolished, refusing to visit them because they know how good they are and they don't want to see the work they're destroying. They, are, they have trashed the Australian technical colleges and decided to go with a trades training centre which, because of the pooling of resources, bears an eerie similarity to the Australian technical colleges. <coughs> and isn't this always the way of Labor? Driven by ideology, driven by bureaucracy, driven by the union movement, to kill the things that work because they might be free of regulation and involvement and control from the centre. That can't be allowed to happen. We can't have more freedom. We can't have the capacity for things to compete and grow. It has to be dominated by the union movement, dominated by the government, whether state or federal. It is one of the enduring embarrassments of Labor, traced right back to their very beginnings in the late 19th century. In this package that's been announced, there's a description of the Trade Training Centres and Schools program as having been received an outstanding response from schools across the country. This struck me, Madam Acting Deputy Speaker, for the, the, the tendency to Maoism in its unreality. How absolutely ludicrous. It bears a similarity with the Maoist descriptions uh, of their own programs in the 50s and 60s. Things like consolidate and develop the grand achievements of the great proletarian cultural revolution and let's go and save our money in the bank for the sake of building a happy life warmly hail the successful happenings and warm care and great encouragement. These were the kinds of descriptions that the Maoist Communist China used to put on their failed programs. In this package we had announced yesterday, we're now describing the trade training centres as having received an outstanding response from schools across the country. There are 34 out of 2,650 promised. That's hardly an outstanding response. Principals across the country are pooling their resources because of the failure and the paucity of the money that's been put forward <coughs> for these trade training centres. Angelo Gavrilatis, no great friend of the coalition, the secretary of the Australian Education Union, described them as a modest investment and won't offer a long-term solution to skills shortages. That was post the election, even after the coalition had been defeated with the AEU's help. He described it as a modest investment that won't offer a long-term solution to skill shortages. So how could this also be at the same time uh, having received an outstanding response from schools? As I said, it, it has Maoist similarities in its, in its air of unreality. And then I turn to the Computers in Schools program and its absolute failure. So far we've seen the trades training centres essentially uh, an unsuccessful program run by a part-time education minister who is more concerned with her future in the Labor Party than she is with delivering the policies that were announced by the then Rudd opposition. But the greatest criticism of the Labor Party's pathetic performance in education can really be saved for computers in schools. The computers in schools pa program, which was going to cost about a billion dollars and apparently deliver a computer, a laptop computer, to every child between year 9 and year 11, uh, between year 9 and year 12, uh, in schools across the country. Every, every child. Uh, we've now seen it blow out, blow out to at least $2 billion, so it's costing twice as much and delivering half the value. The promise now is that every second child will have access to a laptop computer. Every second child at twice the cost. On, on anyone's reading, that is a dramatic failure of public policy in computers in schools. Blown out from a billion dollars to then $1.2 billion and then to $2 billion. When will the next blowout occur and it's delivering half the value? 
On that basis, the latest announcements in yesterday's package won't cost $14.7 billion, but are more likely to cost $29.4 billion and deliver half of what is promised, maybe a, half, a, a, a school hall to be shared between every second school. This program has been a shambles from the start, and the Minister for Education, the part-time minister, bears absolute responsibility. In its first year, computers were allocated to less than 10 per cent of public schools in Australia, and many schools that were promised computers mid-year had still not received them when their students left school for Christmas. Freedom of information applications and estimates hearings forced the government to reveal that the program was underfunded by several billion dollars because it hadn't occurred to the minister that giving someone a computer without software or IT or ongoing maintenance support or networking support was pointless. The minister tried to pass these costs onto the states and, surprisingly, the states rebelled. The states revolted. And why wouldn't they? Because everybody knows that the uplift factor from a billion dollars being spent on computers was dramatically more than the billion dollar first outlay. And the, the states simply didn't have the money, didn't have the resources. I, Ian Carpenter, the then, Alan Carpenter, the then Western Australian Premier, said it's a matter of how you implement it, rather than having boxes of computers which nobody can afford to use in schools. Or Roderick Crouch, the principal of the Moreton Bay Boys College, who said, where independent schools have additional maintenance costs, they have limited choices, raising fees, stop doing something they are currently doing, or appeal for parent fundraising. Or Alan Anna Gisborne of the Western Australian State School Teachers Union. If you're going to be putting forward something positive and constructive and it can't operate, then it's fairly useless. I'll, re I'll repeat that. If you're going to be putting forward something positive and constructive and it can't operate, then it's fairly useless. What better way to sum up all the announcements of the Labor Party in education over the last 18 months? They make a big announcement, trades training centres, computers in schools, money for numeracy and literacy, but when the rubber hits the road in the delivery, the administration and the management of these programs, it is an abject failure. So why would the opposition tick off their latest big announcement, their latest hollow man uh, announcement of huge spending in the school sector, when we have zero confidence? Zero confidence in the capacity of the government to deliver this package on the ground in schools. We know full well that what will happen is this will disappear into the ether, like the computers in schools program, like the trades training centres. The government will get a couple of good headlines, and the principals, the parents, and the students will be left uh, without any actual nourishment for the programs that have been announced. They'll be delighted initially, but the failure of administration, the failure of management, the failure to deliver will leave them hollowed out as individuals and schools with the disappointment that that brings, because we know that the minister will be incapable of delivering this program. And finally, Madam Acting Deputy Speaker, there are huge holes in this program from the point of view of education. With its $41.5 billion, $41 billion of money of taxpayers' money to be run up on the credit card, not one dollar has been earmarked for the response to the Bradley Review of Higher Education. With the money being blown in the way that it is, with the cash splash, the latest cash splash of 11, over $11 billion, following up on the December cash splash of $10 billion, sapping away at the resources of the taxpayer of Australia. Where will the money come from for the response to the Bradley Review? Where will the money come from for improvements to aged care, which is in desperate need in this country? Where will the money come from for waiting lists in hospitals, for infrastructure in hospitals? There are so many holes in this package. In education alone, I have identified a number. The Labor Party, having poo-pooed the Investing in Our Schools program, is now seeking to bring it back. Now, we support that. We believe in investing in our schools. We, ha we, we initiated that package. We wanted to keep that package. Labor abolished it, and now they're seeking to bring it back in this package. 
That is one area that we will look at in our response to this package that the leader, Malcolm Turnbull, will announce in the hours and days ahead. So, Madam Acting Deputy Speaker, more in sorrow than anger, the opposition uh, will oppose this package in the House of Representatives and the Senate. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Leichhardt. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I rise today to support these bills, responsible bills. And I see the shadow minister for education leaving, but I just haven't heard such a load of rubbish in this place for a long period of time. I don't know whether he's actually, as a shadow minister, visited any schools, but from what I've heard about sco schools not receiving computers, last week hundreds of schools in my electorate received computers, and last year I was at schools with computers in their hands that they had them. He talked about trades training centres not being rolled out. Well, I had in my office a very tangible uh, chair of the International Marine Skills training centre that's being built as a result of Labor's investment in trades training centres in electorates like mine, a project that had been planned for five years but they couldn't get the investment that they needed because the government, the former government, had an ideological bent towards these Australian technical colleges, which we know were expensive and had been a failure. But I came here today, I've come here today to debate the stimulus package not as the, as the shadow education minister divert into some ideological arguments in relation to quoting Mao and others in relation to education. We have a plan to support this Australian economy through these difficult economic times, and it's disappointing, very disappointing to hear that the opposition will be blocking those plans, blocking those nation-building and job protection plans. But before I move on to that, I also need to make the point that I hope that the Shadow Minister of Education goes home and explains to the 7,722 families in his electorate that won't be getting their back-to-school bonus and the 48 schools in his electorate that won't be receiving their $200,000 money in additional maintenance and renewable, or the, 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 or the 40 schools that will be able to apply for additional funding for infrastructure, whether it's libraries and other resources and primary school, because that is the reality of what this government's doing. At the core of this package is an investment in education, and it just shows a stark difference between this side of the House and the other side of the House when the shadow minister for education can come in here and talk such dribble. The Rudd government, as I've said, has brought forward a nation-building package a nation-building package and a job protection plan. It has measures that will invest in schools, in defence and social housing, in community infrastructure and local roads, in practical measures to tackle climate change, providing free ceiling insulation to around 2.7 million Australian homes. But we recognise that we also need to provide stimulus on the demand side. That's why we've also included measures of one-off payments to eligible families, single workers, students, drought-affected farmers and others. And we very importantly put in measures to support small business and business in general through uh, increases in, in, uh, in tax breaks for eligible assets. These measures are needed and have been well received in regions like, that I represent, like Cairns and tropical North Queensland. Our regional economy is heavily depended on the tourism and construction industries that have been battered by the global financial crisis. A well-respected regional economist has estimated that the package represented by these bills will pump between $400 and $500 million into the Cairns and tropical north economy, supporting up to 1,000 jobs in the region that I come from. And that's what the opposition is opposing. That is what the opposition is opposing. I know through the partnerships I've de developed with local business and community leaders that this, this package is needed. Jobs have been lost in the tropical north because of the global financial crisis, and the Prime Minister and Treasurer have again sought to stay ahead of the game through this package as the global economy has continued to deteriorate. The International Monetary Fund recently revised down growth forecasts for the world, with no nation coming out unscathed. World growth has revi been revised down from 3.4% in 2008 to just 0.5% this year. Developed economies are forecast to contract by 2%, with the United States and Europe being in recession. Critically to Australia, China's growth rate has also substantially been downgraded. 
Having been growing in double-digit figures in recent years, they are forecast to grow at 6.7 per cent this year in China. Economic growth, particularly in countries like China, has driven our resources boom and underpinned economic growth in Australia. While the boom is over and the IMS ha has forecast Australia's economy to also shrink by 0.2 per cent, having only last year forecast a 2.2 per cent growth rate for Australia. So the IMF is forecasting negative growth in Australia and effectively a technical recession. A responsible government doesn't stand by and let this happen. A responsible act government acts decisively in the national interest, and that is what the, the government is doing through this package of measures. When private sector demand and investment dries up in times like this, it has been economic orthodoxy for governments to step in and stimulate the economy, and that's what we are doing. As the Prime Minister has made clear, he doesn't like going into deficit, but it's the right thing to do given the global recession that we're facing. The government is acting in the national interest. This is the responsible course of action given that we are facing the world's worst crisis since the Great Depression. This is the world's worst economic crisis since the Great Depression, and those opposite are opposing these measures and want us to sit on our hands. The government has made it clear that we has a plan to bring the budget out of the budget is all, <coughs> The government has also made it clear that we have a plan to bring the budget out of deficit as the opposition continues to rile against going into deficit. We recognise that when growth returns, we put constraints on budget outlays and we will see the automatic stabilisers return and bring the budget back into deficit. We have a plan back into surplus. We have a plan to bring the budget back into surplus because we understand that it's responsible to maintain budget surpluses over the economic cycle. But we're clearly in difficult times, and arguments against deficits in this point in time by the opposition just demonstrate how out of touch they are. And I hope that they're not seeking to play politics from this, these measures, from opposing these measures, because this isn't about the Labor Party or the Liberal Party. It's about the national interest. It's about the 21 million Australians out there that are facing very difficult economic times. This package has been widely welcomed by industry and community leaders, and if the opposition isn't prepared to listen to the government, I ask them to listen to calls from the, these leaders to support the package. So if you won't listen to us, at least listen to what some of the third party and independent commentators have had to say. Heather Riddout, the Australian Industry Group, has said the nation building and jobs plan announced by the federal government today, talking about yesterday, is a simple and substantial and provide a big stimulus to help keep the economy moving. Together with the interest rate cut, it has been a big day for monetary and fiscal policy. It's a case of all hands on deck. The package targets consumer spending, which is absolutely critical to our near term economic prospects, and boosts capital expenditure, looming as one of them the real casualties of the downturn. Mr Wald King, uh, AO Australia, from the Australian Construction Association, has said the Rudd government's $42 billion nation building and jobs plan announced today will play an important role in stimulating the Australian economy. This is a very thoughtful and well-targeted program. He's described it as thoughtful and well-targeted, and I agree. But this is the right time to invest in Australia to protect the future, and today's announcements are an important contribution. It's the right time to invest. Adrian Pizarski from the National Shelter Incorporator said, this is the biggest post-war public housing investment this country has seen and is one, of, one that the Rudd government should be proud of. After 10 years of reduced spent funding from the Howard government, this is an unbelievable result for the people doing it toughest in this country. This funding was the missing element of the National Affordable Housing Agreement and will provide long-term growth for the economy and the housing sector. And I know that particularly in regions like mine where the construction industry is doing it tough, that these measures are welcome. And I've talked a bit about education, but this is what, and I noticed the uh, Shadow Minister for Education quoted Angelo Gavriel Atos from the Australian Education Union, and uh, he quoted him. Well, let's see, see what he had to say in reality in terms of our package. In addition to providing an important economic stimulus, today's announcement is the most important infrastructure investment that the government can make. 
This investment will provide the opportunity for our schools to engage in urgent upgrades and to develop modern learning environments which will improve educational outcomes for our students. That's what the education, uh, education union representative that the shadow minister was quoting has had to say about this package. And finally, the National Farmers Federation, not traditionally been great supporters of the Labor Party, have welcomed the package. The government's $950 tax-free bonus for all drought-affected farmers, reaching some 21,500 farmers in need, will be, in, will be much needed fill-up to families and regional economies. Likewise, the regional infrastructure package will see a major revamp of the country's services and shore up jobs in local communities. Further, the $2.7 billion tax break for small businesses Will, greatly, will be greatly appreciated by those small family-owned farms. That's David Cromberry from the National Farmers Federation. In light of these comments, I urge the opposition to reconsider their position. If you don't want to listen to us, at least listen to those third-party independent commentators. We, they have not, the opposition have not put forward any plan to deal with these job losses we are facing in communities like Cairns and Tropical North Queensland. They haven't put forward any plans, but they're opposing ours, and they should listen to those independent commentators. Their approach is to let the market sort it out when clearly the market has and continues to fail. They don't see a role for government to protect an investment in jobs during this period. They talk about jobs but do nothing to support them. While the Rudd government is not prepared to sit by and let Australian businesses and families down, we are strong supporters of free markets and economies, but we recognise that they fail and need, need to be properly regulated. I spoke about this in my first speech to this parliament last year. This is not the time for, stand, for governments to stand idly by, as the opposition is suggesting. This is the time for responsible action that the package of measures represents. I call the member for Calair. Uh, Thank you, uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I I rise to speak on a bill, I guess, at one of the uh, particularly serious times in our nation's history, certainly from an economic and a futuristic point of view. But I think, firstly, I've got to talk about something I actually spoke about in this House last night, and that's the state of um, the nation's health uh, administration and. Uh, and what goes with it. Last night I informed the House of the death of a man uh, in Orange Hospital yesterday who on Saturday evening, uh, because of the incompetency, the political bias of the New South Wales government, um, you know, was three hours uh, getting to, uh, after he was dealt with, uh, who collapsed uh, on Mount mm -hmm. Canoblis, uh, five minutes flying time from uh, the hospital from the Orange uh, helicopter service because they had not equipped it as they did the Wollongong and Sydney helicopters. Uh, it was three hours through sheer incompetency of administration, sheer political bias. Uh, Western New South Wales does not have anything like the same ability, to, even though it's got to deal with distance, it's got to deal with the worst terrain, the whole spectrum. It did not have, nor was it funded, to be able to deal with issues over most of New South Wales that the Wollongong uh, helicopter service uh, has to deal with, and it is only 12 minutes flying time from the, uh, from the Sydney base. The, 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 the state of health is so bad, particularly in New South Wales and particularly in Western New South Wales. When I listened to uh, the Prime Minister speak um, on uh, on, on yesterday about, about, uh, about the $42 billion package, I kept thinking, well, we're going to hear about health in a minute. We're going to hear about health. I'm still wondering why I have not heard a word about health. I mean, pretty much what we heard was a, a social package. I don't think it was a stimulus package. And as uh, our leader, Malcolm Turnbull, said earlier this morning, there are no certainties when you're dealing with economics and the issues that deal with them. But when you look at this, it very definitely is not a package that's there for the future. It's a package that is going to have a dead end. There is no flow-on effect. There is no um, end result. There is no productivity. There is no long-term gain uh, for, for, for those involved in producing for those involved in working in it, it is all here and now 
short term. Yes, I guess you could say that uh, without doubt it will keep some jobs in the building industry, but it doesn't go beyond that. It does not, and we're talking $42 billion here, it does not for one second have any ability to repay any of that $42 billion because there is no productivity, there are no taxes coming back out of it, there's no GST coming back out of it in the natural course of events. And I, I think that uh, politically it might have been at the moment a great thing for us to say, wonderful, we'll go along with $42 billion. I mean, there are a lot of families that are going to get uh, the best part of $1,000. Um, because they're a single worker or because they've got children, because they're uh, Part B taxpayers. Yeah, it, it would have been very easy to do that. And in my electorate, I, I'm sure I have a lot of people who would, uh, who would benefit from that. But I also have uh, a lot of people who, who, who have a future in this country. Mm. And uh, in my electorate, uh, Deputy Speaker, in the last four months, over a thousand jobs well over a thousand jobs have been lost in the mining industry. Now these are all people who uh, have families, well not all of them, most of them have families. Uh, some of them actually, it would be true, flying out of other uh, parts of Australia to work in there, but over a thousand, all of them, almost every guarantee, every single one of them, over $50,000. And given that, my understanding is that your tax uh, situation as of the, the 30th of June last year will be the issue as to whether or not you receive, uh, uh, you receive the, uh, the various uh, uh, $950 here, there, uh, for your children or whatever, um, I don't think one of those people receive anything. But even apart from whether or not they get $950 one off, probably if they've got any brain at all, simply to put in the bank for uh, when things get even worse than they are now, um, there is not one thing, not one thing in this package that is going to encourage an employer to offer them a job or make it any easier for them to get a job. The only job situation is holding jobs in the building industry. There is nothing here to make it less onerous on an employer to offer a job to keep somebody in a job. Not one thing. And you, know, you, you cannot escape the fact, given that uh, even, even the government even the government is currently talking about 7 per cent unemployment in a very short space of time. You cannot escape the fact that the number one issue that we've got to be looking at in now and in the near future is jobs, the second one is jobs, and the third one is jobs. And I keep looking at this package and I see a social package. I do not see anything in here that is anything encouraging people to offer more jobs, to make it easier for employers to keep jobs. There is just nothing there to do that, and there's certainly nothing there that is going to do that in, in, in my part of the world. Deputy Speaker, uh, you know, I, uh, when I look at uh, what's happened, as I said, over 1,000 jobs gone in the areas of Cobar, Ningen and Parks, just in my part of the world. That's, that's one job for every, uh, every 90,000 uh, adult people over the age of, of 18 who have the right to vote. That is quite incredible. Especially I find it incredible. There is nothing in this package to reverse or to help that trend. Let me speak of, you know, I, I look at the, uh, where this money is going, and as I said, there's no long-term future in where this money is being spent. No flow on, no comeback, no, uh, no return of production, no return of, uh, 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 of tax, no return of GST to help pay for $42 billion. Now, you stop and think about $42 billion. I can see what's happened here. They've got together and they've said, uh, well, come on, we're going to go into deficit. OK, well, we can handle $5 billion. Ah, oh, come on, we can handle more than that. And suddenly the figures, they've got into deficit, and as Labor Party, Labor governments the world over, once you've taken the first step, it's very easy to keep taking them. It's not so easy for those of us who have to pay it back. And I remember well the pain this country went through from 96 to 98 while the steps were taken to reverse the last trend. And while where you have to borrow money to get an outcome, you can't deny it can be necessary. But the outcome here is one off. It is not flow on. It, it does not help it come back. And you look at uh, 
where the money could be spent. If you really want to do things to help the country, to help the productivity, to help the job, to help the skill level, look at water. You know, uh, when in opposition, the now leader of the House, uh, uh, when he was uh, shadow for, for water, kept saying, this uh, $10 billion water plan of yours, what's wrong with it is you're not front-end loading it. We need to front-end load it and uh, do all these infrastructure things in the first three years. A little different when uh, Labor got into government. They wanted to front-end load it all right, but not into spending money on water. They wanted to buy it. They just wanted to take it out of production, and as I've said in this House before, uh, they weren't trying to sort out the Murray-Darling Basin. They declared war on the people in the Murray-Darling Basin, and they still are. Deputy Speaker, now I agree with his front end loading right now, but invest in the infrastructure. I can just there is one project uh, which is currently being looked at. We we provided money to do a to do a uh, a thesis or a study on how to save water in the uh, in the Macquarie Valley, and there are enormous amounts of water that can be saved. I think off the top of my head, 60 or 70,000 megalitres, about 10 per cent of everything in Burundong Dam could be saved in that region. And uh, this is just on two irrigation schemes, and including the towns of uh, Kobar and Ningen, which depend upon water being pumped from the Macquarie through the Albert Priest uh, to those towns and the mines that support them. You could spend that money there now. You could create jobs. All those miners who are losing their, their jobs around Cobar, Ningen and Parks would be perfect people to be involved in the infrastructure work that will be needed to put in, uh, to put in new channels, to put in pipes and to make those, uh, those uh, schemes around Trangi and uh, Narromine and, uh, and Nevertai all the way through to Ningen to make them much more, much more water efficient, uh, much more productive and give viable options for the future. I can't think of anything which would meet the current crisis better than simply throwing money away on a one-off. And as I said, it is not popular, I guess, politically, as we stand here today, to suggest investing in industry rather than in, uh, in one-off to people. But in the long term, it's all got to be paid back by the same taxpayers who are going to be getting a short-term benefit today. But I mean, uh, towns and uh, you, know, you, you can invest in returning things like water, not just for agriculture, but for towns and, uh, and, uh, and water authorities around, uh, around regional Australia everywhere. The, uh, but that seems too, uh, too complicated, it's not simple enough, and apparently it doesn't hit the particular target group this government wants to spin, Doctor. The, uh, you know, I, I look at it and I see uh, the way it's intending to be spent. And uh, you look at state governments, I remember well, and uh, Malcolm Turnbull, our coalition leader, mentioned this, earlier this morning that uh, the old investing in our schools program, which is kind of being copied now, uh, uh, it, it was very popular. And with the uh, non-government school system, the whole, every cent that was allocated to them went to them. However, for New South Wales at least, because the state schools uh, didn't have a, a separate accounting system, because they couldn't actually uh, outsource their auditing, etc., it had to be done through the, uh, through the uh, New South Wales um, uh, 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 um, Department of Education, they naturally, as they do, took 15 per cent of it. Well now, given that uh, this is basically what they're going to do again, this means that the states will pull about three billion just by saying they're administering uh, part of that $42 billion. I, I think that is quite incredible and to, uh, to put this package up without getting the states to agree not to do that I, 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 uh, I think is uh, totally irresponsible and ridiculous. I, uh, you know, I, Sure, I, I welcome uh, uh, $950 going to farmers who are receiving EC. Um, however, that's being, uh, that is targeting very much particular people. Um, 21,000 farms, yes, there is in that order of people receiving the, uh, the household support or the, uh, the, uh, 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 the, uh, the, the money for, uh, for homesteads. That's correct. But, uh, that would be in the order of 
uh, one farm in every five in Australia. Now, that's fine, but I think you'll find, if you put all those farmers together and you said, would you rather see some serious money put into infrastructure in regional Australia, be it roadworks, which are going to be ongoing? I mean, let's face it, I think you'd be far better off to spend money on roads that were going to have tolls on them, to not only to help production, to help the passage of people and everything else, because there would be a future in it. There would be a long-term gain in it and it would be helping our, uh, our taxpayers today and their children repay this money because it will have to be repaid. And it took too long and it was too hard to pull the $100 billion back that we had to pull back because I've got no doubt we're going to end up with every bit of that $200 billion being owed that, uh, that uh, the current government is trying to extend their credit limit from $75 billion to 200 billion. I've got no doubt they'll spend every cent of it. Deputy Speaker, uh, you know, if you want to do something serious about investing in the community, about having a stimulus package, why would you, on one hand, pull $60 million out of CSIRO, on one hand, uh, when you're, uh, you know, a few months ago, now they're talking about putting 88 in total so far billion into, uh, in, into uh, uh, rejuvenating the state of the nation in Australia. 88 billion, and yet you not long ago took 60 million out of one of the organisations which provides for the future of our country better than most. And of that, uh, of that 60 million, quite a lot of it came out of research into agriculture, the money CSRO spends on uh, horticulture and other things to, uh, to ensure its long-term sustainability, ability to deal with disease, ability to, uh, to uh, come up with new, uh, new and efficient ways of producing horticulture or any other kind of agricultural pursuit. I find it incredible that you don't want to invest uh, in water except to buy it and take it out of production. You don't want to invest in... Uh, in uh, in the future of agriculture, you want to take away money that's been earmarked for long-term research. I, uh, you know, and especially when you consider that uh, all the, all the uh, Minister for Agriculture and his boss want to talk about is climate change, surely when you're expecting farmers to produce more with the same or with less, that uh, you pull this money out even though you're going to spend $88 billion on Australia one way or another, but you can't spend it on agriculture. I, uh, I, uh, I think we have to look at everything from the point of view of the future, our ability to deal with... The, the, we cannot for one second forget $42 billion does not come easily and it is very hard to pay back. I, uh, you know, like everybody else in this House, I too have many schools from all parts of the biggest electorate in New South Wales, whether it's from the far outback or whether it's from places like, uh, like Blaney or, or uh, Cephala in the east or Orange. And uh, every time you see these schools, and I, I, have, I have a large family myself, and I think uh, at least $2,000 of this particular package, let alone what might come in the future, um, is owned by every man, woman and child in Australia. And uh, let's not forget, it does have to be paid back. I, uh, I look at communications and I think, uh, you know, it's not long ago uh, this government um, wiped a contract that was already signed by the previous government to provide broadband to regional Australia. He, uh, I think they could do very well to re-look at that contract talk to Optus and Elders and say, would you consider doing that again? Because they, by the end of this year, would have had broadband available to almost everybody in rural and regional Australia. And it's quite obvious that the Minister for Communications in the Senate has not the faintest idea where he's going with broadband, that there is nothing in the future. Broadband is about productivity. It is about communication. It is about helping country people do things at a time when we're going to be up against it and we will need every means at our disposal, be it social or, more to the point, productive, be it a farmer or anyone with a business at home, 
to, to, to fix a broadband up for the very little money, by comparison, that, uh, that, was, uh, that is currently being looked at to throw it to whoever they can come up with to give them a viable, uh, a viable tender, because at the moment I think the minister has no idea where he's going. And, uh, you know, just think about it. Another, by the end of this year, we would have had regional Australia with a very viable, very broad-ranging uh, broadband aspect. Deputy Speaker, uh, as I said, $42 billion, $2,000 for every man, woman and child in Australia. It is not long-term money. It is here to be spent. And even with the schools, even with the infrastructure spending, there is no gain afterwards. Certainly, yes, it would be nice for kids, whether their school needs it or not, to have a new library, whether their school needs it or not, to have a new hall, whatever it might be. But we have to, at the moment, take a view which is in the best long-term interest of Australia at a time when we're going to need it. Because I look at this and I think a little bit as the Democrats in America are, they are using the current situation to pursue a social rather than a stimulus agenda. And I think we have to have the guts to stand up and say, Let's remember we're talking $42 billion, not $42, $42 billion. doesn't matter how quickly you say it, it is one heck of a lot of money. It does have to be paid back. We do have to think about our children's future as well as our future right now. Order. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Bendigo. Uh, thanks, Mr Acting Speaker. Most of the world's major advanced economies are in recession and emerging, uh, emerging economies like China and India are slowing dramatically. No country will escape the falling economic growth, job losses and budget deficits that will flow from this. The recession is now bearing down on the Australian economy with growth slowing and employment weakening. But the Liberal Party stands here just like the Black Knight in Monty Python's Holy Grail. No matter how many arms and legs they have lost, they just won't give in and accept that they are wrong. They keep on advocating the same policies that caused the local global economic crisis in the first place. Just last weekend, the tre Shadow Treasurer was singing the praises of the voodoo economics of the 1970s. Cross the board tax cuts are the opposition's answer to everything, despite the fact that these have been one of the main causes of the economic problems in the United States, problems that have now spread to almost every country in the world. And the Shadow Treasurer's claim that reducing tax rates will increase tax revenues for the government is straight out of the Ronald Reagan neoconservative policy manual, a manual that is now so discredited. Two years ago, the architect of that tax theory, Art Laffer, said the US economy had never been in better shape. He said that there was no possibility of the US real estate bubble bursting in 2007 or 2008. In fact, he even bet someone that a, a penny that there would be no recession by 2008. And this is someone that the shadow treasurer is looking to for political policy guidance. In 1987, Ronald Reagan appointed Alan Greenspan as chairman of the Federal Reserve. For almost 20 years, Mr Greenspan argued for extreme free market economy, economics and against regulation of the financial markets. Last October, Mr Greenspan admitted that the ideology that had guided his term as Federal Reserve Chairman was wrong. Yet this is the same ideology that we hear from the Liberal and National parties today. The Liberals have no more credibility on economic policy today than Art Laffer or Alan Greenspan. Australians are indeed fortunate that they voted for a change of government before this economic crisis hit our own shores. Because the Rudd Labor government is a government that is taking action to shelter Australians from the worst effects of the global economic downturn, it is taking decisive action to help all Australians, not just the wealthy few, to deal with the uncertain times ahead. This $42 billion economic stimulus package is the latest example of the government's well thought out targeted initiatives to support the Australian economy, economy and Australian jobs. It gives support to families and individuals to ensure we keep demand and consumption flowing in the short term. And it also lays the groundwork for a stronger economy when we emerge from the global recession by investing in essential community infrastructure like schools, housing and local roads projects. Of course, this means the government will have to take the budget into a temporary deficit. With $115 billion wiped off government revenue by the global recession, there is little choice. 
but the government will stick to its election commitment to keep the budget in surplus over the economic cycle with a firm plan to reduce the surpluses as, a growth, as growth returns and the global recession turns around. The economic crisis is affecting my own electorate of Bendigo, just as it is every other part of the Australian nation. People are doing it tough as businesses contract and jobs are lost, and this is happening after more than a decade of the worst drought in living memory. So I think it's important to highlight how, highlight how this economic stimulus package will benefit many of those in my electorate. Firstly, many individuals will receive targeted bonuses that will not only help with higher living costs but also provide an immediate stimulus to the economy and support local jobs. Some 11,000 families uh, will receive back to school bonuses of around $950 to help with the cost of children returning to school. More than 260 farmers and small businesses affected by the drought will receive a hardship payment of $950. Students and people looking for work will receive a training and learning bonus of $950 to help with their study costs, and everyone whose taxable income was less than $100,000 in the 2007-08 tax year will benefit from a payment of up to $950. There is support for all of the 90 schools in my electorate, whether public, private or independent, that builds on the government's education revolution. Every primary school will receive help to build or upgrade large-scale infrastructure such as libraries and multi-purpose halls. There is funding for high schools to build new science laboratories and language learning centres. Every school will receive up to $200,000 for maintenance and renewal of school buildings and minor building works. And there is additional funding to accelerate the government's trade training centres in schools in, in the schools program, which helps to provide high-quality trade training to secondary school students. And these education initiatives will not only help schools and their students, local communities will also benefit. A key requirement of the package is that major facilities and primary schools which are built or upgraded with this funding, such as, such as halls or indoor sporting centres, must be made available for community use. This will particularly benefit or be beneficial for the smaller townships right throughout my electorate. And local communities will also benefit from an additional $500 million to expand the regional and local community infrastructure program for strategic projects. This program funds local government community infrastructure projects such as town halls, libraries, community centres and sports centres. There is a high proportion of low-income earners in my electorate and many will benefit from the commitment to build new social housing. Most of the new houses will be completed by December next year, and this will help provide a significant boost to the local housing and construction industry. Small business is the backbone of a regional economy, and it's no different in Bendigo. The temporary ta business tax break announced yesterday will help many local businesses to increase productivity by investing in new plant and equipment. Another particularly welcome set of initiatives is the $890 million to improve community infrastructure and road safety. Many lives are needlessly lost on regional roads, and these measures will be a major benefit for regional communities. An additional $30 million for the years 2008 and 2009, and $60 million in 2009 and 2010 for the Black Spots program comes on top of the government's announcement in December that it would more than double the Black Spot funding from 2008-2009 from $50 million to $110 million. Magnificent increases in, uh, in a very, very valuable project. Every dollar spent on the Black Spots program is estimated to save $14 in reduced road trauma costs. And for the first time, a portion of additional funding will be allocated to Black Spots on Australia's national highways, which until now were excluded from the program. There have been several serious accidents and rail crossings in regional Victoria, and there is an urgent need to reduce the risk faced by road and rail users at these types of intersections. Yesterday's announcement included $50 million in 2008-09 and $100 million in 2009-10 to speed up installation of around 200 sets of boom gates and other safety measures at high-risk rail crossings that don't already have such controls. And the government will also provide a further $150 million in 2008-09 to help the states and territories fund a backlog of maintenance projects on Australia's national highways. Although all new homes must be insulated, many older homes, which make up about 40 per cent of Australia's housing stock, are un uninsulated. Many of these older homes are in regional areas, and insulating them will help reduce Australia's carbon emissions, reduce energy bills and support local jobs. Installing free ceiling insulation in Australian homes will cut around $200 a year, $200 a year off household energy bills and will support the jobs of tradespeople and workers employed in the manufacturing, distribution and installation of ceiling insulation products. 
and the government has not forgotten the many vulnerable households who do not own their own home and are renters to help these households lower their greenhouse gas emissions and save money on energy bills for the next two years the government will double the rebate currently available to landlords to install insulation in their rental properties from one from five hundred dollars to one thousand dollars Mr Acting Speaker, I'm proud to speak here today in support of a package of measures that are economically responsible and appropriate for the highly uncertain times which, which we are living. It is a package of measures that only, is only possible due to the sound economic po policies of previous Labor governments. Without the far-reaching economic reforms introduced by the Hawke and Keating governments, Australia would not have enjoyed the economic prosperity it has over the last decade and would not be in such a strong position to weather the looming global recession. These measures could never have come from the Liberal and National parties if, had they been in power at this difficult time. As the Leader of the Opposition has demonstrated by announcing they will not support the package in either the House, in the House or, the, or the Senate. Mr Acting Speaker, this is just dog in the manger politics. They may as well stand up in this House and punch themselves in the head a few times. Their response is driven by the same discredited extreme capitalist ideology that made the measures necessary in the first place. Like Monty Python's Black Knight, they just don't know when to give up. The voters kicked you out because they don't want any more of your extreme ideology. Mr Speaker, once again, we are lucky, a lucky country, lucky to have a Labor government, a competent government and a responsible government in office at this time. I commend the, nation's, uh, the government's nation building and jobs plan to this House. Thank you. Call the member for Patterson. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker. It is with a great deal of pride that I note that Australia is the 17th largest economy in the world. And it's with pride that I note that the Deputy Prime Minister in Davos extolled the virtues of our banking system and the regulations that have been put in place to protect the financial uh, being of Australians. You see, Mr Deputy Speaker, Australia doesn't have a Lehman's Bank. Australia doesn't have a Bank of Scotland. We've got secure banks. And one of the things that has spiralled this country ahead of the race, down the track, towards a recession, were the profits of doom and gloom straight after the election. Straight after the election, the Prime Minister, the Treasurer, the Finance Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister all stood up and said, the economy is going too hot. Inflation is a problem. We've got to slow down this economy, so up went interest rates. Then what happened? The events that actually started to occur in September last year in overseas countries started to come through because they basically stalled our economy through their rhetoric, destroying the confidence that investors in Australia have. Investors such as small business, who are the backbone of this country and employ many people, because they started to destroy that confidence, then came this policy of splashing cash trying to fix the issue. Now, Mr Speaker, there are many reporters with economic credibility who say and report that really, other than a few select areas in retail, there has been no great benefit. There has been no 75,000 new jobs created because of that $10.4 billion. Mr Deputy Speaker, the cash splash was a relative failure and a failure that Australia could not afford. I read in the Sydney Morning Herald this morning key economic forecasts and budget bottom lines. Why do I have to read it in the Sydney Morning Herald? Because the documents were only tabled a very short period of time ago. In fact, the statement and the uh, notes that accompanied the Prime Minister's speech yesterday were only printed in limited uh, numbers, but I'm sure that every journalist, every interested journalist got one, but there were none for every member of parliament in this House. And that is a disgrace, Mr Speaker. When members in this House elected to represent the people in their electorates to look after their financial benefits as individual Australians, look after their employment prospects and in particular, as the Leader of the Opposition said today in his speech, look after the future generations, the children of this nation, who are the people that are going to be saddled with this $42 billion worth of debt, $42 billion in 48 hours 
is just under a billion dollars per hour of expenditure with no proven factor or science that it will actually work. So in the Herald this morning I read that we all knew in the budget that there would be a $21.7 billion surplus and the projection for next year was a $19.7 billion surplus. The year after $19 billion surplus and the year after that $18.9 billion surplus. And can I say that would have been to be congratulated because that was the track that the coalition had taken government and government policy over its time in government. We had gone from a deficit-run government by the Keating Hawke era to one of surpluses. We put money away for a rainy day and true, this is a rainy day. But the new predictions are this year we will have gone from a $21.7 billion surplus to $22.5 billion deficit. Next year, we will have gone from a year surplus of $19.7 billion to $35.5 billion deficit. In 2010-11, we'll go from a $19 billion surplus in the forward estimates to $34.3 billion deficit. And on the fourth year of forward estimates in 2011-12, we'll go from $18.9 billion surplus to $25.7 billion deficit. All of those deficits are individual, and then we look at the cumulative effect. But, Mr Speaker, this money needs to be paid back. Now, there are many members in this House here on the government benches that were not in Parliament in 1996. Indeed, the Prime Minister and the Treasurer were not in this House in 1996 to see the measures that had to be put in place to address the $96 billion worth of deficit that was left to the coalition to fix. And we had to make some tough decisions. There were spending cutbacks, but you know, we didn't penalise the individual. We didn't put taxes up. In fact, what we did is we made the tough reforms, economic reforms, and addressed the deficit. And it was paid off. And there was a lot of pain. But what we found is we were paying around eight to nine billion dollars per annum in interest rates on that deficit. And as we started to reduce the deficit, that money was freed up and could be spent on other things or actually given back to the taxpayers that had paid that uh, uh, money in the form of tax cuts. And many were the times on budget night that the Treasurer would get up and announce yet again another tax cut. In fact, we went to the election last year forecasting tax cuts in excess of $30 billion. Today, the Leader of the Opposition has called on the government as part of the package to bring forward the tax cuts from 2010 to now. And that would provide every household on around $80,000, two income household, around $1,700 per annum better off. But it's putting the money back into the pockets of people over a period of time. You see, once-off payments create an initial splurge quite often, and as we've heard, two-thirds of the money was more than likely the $10 billion package was spent in paying off debt. But what's more important is that payments are regular, that people can count on, that they can invest in their daily life. You see, the $1,400 that was given to our pensioners, whilst it was a good money and well-deserving, has either gone in paying off credit cards or one bill, but here it is after Christmas, February, and still they're back on $273 a week. So while we were spending 42, well, while the government intends to spend $42 billion, why aren't the pensioners taken care of? Why isn't there $30 a week increase in their pension now so that they can afford to live a little better for a longer period of time? You see, I look at this government and I compare it to when I first started work. When I first started work as an apprentice, I started to get my pay, and my first pay packet back then, and it was a few years ago, was $11 a week. And I found as I was working, I was able to get a thing called a bank card. And because I didn't receive much in the way of financial training when I was at school, I thought it was free money. But then one day when I got the bill, about a month later, I worked out that it wasn't free money and I actually had to pay it back. And I had to pay it back with interest. 
This government is treating the taxpayers as though it's free money. But the reality is it is the taxpayers, not the government, the taxpayers who will have to pay this money back. It is the young taxpayers who are going through school now who will be burdened with this debt. $42 billion in one hit of spending, and whilst some of it is very good in infrastructure, is not proven that it will fix the problem for the long term. Even the Prime Minister said this is no silver bullet. No silver bullet. But the reality is he was given the opportunity. His leadership team were given the opportunity to sit down with the coalition and work through what packages and what is financially affordable for Australia to be able to achieve the direction we want to take Australia. But no, this is the Prime Minister and his Labor team that have gone it alone. This is the Prime Minister and the Labor team that want to guillotine this debate tonight for $42 billion. So they can ram it through the Senate to make sure that the expenditure of the $950 for those lucky individuals that will receive it, not all Australians receive it, will actually start to appear in the March quarter in, in, in spending. What needed to happen, and the Prime Minister was not adverse to calling a 2020 summit to gather the Australia's best and brightest together to bring ideas to the table. At a time when you've got an economic crisis, why wasn't the Prime Minister gathering together Australia's best and brightest and sitting down around a table and working out what package would work and what would benefit all Australians, not only today, but in the future? I fear, and after seeing one of the bills here, I fear that this is only the tip of an iceberg. Today, one of the bills we're being asked to sign off on is to improve, allow government to increase borrowings to $200 billion. $200 billion. I mean, that's an awful lot of money, and I don't know if I could write that many zeros. And when I think about my own household income, and indeed many Australians think about their own household income, $200 billion is just a telephone number. It's something they don't easily understand. But when they're going to be faced with increased tax payments, they are truly going to understand it. We grew as a nation. We were able to climb through the, the Asian meltdowns, the US recessions and other economic crises because we'd taken hard measures because we created a confidence, and that is the key word in all this, we had created a confidence in our economy, confidence in the leadership of this government that people were prepared to invest and spend. Today what we are seeing is people locking up their money, and none worse than the banks. None worse than the banks. The Rudd Bank, the Rudd Bank will only satisfy some of the larger property developers. But can I say to you, and it's a well-known fact, it is the small to medium-sized businesses that make our country survive economically. It's the small to medium enterprises that employ the broad majority of Australians. And now the banks are going to those people and revaluing their assets and quite often putting foreclosure notices on their business. They demand in this environment to make sure that they recover their money. Damn what it does to the local business. Damn what it does to the jobs that are employed there. And in most of the situations, the loans that they have out there, people have never defaulted on a payment, Mr Speaker. Never defaulted on a payment. But the banks are tightening up. And as the banks tighten up because of the lack of confidence in this Labor government, we will see more small business close. We will see more people hit the unemployment queues and there will be less people working able to pay the tax to cover the debt. So it's a vicious cycle. It's a vicious cycle. And I hear members opposite talk blowing, oh, it's going to do wonderful things and I can do this and I can do that. Can I say what worries me about this finance package, and I understand all the state premiers are coming down tomorrow and who wouldn't with this bucket of money on the table, is it's just going to be a shift of dollars to the states, a shift of dollars to the states. As I look around Australia, and in particular New South Wales, where I come from, 
The New South Wales government is not only morally bankrupt, but it's financially bankrupt. It has no ability to manage its economy. Typical of Labor, no ability to manage its economy. And this Labor government is now going to give them billions upon billions of dollars of more money without demanding one single reform in that government to make sure that they spend our money, taxpayers' money, wisely and efficiently. So what we will see in the States is more of the same. The Prime Minister has talked about maintenance programs and new halls. Well, as I drive around my electorate, can I tell you the biggest issue is not school halls and necessarily maintenance. The issue is the number of demountables the kids have to sit in as they go to school. That's an issue, but that's not been addressed. But no, it's all about ribbon cutting. Having a new school hall to cut the ribbon of, these things uh, do absolutely nothing, as I see, to improve the educational standard where the kids sit in the classroom from go to woe every day they go to school. They might visit the school hall once a week for assembly or indeed a drama performance. Also, this package has failed to address one of the biggest issues in Australia, and that is health care. After all, it was the Prime Minister who stood up and said, I have a national plan. It was the Prime Minister who said, if the states don't get the health system right in 12 months, I will step in. I will step in and I guarantee to fix the problem. Well, you had a plan and you also said that the buck stops with you. Well, the reality is the bucks or the dollars have stopped with him because there is $10 billion being held up that hasn't flown through. But it needs structural reform in the administration of both education in the states and health in the states. We should be focused on outcomes, not just on political spin, not just about bailing out state governments for their re-election uh, opportunities. As I say, there are some good points. I spoke yesterday in a briefing with the Minister for Defence Science Personnel, and he spoke to me of the defence housing um, expenditure. An additional 802 homes over and above the forward estimates at a cost of $251 million. Well, their program annually is around $151 million, building 500 houses per annum. Our defence people deserve to have the best accommodation that we can provide to them, and I don't deny them that. But instead of spending $251 million on houses, perhaps could have reduced the burden on the bottom line by entering into more lease agreements and entering into leased properties for our service people and giving them some choice. I sit there and I look at this package and I look at the people that are presenting this argument and the urgency by which they do it. I'm reminded in the 70s of Gough Whitlam, who loved being Prime Minister so much and didn't want to be bothered with all the detail, he just let his ministers spend and spend recklessly. And we incurred debt that took us 30 years to recover from—30 years. I also noticed this $200 billion, and it brings back reflected memories of the Kemlani affair, where get the money wherever you can, how you can, to just make sure that we keep up with the spending. Spending to avert crisis is not wrong, as long as it's properly managed. Spending to keep people in jobs is not wrong, as long as it's properly managed. I see $42 billion, the largest single expenditure in Australia's budget ever as a, as a one package, a billion dollars an hour in what we're asked to approve, is actually reckless spending. Reckless spending because they have not bothered to sit down with the coalition or indeed even the smartest and the brightest and the best that he brought to the 2020 summit and looked at what can be done to make sure that we have a better Australia. In conclusion, can I say I was rather concerned at a media article a couple of months ago. And that media article reported on a thing called the Pappas Report. And the Pappas Report said not only the government had already taken $1 billion a year or $10 billion over the next 10 years over the defence budget, but he felt it could another $3 billion in cuts could be sustained in defence. Can I say to you that is rubbish? I say to you it's rubbish because at the moment there are people who are losing their jobs, civilians in defence who are losing their jobs because of these cutbacks. There are troops who are deployed to East Timor 
who can't even get mosquito nets to protect themselves from the mosquitoes at night. Now, I know the parliamentary secretary sitting at the table here and the next serviceman himself, and for that I uh, respect and congratulate him. But I say to you, your former colleagues are now deployed in Timor that don't have mosquito nets. Is this a part of your budget cutbacks where we can't provide basic amenity to those men and women who go to serve this nation and serve this nation well, where you've cut back on the supply of provisions to them? So, Parliamentary Secretary, I ask you to take it up with your minister. I ask you to take it up with your minister and why these people don't have basic provisions to protect them from the natural element. They don't ask much. They serve our nation well. They don't ask much. But I think that we as a nation should never cut back on basic necessities which they need to do their job. Mr Speaker, I never thought that I would stand between a bucket of money and constituents. But I have to say this to you. You have to have restraint and you have to show respect and uh, responsibility. If I approve this $42 billion, and as the, Treasurer, uh, the Leader of the Opposition said this morning, and I look into the eyes of those schoolchildren, I think I'm going to put an, up to a $9,500 debt on every man, woman and child in Australia, then I can't responsibly do that. But I say to the uh, government, we as the coalition are prepared to sit down, to meet, to talk through a complete package, perhaps a smaller package, that will be for the benefit, for the long term, Order. for this nation. Order. The member's time has expired. I call the Parliamentary Secretary for Early Childhood Education and Childcare. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to support these bills, which provide indeed a huge stimulus package which will support families and rebuild the nation. Now, the $42 billion spend uh, is immense. I acknowledge that. It is not in the normal order of things. But the government is faced with a bitter set of statistics. The majority of our trading partners are in recession. We've seen the halving of growth in China and a collapse in commodity prices. Australia is bracing for tough times, and the times require a comprehensive package, a bold package, and they require it to be delivered in a speedy manner. Now, while I say this package is not in the normal order of things, it is entirely orthodox. When the private sector retreats, it is up to the public sector to fill the gap. We are seeing this around the world, in the United Kingdom, in Europe and in the United States. And this is the context, I think, in which this package needs to be considered. As the Prime Minister has been saying, uh, across the world what started out as a financial crisis has now turned into an economic crisis and now risks becoming an employment crisis. So wherever you look, wherever, wherever perhaps whether it's uh, Nicolas Sarkozy in France or Gordon Brown in the United Kingdom, governments know that they have to lead their economies with targeted intervention and timely intervention. Indeed, newly elected US President Barack Obama is working on an $800 billion stimulus package right now, but he has not yet secured agreement from all sides in the US Congress. Now, this delay is deeply regrettable, not only because so much of the world still looks to the United States to take the lead, but most importantly because of the widening human despair across America. Every day, it seems, we hear of more layoffs in once great American companies. Already two and a half million Americans have lost their jobs, and if you just think of the despair of that. While the Congress bickers, ordinary Americans are learning to cope with shattered expectations. They are still waiting for the government to step in and alleviate the pain, to do what economic orthodoxy demands during recessionary times, an opening of the public purse to resuscitate a contracting economy. But what do we have here in the Australian Parliament? Well, it's obviously the intention of the Leader of the Opposition to emulate the Republican recalcitrance in the US Congress. And isn't that interesting? And how at odds with what the Coalition's traditional supporters are saying? 
I'll just quote uh, Katie Leahy, the chief, chief executive of the Australian Business Council. She has said that the Rudd government has acted quickly and responsibly to limit the impact of the global recession. The package, she says, delivers a substantial economic stimulus. I quote as well from Peter Verver, the CEO of the Property Council. Uh, he has praised the initiative, saying that they will inject billions of dollars of new capital directly into the community. And from my own area uh, in the northwest of Sydney, in the seat of Benelong, Andrew Bland, the chairman of the Ride Business Forum, uh, said that there are excellent moves in the packages. He's particularly praised the excellent tax incentive provided for small business to invest in capital expenditure items. And interestingly, he's also said, and I quote here, he said, uh, this will hopefully flow through to increase sales and benefit the business community as a whole. He says, we are hopeful that the cash incentives provided to most consumers will also have a similar positive effect to that experienced late last year. So praise for last year's stimulus package and welcome for the one that we are debating today. So interestingly, three comments there from what one could say would be the traditional coalition supporters. So much for the leader of the opposition being in touch with mainstream Australia and with mainstream orthodoxy. Now, Mr Speaker, talking to people in my electorate, most say similar things. They want their government to be practical and they want a government that is compassionate. In the light of today's debate, it is very interesting, um, particularly for me, to look back and reflect why the seat of Benelong, a traditional Liberal seat, actually fell at the last election in 2007. It was not because Still in of redrawn boundaries. It was not because of any particular antagonism towards John Howard. It was not that. It was because of the deep sense of betrayal felt by so many individuals in Benelong. Time and time again, when I was out door knocking in suburbs like Epping and Glades, uh, Gladesville and Deniston and North Ryde, people expressed their deep the disappointment the mayor, to to with the coalition government. Silent. Mr silent Deputy Speaker, Secretary. people continually expressed their deep disappointment that the coalition government was wasting the prosperity that as the tax revenues rolled in, as the bounty of the mining boom rolled in, people wondered why it was that the coalition government was not building the schools of the 21st century, why it was not greening our households and not providing for the homeless. The Leader of the Opposition today has the hide, I think, to talk about the need for prudent financial management, yet he was part of a government that time and time again put self-interest above the national interest. Now, if anyone doubts that, just get a copy of the Howard Years um, brought to us by your ABC late last year and have a look at the opportunism, the naked politicking, and in many cases the sheer delight of so many key ministers in the coalition government, the previous government, who couldn't believe their good luck that they got away with it for so long. Now, I know that many people in Benelong actually squirmed. They squirmed, Mr Deputy Speaker, when uh, they looked at this. And they actually felt roundly vindicated that they had sent the Liberals packing. Now, people in Benelong work hard, and they want a government that works hard in their interests. They want a government that champions their beliefs and their interests, and they particularly want that at a time when national confidence is so fragile. And that is what the government stimulus package does and why it's so important. Australians want action. They want to see builders with fresh contracts and redesigned smart school buildings that mirror the excellence of the teaching that goes, inside, goes on inside those buildings. And they want us to help them remake their houses so that they too can do their bit to save the planet. I'll finish by quoting from one of my constituents, Mr Peter Trickett, who lives in the northwest of my electorate in Epping. He wrote to me only last week. He praised the government for the first stimulus package, but he pointed out that as the managing director of an engineering consultancy, he was very concerned about the impact of the downturn on the building industry. He'd already seen eight projects delayed indefinitely. Now, being a practical man, uh, Mr Trickett made some suggestions in his letter. First of all, he said an immediate stimulus was needed, an immediate stimulus for construction. Mm. 
Most importantly, he stressed the need for community projects of the kind that would support local tradespeople and the other businesses that support them. He said the significant issue is to start now. Now, interestingly as well, Mr Trickett gave an example of the project that would be in the overall interests of the community and at the same time help the building industry. He said, and I quote, an example of the type of project to consider would be to eliminate all demountable classrooms in New South Wales. Well, I'd like to point out to uh, the previous speaker, the member for Paterson, um, this indeed is one of the options available available in the schools package that is part of the overall stimulus package. And I can say today to Mr Trickett, the Rudd government is listening and is acting. Like the Prime Minister, I look forward to the schools in my electorate becoming centres of economic activity where local people work to improve schools where children learn. Recessions are traditionally brutish things. They can empty us out. You see it in the for lease signs, the abandoned construction sites, the deferred ambitions and the lengthening unemployment queues. But you know, it doesn't have to be like this. That's why the Prime Minister has said he will move heaven and earth to support Australian jobs and shield the Australian economy from the worst effects of the global economic crisis. The dramatic reversal of our economic fortunes has reminded everyone, I think, of a key Labor principle, and that is the critical importance of balancing the public and the private, and that is what this package does. I commend the bills to the House. I call the member for Mayo. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I, too, rise to speak on the appropriation bills that we are debating today in this rushed manner uh, in this House. And I follow a member who I will note, while talking about door knocking last year uh, during the 2007 federal election, failed to show her face during a by-election in a state seat, uh, which is an interesting thing for her to do. Um, look, today the Leader of the Opposition has taken a principled but right stand. What he's done today is take a decision which will not be popular in the eyes of the electorate, uh, will not be popular in the published opinion polls, but it is the right thing to do for our country. In my maiden speech, I made the point that I come here with a set of principles that, to stand for. Um, I also made the point that no matter how big the bullies were on the other side, we wouldn't be bullied. We'd look at these packages and make decisions based on our principles. One of those principles is that we should not leave this country in worse condition for our children than how we found it. And what this package does, and what the whole economic management of this government does, is leave this country in a worse position than when we found it. It does so by racking up so much debt that opportunities for our children in the future will be greatly re uh, reduced. It will leave them a, a higher tax burden uh, and it will damage their opportunities at a better life. And I don't say this lightly. The decision we've taken in the party room and uh, a very courageous decision by our leader will not be popular in my electorate nor those of many of my colleagues in the short term. But I think in the longer term, people will respect the fact that we have stood up for them, that we have not been bullied into a popular stunt by a government which is based on politics. And this, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, is what this, uh, these bills before the House are all about. What does this package purport to do Mr Deputy Speaker, well, it does several things. Uh, it spends money in all sorts of pla uh, places, other people's money. Let's not forget that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about our constituents' money, not ours, our constituents' money. Uh, it does some things which I support. For instance, the school modernisation or the new version of investing in our schools, a Howard government program cut by this government, uh, which I support. Uh, been reinvigorated to a certain degree, and I support our leader's position in that respect. For instance, on Monday I was lucky enough to present a flag to the Kangarilla Primary School and uh, was out there with 75 students. It's a small school in my electorate. And they, 
that they have just been completely ignored by the state Labor government in South Australia. Their air conditioning system is blowing hot air, which, let me tell you, in 42 degrees uh, is not a very pleasant thing for year two and year three kids to go through. Uh, it, it's, rather than replace it, which is what's required at the Kangaroo Primary School, the state government bureaucrats insist it needs to be kept being fixed, even though the air conditioning maintenance people say it should be replaced. So I think a program like investing in our schools, which allows schools to make decisions which best suit their school, not necessarily gymnasiums or some grandiose building that the Prime Minister or one of his ministers can open, actually investing in uh, infrastructure in their schools which will work for them. Air conditioning systems is a good example. So I, I do support that sort of productive spending. However, what I have a problem with and what we will stand against and vote against both here and in the Senate are more cash splashes in the form of one-off handouts. The last package did not work. Uh, the package just announced in uh, November, October last year and delivered in December. And, uh, some of that money, the very small proportion which went to pensioners, uh, was, was welcomed. But I suspect more broadly through the community, people are a bit perplexed on why there's all this money being handed to them by a government. Why a surplus, which was for 12 years in the making, has been spent in five months? So much so, we're now $22 billion in debt. We're going further into debt next year, further the year after, and even further the year after that, to the point where we're at least $100 billion in debt, which is more, than, I note, than what we found when we last came to government in 1996. But what is really concerning is this small provision, which wasn't in the speech yesterday, the announcement from the Prime Minister. Nowhere can it be found that the government wants to increase its credit card limit from $75 billion to $200 billion. You know, it's like when most of us in this place and all our, a lot of our constituents get the letter from the bank, the helpful letter from the bank. You might have your $5,000 credit card maxed out, sir or madam, but we'll let you have $15,000. And that's what's happened. And the Rudd government's written back and said, please, can we? We will have $20 billion worth of debt in this country that our kids, my kids, will have to deal with if we let this package go through. Because what's happening here is rather than a thought through strategy on how to handle this crisis, we've got a panic. Chuck some money at it, get some cash out the door, uh, and let's make it political. Let's write an 8,000 word essay, an ideological rant, uh, and, and try and box the other side into supporting our big spending plans. Well, it won't work. We won't be bullied, as I said in my maiden speech. We're here to make decisions in the best interest of our country's future. And the member for Bendigo can be abusive all he likes and do the bullying, as his front bench does every day, led by the leader of the government and, and others. I'm, I must say the minister at the table is not one of those who's involved in that sort of behaviour. But there is some on that front bench who, who act, act up the goat and, and, and uh, do try and bully the other side into supporting their ill thought through plans, and we won't do it. We won't be bullied. We'll stand on our principles. We'll do what's right for our country, and that's what we plan to do. And that's what I thought the Leader of the Opposition said so eloquently this morning in this place. The interesting bit, which is not in this package, um, although its, call, its, its name is uh, a $42 billion na nation-building and jobs plan, is there's no focus on jobs. Uh, there's some vague reference to supporting jobs, but there's actually no focus on it. And a, a, well, a, a decent writer on economic matters, and, and certainly no friend of the coalition over time, I think he was probably one of the more critical writers of the coalition's budget strategies and economic strategies, is. Uh, Mr Tim Colbatch in the, in the Age, who today wrote, and worst is that what is not there at all, and I quote, there is nothing to help the real victims of the recession, the 800,000 Australians whom Treasury expects to be unemployed by June next year. Remembering Treasury's uh, um, estimates in recent years haven't been all that good either, so we can expect that's probably going to be a whole lot more uh, than 800,000. 
So, Tim Colback, not a supporter of the coalition. We had uh, the member for Bennelong mentioning her good personal friend, Katie Lay, at the Business Council before, uh, claiming that she supports it and so forth. Why wouldn't she? Of course she would. They're handy. It's a segmented package. There's no surprise that, the, that uh, Katie Lay is supporting it, the friend of uh, the member for Bennelong. But why, do we, why would we, after two months after the, the first package has been allocated to the Australian people, given to the Australian people, the massive one-off payments, why would we be going back straight away? You would think a government with some idea would be considering the evidence, looking at what's been shown by the first spend and seeing if the results were, were worthy of, of more one-off payments. It doesn't appear they've done so. The only flimsy evidence that those on the other side will raise is that Westfield's profits are up, which is interesting given they're uh, Social Democrats com are completely opposed to uh, capitalism these days. But that was the, the claim yesterday. And I, like the former treasurer on Late Line last night, don't believe the, people, the purpose of people paying tax is to boost the profits of Westfield. I genuinely don't. Uh, and it might, what, well, there's no evidence it's, it's kept jobs at all. There's no evidence it's kept jobs at all. All it's evidence is there's been an increase in the... Exactly. Uh, David, Jones got rid of, David Jones got rid of retail staff. So there is absolutely no evidence at all that that package meant Westfield kept more people on it. It meant their profits went up. I mean, it's, it's just pure voodoo economics from those on the, on the other side, and it's led by their leader, who doesn't know what he is. Twelve months ago, he's an economic conservative. Today, he's an unreconstructed socialist. That's what's happened here. He's bagging Margaret Thatcher, ba bagging Ronald Reagan, calling uh, Milton Freeman all sorts of names, and his treasurer is abusing a well-known uh, econ uh, economist in the US, which is extraordinary for a federal treasurer of our country to do, because they've got no idea about what they're actually doing on this. The Australian people understand the only people in this parliament who know how to manage this economy are those on this side. And that's why they'll respect, in time, this, party, uh, this side of the House's decision to stand against parts of this package, to stand against what are excessive parts of this package. We should not allow this government to, to take Australia into a situation where we are $200 billion in debt. And that is what this government is asking us to do in a 24-hour period. A 24-hour period, we did not see the bills until this morning. Until this morning. And I note that, I just, uh, that Senator Xenophon has just been on Sky News. and. Uh, uh, the threats from the other, from the other side on, on, you know, you can jam it through the House, we can sit to 2am, you can jam it through, but you can't jam it through the independents in the Senate. And I think it'd be wise for the government to consider what the independents have said. 24 hours to spend $42 billion, not of your money, of your constituents' money, of your children's future. 24 hours. How would we explain to our children in the future when they say to us, you know, why did you let this country get to $200 billion in debt, where most of our budget's taken up by paying interest on this debt? What are you going to say? Oh, we considered this in great detail over a 24-hour period. What are we here for? I mean, maybe we need to go to the great unreconstructed socialists. Maybe we need to go to the great re unreconstructed socialists and have a dictatorship so the government can just usher through its plans. Those on the other side like quoting the new president of the United States. I note the new president of the United States is trying to work with both sides of parliament. He's trying very hard to get the Republicans to support his ideas. He's listening to their ideas. What do you think the chances are that this prime minister and this treasurer will listen to Malcolm Turnbull's ideas? Exactly. Because the arrogance on the other side, as the member for Bendigo says, he agrees the arrogance on the other side is beyond Order. The repute. member for Bendigo, the the member member for Bendigo, Bendigo should just not interrupt. highlights the point. Highlights the point. This government is the most arrogant government, the most arrogant government and the most dangerous economic government we've had since Gough Whitlam had his hands on the levers. And we know that because most of those on the other side are the great disciples of Gough. Great disciples of Gough. Great celebration last week with his birthday and I congratulate him on being the oldest Prime Minister. However, he was a terrible Prime Minister. And what we're seeing here is a bigger spend than Gough. A bigger spend of, of, than Gough by GDP. We've seen a situation, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, where this government inherited a $22 billion inheritance. $22 billion inheritance that's been spent 
with another $22 billion and another $30 billion next year, and they're asking for the bank to extend their credit card to $200 billion. There is not a shred of economic credibility left on that side. There is no evidence that the first package worked. There is no evidence that this package will work. There's general assertions, there's politics, and that's all it's about. How do we say that it's politics? Well, let's look at the language in the House of the Prime Minister and the Treasurer and other ministers who have their, their answers drafted by the uh, hollow men in the PM's office each day. It's either decisive or it's a temporary deficit. Well, where did the temporary deficit come from? I understand it came from a former Treasurer, then Prime Minister in the early 1990s, who claimed that it would be a temporary deficit. Well, it was only temporary until a coalition was elected and it was turned around. When tough decisions were made in 1996 to bring the budget back into the black to reduce those interest payments, that's the only time it was, it was dragged around and it was, the temporary was ended. And that's what will happen here again. It cannot be temporary when the outward years all predict a deficit. There is no plan to get out of deficit. There is no plan uh, for a future surplus. This is a Labor writ large. So instead of spending his holidays writing an 8,000-word rant, an ideological rant based on some thought bubble I think he's had before Christmas and trying to box the Leader of the Opposition into a corner, the Prime Minister really should have sat down and thought about a plan to keep Australia strong. And let's not forget he's inherited uh, one of the best economic situations in the world. He, and I'll quote, and I'll quote someone who, who is not a supporter of ours, uh, who said on the weekend uh, that Australia has a triple A foreign currency rating, which we didn't have before 1996, in an open and competitive market backed up by a world-class financial prudential regulatory system, given the flaws exposed by the global financial crisis, I would say our system is even better than world class. That was not a supporter of ours. Uh, it was actually the Deputy Prime Minister. Better than world class, our system. Better than world class. A system inherited by those on the other side. They'll deny it, I'm sure. They'll stand there and shake their heads and say they, they did it all. With, well, actually, APRA was introduced in 1998. When did Paul Keating lose, member for Bendigo? I think it was 1996. So was Paul still telling Peter Costello what to do, was he? I don't think he was, actually. I think the member for Higgins and the former Prime Minister had a fair bit to do with the establishment of the structures which kept Australia strong. We didn't get into the, base, we didn't get into the business, as Bill Clinton did, of telling banks to lend to people who couldn't repay their debts. We didn't get into the subprime business because we had strong regulations. And that's kept Australia strong. That's kept Australia strong. The member for Bendigo can deny it all he likes. The Australian public accept this fact. I think you're, you're one of the only ones left who doesn't. Ms Gillard accepts it, sorry, the Deputy Prime Minister accepts this fact. Um, this government's got no economic credibility whatsoever. No economic credibility. And this is exposed by our decision to oppose these measures. It's the right decision for our country's future. We should not allow the situation where this government is, a, is allowed to rack up $200 billion of debt on our children's future. It won't be an issue you have to deal with, Mr. Member for Bendigo, but it will be the kids of the future. The member will it not will... encourage the member from Bendigo. My apologies, uh, Madam De Deputy Speaker. You're, you're right to pull <laughs> me up on that. The other interesting argument we hear from those opposite is that They've actually had nothing to do with the deficit. It's just sort of it's been global economic circumstances and reduced taxation revenue. Well, a small fact that they should bear in mind is actually the reduction in taxation revenue has only been nine billion out of a twenty-two billion dollar surplus. The reason we're in deficit is because there's been twenty-eight billion dollars of extra spending. So it's not actually the global financial crisis that's caused the uh, the uh, deficit. It's been decisions of the government. Decisions of the government, and we would argue ill-thought-through decisions of the government, and that's what we're saying in this place today. Not a popular decision. We accept that. We'll take a hit in the polls, and the, those on the other side will, will, will jump around with glee. But what it is is the right decision for our future. It's a principled decision. It's not a decision that I'll run some ads leading up to an election and say I'm an economic conservative, stand in front of some big towers, and and claim I'm an economic conservative and talk about how he's always been an economic conservative that believes in surplus budgets, it's actually showing through action 
a commitment to real economic conservatism, which is keeping this country in a situation where we'll be able to pay back any debt that we rack up in the future. And $200 billion of debt, giving the green light to the Labor Party and the government, racking up $200 billion of debt on the national credit card is the wrong thing to do. In summing up, I, I just want to deal with one other issue that the, the others on the other so, uh, those on the other side raise, which is uh, the, the rewriting of history, which I do give the Labor Party great credit for, they're very good at, um, particularly on the history of stimulus packages. If you look at the history of stimulus packages, it's not great. Working Nation, of course, we remember the one in December doesn't look to have done, gone so well. Um, even back to FDR, which is often rolled out as the great uh, left-wing um, policy program uh, of the 20th century, of course it didn't work. What's forgotten is the FDR's package didn't work. There was 17 per cent unemployment in 1940. He would have lost the next presidential election had it been but for a war. And I respect what he did during the Second World War, don't get me wrong, but I think his economic credentials are far from what the, uh, those on the other side would like them to be. We agree on this side of the House we need some stimulus, and that's why our position is that we support some uh, investing in our schools extra money. We, some support, we support some investment in productive capacity in the economy, like the health issues and, and electricity networks and so forth. But what we will not do, what we will not do, is allow this government to rack up $200 billion of debt for our country's kids to face in the future. It's the wrong thing for this parliament to agree to. We'll stand in the way. It's not the popular thing to do. The member for Boothby will agree with me. Those on this side of the House will agree. It will be a difficult thing for us to do in our electorates, but it's the right thing for us to do, and I stand opposed to it. The question is the bill will be narrowed a second time. The member for Newcastle. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy Speaker. Well, I'm very pleased to rise today to speak in support of the Appropriation, Nation Building and Jobs Bill and Cognate Bills. These bills uh, actually do represent decisive and considered action on the part of this government at a time when the global economic outlook has deteriorated more significantly and shows little signs of any imminent recovery. The IMF has repeatedly retargeted its forecast for global growth, cutting those predictions three times in just the past four months. But if you listen to the speakers on the other side, you think there's plenty of time to do something in, to respond. But three times the predictions for growth have been changed in four months. Finally, the IMF, our, IMF now anticipates a deep global recession. We can't afford to wait till that's upon us. With projections that world growth will fall to half per cent in this year, the lowest growth rate since World War II, now is the time to act. With global output and trade figures plummeting in the final months of 2008 and the slump in global demand leading to a collapse in commodity prices, threats to our economy are very real. Uh, I remember standing in this House last November when we were speaking on the economic security strategy, the $10.4 billion, and remarking, watching Alan Kohler on the business program on the ABC, commenting that 42 per cent of international GDP wealth had just disappeared in one day. These are unprecedented times. Well, since that time, more than more um, of international GDP wealth disappears every day. It's an economic tsunami, and it certainly keeps plunging ever closer to our shores. And without uh, a further significant and timely policy stimulus, Australians, Australian people, Australian business people, Australian industry, uh, Australian children, Australian students face the full consequences of that severe flow, uh, slowdown. With international economic pressures continuing, the influence would certainly be one that none of us would want to uh, pass on to each other. It means job losses, it means businesses slowing and increased pressures on our welfare system. I, I listen with interest to the opposition and I, I think of how this has happened and we all think of how this has happened. And ordinary Australians, most of them, they get a salary or a wage and maybe put it in the bank or they use it for their everyday living. Uh, if they've got any left over, they, they may have a home that they're buying or paying off or even investment property. They invest it into their superannuation through their employment. Um, that's it. They don't have much discretion on how to pull that out when things get tough. They've got to ride this through. They won't be getting any big dividends or returns. Those with big money, they've pulled their money out. It's not there anymore. 
That investment money is not there. I don't know where it is. Does it go back to Swiss banks? Does it go to gold bullion? Uh, where is it? But it isn't there now. People with big money have some discretion. They have some choice. Ordinary Australians don't have any choice. Their little bit of assets, it's stuck there. They're watching it diminish in value and they're hoping that these packages, this government's measures, will help them. And that's what we're trying to do. So um, I do uh, hope that when we, sorry, when we see the opposite uh, side push to a vote, that they consider that, the lack of control that most ordinary Australians have over this situation and the plea for, from them for help from us. So uh, when the economic st stimulus is taken into account, though, economic growth, we're told, according to the IMF and Treasury, is expected to grow by 1 per cent in this year. That's the growth that maintains jobs. Um, and then in the 0910, with this stimulus package, it's projected that it would, uh, growth would be perhaps 0.75 per cent in 09010. So these measures undertaken with the advice of Treasury and guided by the information coming through the IMF are all about both supporting growth and jobs now and investing in Australia's economic future. This package uh, does build on the $10.4 billion economic security strategy released earlier, and we saw pensioners, carers, people with disabilities uh, certainly making good use of that money, and uh, we know how much they appreciate that, particularly in my electorate. I was, I was absolutely touched by the number of constituents who wrote little notes and letters saying thank you, or please thank the Rudd government, or please tell Kevin that this meant so much to me. Well, yes, it did to those people because they saw no light on the horizon. Uh, now it's being spread so that there is gloom for, much more, for many more people. But uh, I do welcome the $42 billion stimulation package, and I know that the electorate of Newcastle, my electorate, is set to see many significant um, benefits. I did, though, this morning hear some of the Leader of the Opposition's grand economic rhetoric, uh, his grand uh, thesis on democracy and economic theory. Um, I've heard the member for Mayo talk about this great inheritance. Well, what did we inherit? Let's be honest now. Let's not rewrite the history again. We didn't, we didn't hear anyone say anything about the lack of investment in skills, in innovation, in education and training. We didn't hear anyone talk about um, the failure of uh, um, the, 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 the government to rein in low dock loans. Yes, I heard the Treasurer on late line the other night, uh, the former Treasurer, I should say, um, Peter Costello, uh, speaking on how we didn't have the subprime situation. No, we didn't have subprime situation, but I've been on the Economics Committee and heard two Reserve Bank governors urge the government to do something about low dock loans. And with mortgage repossessions running at one a, a, a week in my electorate, um, that's been the case for several years. It didn't start now. It started because of that neglect to the economic fundamentals. But I would say to the Leader of the Opposition, watch out. Uh, I thought Mr uh, Costello was uh, certainly uh, looking forward to an opportunity presenting itself for him and his ambitions. But these are difficult economic times, um, and this package is designed to maintain and stimulate growth, project jobs and provide a responsible and decisive response to this unprecedented global and national economic circumstances. I'm just thinking I heard someone over there mention something too, and I do remember that big spending election promise. There's that opposition saying, we are the big spenders. Well, hey, big spender, come on down. If, if we had have had to fund the election promises from the Howard government, if the public had have been foolish enough to re-elect those people into government, we would be certainly in a much more parlous situation. So um, we've also taken the opportunity in this package to invest in the green economy, uh, something very important to my electorate. We have a dreadful carbon footprint in the Hunter and Newcastle, but we export coal. Uh, but we're doing something about transitioning our economy towards a more energy efficient um, situation. So the measures that respond to climate change here that deliver for people the opportunity to take on some energy efficiency measures in their homes, whether it's house insulation, uh, whether it's a solar water tank, some people with a bit of discretionary funding would, would monies would love to invest into the climate of our future and into the environment for our, for our future. We are all feeling uh, greatly a burden in summer from that um, 
uh, situation. We all feel some guilt and some desire to, to make a difference and contribute. So it will be very pleasing to see that people will take up those opportunities to contribute to um, improving the climate change situation and building a green economy in this nation. But this package for the people of Newcastle I know will be extremely important. Average salary is less than 50000 per annum in uh, electorate like mine, so um, most people will benefit from that $950 taxpayer one-off bonus. There are over 20,000 school-aged children in my electorate, and at this time of the year when they're going back to school, that $950 back-to-school bonus will be used very well and certainly appreciated. It is an investment very much into the education of our children and an understanding that families do always have additional costs that they try to balance as best they can. So uh, every one of the 10,000 recipients of Family Tax Benefit B in my electorate will receive a bonus of $950 per family um, to help with those costs. As a former school principal, I'm delighted to see so much going into maintenance of schools and into infrastructure building schools. It is a good decision. It's something that I know can be rolled out straight away. And for a local economy like mine, 52 primary schools, 70 schools overall, this will be tens of millions of dollars injected in my, into our regional economy. And uh, defence housing, 20 jobs, 20 houses, new homes. I'm really looking forward to the benefit to my electorate. Construction jobs are known to create more jobs. The transport industry, the con subcontractors, the suppliers, it has a great way of spreading some of our wealth. The education package, building the education revolution alone then, equals a swift injection of up to $50 million into the Newcastle economy. Um, those uh, 50,000 private homeowners in my electorate who now can consider on those hot summer nights, putting in some insulation, they will be particularly pleased. I'm also pleased to see that um, uh, publicly in Newcastle many, uh, there have been many endorsements of this package, unlike the opposition. Local endorsements have been strong from the business chamber, from the trade union movement, from the manufacturing cluster group, a collective uh, Hunternet. Uh, all predicting that these will be a great assistance to our local economy. We do um, in, in Newcastle have a strong uh, tradition of stepping up when things are tough, uh, and we are doing so already. So we do make a valuable contribution to the, to the national economy, and I'd also encourage people when they are using this uh, economic package, stimulus package, to perhaps support uh, particularly local farmers' markets, local pro produce and manufacturers. There are manufacturers of, uh, of insulation, I've checked, in my electorate. Um, I hope that they score very well out of these ones. So for local regions that uh, have a history of the booms and the busts, this will be a wonderful opportunity for everyone to benefit, but everyone to contribute to this great challenge of keeping our economy strong, protecting the jobs of the people we care about and making sure that the future for this nation is a bright and great one. The question is the bill will be now read a second time. The member for Gippsland. Thank you, Speaker. It's a pleasure to speak on the bills before the House. And it would be the easiest thing in the world to stand here and join in the government cheer squad and pass the $42 billion program without any murmurs of dissent. But in all good faith to the people of Gippsland and to my own children, I can't support these bills which mortgage our future. I think the Prime Minister simply has not made the case yet to justify the scale and the targets of this package. I doubt that there is a single person in this parliament who doesn't appreciate the magnitude of the economic challenges which confront our nation and the world at the moment. But to suggest that we should just sit back and give the Prime Minister and the Treasurer a blank cheque, no matter how misguided or ill-conceived the plan may be, is, I believe, the height of arrogance from those in government. We would not be doing our job if we didn't at least scrutinise this legislation on behalf of the people of Australia. And it's easy to be shoveling the money out the door and give everyone a bonus, but it's damn hard to pay the bills back in the future. I fear the Prime Minister has panicked. In his desperation to be decisive, to do something, just do anything, he has panicked and come out with a package that even he admits, he admitted here yesterday in the chamber, he doesn't know if it will work. In this mad rush, the government is attempting to ram the legislation through Parliament without allowing reasonable time for due consideration of the details of a spending program which we all acknowledge is of historic proportions. Now, don't get me wrong, Speaker, I don't believe the package is completely flawed. 
There are several elements that I fully support, and particularly if they were downsized to more reasonable proportions. But this government is not interested in negotiating with the, uh, with the opposition. It's not interested in hearing the views of people on this side of the chamber, many of whom have held high office in the past and have been successful in guiding this nation through troubled times over the past decade. And I'm reminded of a quote from a good friend of mine, a member of the Upper House in the State Parliament of Victoria, Mr Damien Drum. And he says that to think either side has a mortgage on what is right or what is wrong is absolute folly. And I believe there's some very reasonable people in both sides of this House and that we could go a lot further in, uh, in our deliberations on this particular package if um, we listened to the good ideas on both sides of the chamber, if the Prime Minister and the Treasurer could perhaps put aside their own egos for five minutes and actually sit down and listen to others. I think Australians would benefit in the longer term. I'm sure we would end up with a much better stimulus package if we all just took a cold shower, perhaps even for a week, and brought this back before the House rather than uh, be trying to ram this legislation through today without any level of negotiation. There should be more, more discussion and negotiation between the senior members on both sides of the House. But onto the, uh, the specific details of the package, Speaker. The bonus payments is probably the one area where I have my greatest concerns. There's almost $13 billion to be given in one-off payments over the next few weeks. And these will be popular. I have no doubt that they will be popular in my electorate of Gippsland, where I have a lot of family tax A recipients and uh, quite a significant number of low-income low earners. But even the Prime Minister admitted to that the data is not even complete yet from the spending package which, which was initiated prior to Christmas, the $10.4 billion package before Christmas. I actually was one of the uh, members on this side of the House who actively supported the $10.4 billion package before Christmas because one of the primary targets of that package was the pensioners, the carers and the people with, dis dis with disabilities. They were the less fortunate people in my community who I'd been actively campaigning for for longer term uh, uh, support in terms of support payments paid by the government. So I openly supported the $10.4 billion package and encouraged people, if they had the opportunity to spend some of that money, to spend it locally and support local jobs. But it's strange that with that actual package, and I've commented on this in the past, that the, the government could never justify increasing pensions for the pure basis of, of the social justice of it, the need to help less fortunate. They, were, they had to wait until an economic crisis to finally do something to help the pensioners and carers and people with disabilities. So I was surprised by the, uh, the, uh, the Labor government, supposedly this great defender of the low income earners and those, those less fortunate, wouldn't, wouldn't, wasn't prepared to assist our pensioners at a time of need, but waited this economic crisis to justify its decision. And even if you accept that the, um, the argument that this $13 billion which the government has allocated to the uh, bonus payments, even if you accept that that $13 billion is actually affordable to the Australian nation, why are we taking a punt like this at this time? We don't know if it will work. There has been no modelling released whatsoever to tell us whether $950 per individual is enough, whether it's too much. And I fear that once that money is gone, we'll have nothing to show for it as a nation. Now, Gippslanders will get a significant share of this money. And if you worked it out based on really rough figures of $13 billion by 150 electorates, if we said there's about $87 million coming to Gippsland, I can tell you now that the people of my electorate are not as short-sighted as the Prime Minister in this regard. They would rather see that $87 million spent on safer roads, on better hospitals, improved aged care facilities, sporting grounds, swimming pools and nursing homes. There's some real infrastructure improvements that are going to be there for the longer term, not a here today, gone tomorrow, cash splash, which is all we're going to see over the next months with this uh, $13 billion program. There's a very long list in my own electorate where we could be spending this money more constructively and I believe would actually deliver the long-term productivity improvements we're looking for as a nation as we move forward in the, uh, in the 21st century. The Shire of Wellington itself has uh, regularly lobbied the uh, government and myself in relation to a $5 million plan to help uh, develop an indoor sports centre. Again, a much better use of the money than just uh, $950 one-off payments. The McAllister Irrigation District around the Mafra area has an urgent need to upgrade the irrigation channels. We're talking about one of the most productive export industries in my region, and there's no funding uh, available for it under the National Water Plan at this stage. And also, we're going to see this uh, $950 payments being made in one-off payments to farmers. I can tell you now they would rather see some real commitment to upgrade the irrigation infrastructure in Gippsland for the longer term so their children have a future on the farm rather than just one $950 payment, which is all they're going to see from this particular package. Gippsland Rotary Centenary House is another project which I've been speaking to the government about. It's been a very successful program. The state government in Victoria and the previous government in a bipartisan way supported the development of the uh, Gippsland Rotary Centenary House, where local Rotary clubs have created a home away from home for people receiving cancer treatment. 
Tragically, the, uh, the program is so successful, it's in such demand in the Latrobe Valley that we need more units. And there's a, a plan put before the government now to build a further nine units. And again, the people of Gippsland would rather see some of this $13 billion spent on projects like that for longer term benefits to the cancer care treatment of people in Gippsland than a one off payment of 950 bucks. There's a, an ongoing program which has received support from both sides of the House, from the uh, Minister for Regional Development and also from the uh, Prime Minister and the, uh, and the former Prime Minister, is to upgrade the Prince's Highway from Trialgon to the New South Wales border. Every report that comes back from the OSRAP studies shows that the Prince's Highway in Gippsland is of a lower standard than would be accepted of a national highway. There's a program put before the government, it's been accepted by the government, a $140 million program to uh, duplicate the highway from Trialgon to Sale. And again, all we've seen committed to that program is $2 million. Another project that Gippsland would rather see get underway than a $950 one-off cash payment, which will be gone before Easter. The investment in natural gas reticulation is one way that we could be, uh, and again, I accept this is actually more of a state government responsibility, but judging by the program we've got before us, the uh, state and federal boundaries have been blurred somewhat in this, ca this current package. Investing in natural gas reticulation is primarily a state responsibility, but it would deliver uh, jobs to my community and help our small businesses pr to prosper and to, to compete with the metropolitan areas. I think a lot of metropolitan businesses take for granted that the gas from Gippsland uh, is available for their use, but as many uh, small businesses in my community have no access to natural gas at the moment. And it's something that I've approached the, uh, both the state and federal ministers about. And once again, the people of Gippsland would rather see something constructive rather than, than the uh, $950 in their pocket, which is gone tomorrow. I think Gippsland is, I think the, uh, the Prime Minister and the Treasurer are selling Gippsland as an all Australian short by suggesting they'd rather just have this one off payment than some longer term investment in infrastructure. One of the key areas of the package which I believe where, where it lets down the, the people of Australia is in, in relation to small business support. I think the real focus of any package that we put together to the Australian public now should have a focus on jobs. And again, this package misses the mark. I acknowledge that there are some tax breaks for small business, and that's a positive start. But if we're going to be splashing around a sum of $42 billion in just one package, we need a real focus on jobs, and particularly as a, as a country-based member of parliament, jobs in rural industries and the small business sector. Uh, for example, again, there's, there's nothing in this package to help secure the export markets for the dairy industry, which is faced with an uncertain future due to the price cuts and the protectionism of the European Union. Nothing in this package for rural industries whatsoever. There's nothing here to support the regional tourism industry, which staggers me. We have got the member for Eden Monaro in the chamber with me today. And I'd suggest the, uh, the member would love to see some more funding for regional tourism to promote the great attractions of the Sapphire Coast. Sapphire Coast is a nice place, but you know, the Gippsland uh, coastal area is just a little bit better. The member for Eden Monaro disagrees. But there's nothing here. There's nothing here to support the regional tourism industry. I would, I would support a massive boost in marketing of regional attractions to encourage Australians, perhaps this year, to put the local economy first and to take a holiday here in Australia. And I'm, I'm disappointed that the package, which could have focused on small business jobs, on tourism industry jobs, has missed the mark in that regard. Certainly, Speaker, the government could have reinstated the Farm Apprenticeship Scheme and also the Small Business Assistance Program, which were both cut in the previous budget. It's very hard to believe that you're four jobs and you're for small business when you have a, a government prepared to cut such schemes in the last budget. There really could have been more investment in regional infrastructure and programs like the Regional Partnerships Initiative, which has been sadly missed in a lot of regional communities since its uh, disbandment by this government. We've had the inquiry. Now I think it's time to start rolling out funding for genuine projects which uh, meet the tests and uh, will be um, certainly strongly supported by members who represent regional electorates. Speaker, this package should have been all about jobs, and given my, my bias for regional communities, it should have been all about regional jobs. There's, what the government is saying last year to what they're saying now is something that uh, really is beyond belief. Last year we were talking about creating 250,000 $250, jobs from these stimulus packages, but now they're only talking about supporting jobs, supporting 90,000 jobs. I fear that we're really just making this up as we go along. They don't know if this package is going to help jobs at all, and I'm not prepared to mortgage Australia's future on a bit of guesswork by the Treasurer and the Prime Minister. Gippslanders would rather have a job in the future than have a $950 bonus in their pocket in the next month or so. Gippslanders are telling me already that they, they would support a major investment infrastructure boost rather than just $950 in one bonus payment which will be gone before Easter. Speaker, even with a $42 billion package, even with a package of historic proportions, there are those who have managed to miss out. It's hard to believe it when you're throwing uh, taxpayers' money around like confetti that some people can still miss out. 
But among them are the most vulnerable and those heavily imp impacted by the economic uh, crisis, such as our self-funded retirees. There's not a cracker in this for them, not a cracker in this for the, uh, for the pensioners, the carers, the people with disabilities. Who should be, we should be look, locking in a permanent increase in their support payments now rather, and giving some certainty to the economy rather than the whim of one-off payments. What if this money is not enough? When's the next payment going to come? When is the next stimulus package? It's very easy. Anyone can make a hero of themselves going around spending like a drunken sailor, shouting in the bar when they're spending someone else's money. I said at the outset the package is not without merit. And I believe there are some good ideas in here, just as I do believe there are good ideas on both sides of the House to contribute to this debate. And that is why I'm most concerned that we've attempted to ram this package through with such a, sh a short amount of time for debate. The schools and education package is one area where I think there is probably unanimous support across the chamber. It's one of the most sensible components of this package. Uh, I'd like to perhaps, uh, perhaps ignore the rhetoric that members uh, uh, from opposite sides have suggested that the, uh, the previous government wasn't interested in schools. Well, I'd suggest the Investing in Our Schools program was an outstanding initiative, and members on this side of the House would certainly support such a package going forward into the future. <laughs> members on both sides of the House understand the importance of investing in the future of our children, and it's the very essence, I believe, of this debate is what is that future we're going to provide for our young children. What concerns me most with this package is it discriminates against the smaller schools in regional, regional areas by allocating them a smaller amount. And I fear that, again, that the the uh, federal government in this regard is actually bailing out our state governments in their, their, and we're going to end up hiding their failure to invest in the future of our, of our um, public schools. There is no one, though, who's going to debate the point about whether we need to be investing more in our schools, but I think this is one of those times when a bit more uh, discussion and negotiation between both sides of the House would have come up with a better package than just simply throwing uh, massive amounts, $14.7 billion at the problem and effectively bailing out the state government's failure to invest. The sheer magnitude of this program and the involvement of the state governments brings doubts to my mind whether it can actually be delivered. There's no one in this, on this side of the House that has much confidence in the capacity Order. of— Order. It being 2 p.m., the debate is interrupted in accordance with Standing Order 97. The debate may be resumed at a later hour. The member for Gippsland will have leave to continue speaking when the debate is resumed. <coughs> Order. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Prime Minister. I refer the Prime Minister to his forecast of $70 billion in debt over the next four years. Can the Prime Minister explain to the House why his one-page legislation rushed into the Parliament in a panic this morning allows his government to increase debt to $200 billion. What is the government holding back from the Australian people? The Prime Minister. Um, Mr Speaker, uh, in answer to the honourable member's question, he'll be familiar with a couple of facts. First is a collapse in government revenues uh, over two periods now, first announced at the time of my EFO where revenues collapsed at $40 billion. Since then, a further collapse of revenues of $75 billion. Secondly, uh, in terms of additional borrowing requirements for the government, there is, of course, uh, the other measures, including enhanced social security payments, which flow from increased unemployment and other associated social security payments. That's the second factor. And the third factor goes to the actual cost of funding the nation-building plan, which the government announced yesterday. If you aggregate the three measures that I've just referred to, it requires borrowing. I would, I would challenge the Leader of the Opposition to identify in this chamber which individual measures of all those referred to he chooses not to support because he knows, as everyone else knows, that in these economic circumstances they can only be financed by borrowing. The member for Deakin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister explain to the House the need for the Nation Building and Jobs Plan announced yesterday and its role in addressing the global recession? The Prime Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. I thank the honourable member for his question. Because it goes to the uh, heart of how this nation responds to a global financial crisis, which is becoming a global economic crisis and in turn a global employment crisis. And as I've said to the House before and will say again, there are two strategic choices for the national leadership of Australia. 
either to act and to take a concrete course of action to seek to reduce the impact Order. of this global recession on Australians who did not cause this crisis, or to simply sit on the fence and carp. That, Mr Speaker, represents the alternatives for the leadership of the nation. The Labor government has decided on a course of action. Those opposite have decided to remain firmly sitting on the fence and carp because they've concluded that it is their political advantage so to do. Mr Speaker, on the content of the package that uh, we have put forward, the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Education and myself today went out and visited a school, St Gregory's Parish School in Queanbeyan, one of 7,400 primary schools in Australia. 7,400 primary schools in Australia. Catholic independent government right across the country, where this government has resolved to invest, together with the secondary school program and maintenance programs, nearly $15 billion. $15 billion. Mr Speaker, when I was at St Gregory's this morning, they Order. outlined to me how they were currently uh, in the business of building a new library resource centre. It's costing them $1.5 million through the renovation of a building that's been there since the 60s. They pointed out to me at that school that uh, they have demountables uh, with, in which the kids are still studying. And for a school of 600 kids, they have actually no assembly hall, none whatsoever. And when I spoke to the principal, this is a Catholic school, a Catholic school. I spoke to the principal. Well, those opposite just interjected something about state school. It's a Catholic school. And the principal said, what we really need in this school is an assembly hall in order to bring the kids together. The stinking hot days on which the um, uh, kids went back to primary school last week, in the, de in the depths of winter here in this part of Australia, it's pretty hard to bring the school together in a single place. And so what that principal said to me, and I imagine he'll resolve this uh, with the uh, Catholic Education Authority, is that he wants to see projects like that advance within his school. A school of 600 in our neighbourhood, and I was out there this morning with the uh, member for Eden Monero. Can I suggest to those opposite, each one of them, right across the country, each one of the primary schools and each one of your electorates, what you have embarked upon today is to vote against the biggest building program Order. in every primary school in the nation. Every primary school in the nation. In the electorate of North Sydney, in the electorate of Curtin, in the electorate of Wentworth, throughout Adelaide, throughout Brisbane, throughout Queensland, every state of the country, you are voting no against what the school teachers, the PNCs and the PNFs of this nation are demanding. And you are doing so for one reason and one reason alone, and that is rank political expediency. Rank political expediency. Because I suspect that I notice, uh, I notice uh, Higgins up the back has a quiet chortle to himself. I think he knows what my reference is. Because John Higgins has, again, a hungry look uh, when it comes to questions of Liberal Party leadership. Always a backward glance to see what Higgins might be up to. Can I just say this? When the Leader of the Opposition said, uh, in effect, in a statement today, that building school infrastructure was not the highest infrastructure priority of the nation, that's what you think. Ah, so he says, he says that school Order. infrastructure. Order. Order. Mr. Speaker, the House will come so to order. We have it confirmed from the leader of the opposition, the leader of the Liberal Party, that building school infrastructure is not an infrastructure priority for the nation. That's what he said. Secondly, on the question, on the question Order. of hospitals. Oh, on the question of hospitals, as they twist and as they turn, and have to deal with every PNC and PNF in each of their electorates who come and say, why are you voting against a building program for the primary schools in your electorate? What this Leader of the Opposition then seeks to deflect to is the necessary investment in hospitals. Well, Mr Speaker, the Liberal government talking to us about the priority of investment in hospitals. Twelve Order. years of Liberal government. Twelve years of Liberal government about the priority of investment in public hospitals. I've seen it all. As they 
gouged $1 billion out of public hospital expenditure, and within our first year in office, in the meeting of the Council of Australian Governments in this building in December last year, what did we agree on? A $4.8 billion plan with the states and territories to reinvest in public hospitals. A $1.1 billion plan also to invest in the future human resource needs of the health system. Further investment when it comes to emergency services, $750 million. Further investment as well when it comes to $600 million in elective surgery. All these things we have done in one Order. year, and those opposite have the absolute audacity to stand here and challenge whether we regard public hospitals as an infrastructure priority. The truth is, in your 12 years in office, what characterised those opposite? That no infrastructure was a priority, none whatsoever. You ripped and gouged at public hospitals, you failed to invest in our universities, you failed to invest in our TAFEs. And now you refuse to invest in our primary schools. I could say to those opposite, the contrast in terms of nation building is clear. I'd say also to the Leader of the Opposition, his opposition, the Liberal Party's opposition to the biggest nation building, the biggest school modernisation plan for Australia, demonstrates how out of touch he has become. Order. The Liberal Party, out of touch with PNCs, PNFs, mums and dads, seeking to have decent buildings for their kids in primary schools. Out of touch with mums and dads struggling with paying back-to-school costs. Out of touch with small Member business who want the measures that we Member have foreshadowed Sturt. yesterday by way of the accelerated investment allowance. Tradies, carpenters, plumbers, who are desperately seeking for new project work, how out of touch with them and their needs you are. Out of touch with the real needs of Australians. Instead, his prescription is this. Stand to one side and allow the Australian people, Australian tradies, mums and dads, to, fa to face and to endure the full brunt of this global economic recession without government stepping in to help. That's the alternative. And um, can I say to the leader Order. of the opposition? I, I say to the leader of the opposition and to the House that the challenge for the nation at a time of unprecedented global economic challenge is clear cut. Either you act and government intervenes to help stabilise financial markets, to help increase growth, Biden. to help support jobs and to help families deal with the consequences of this global recession, or you vacate the field as recommended by the Liberal Party. This Liberal Party is out of touch with mums and dads' basic needs right across the country. This government will get on with the business of seeking to protect the Australian economy and families as much as is humanly possible from a global economic the recession which Biden. they did not cause and which free market fundamentalism has rammed in their direction. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Prime Minister. And I refer to the latest ABS retail trade survey, which showed that seasonally adjusted sales increased by 700 million from November to December. And I asked the Prime Minister what happened to the other $8.9 billion of the cash splash. The Prime Minister. Order. Order. Mr. Speaker, just, ex order, just occasionally, just order, occasionally. Order the Prime Minister to resume his seat. <laughs> Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, occasionally, just occasionally, is a question from the Liberal Liberal Party which really takes your breath away. <laughs> really takes your breath away. Uniquely across this nation, 
across the world in, the, in what has happened to the global economic crisis. We have positive news in terms of retail sales in December, and those opposite want to simply cry foul and say they're not good enough. Across the world, retail collapsed in December. In the United States, there was a massive collapse in retail stores. You saw it also in the data I referred to from um, Westfield yesterday in New Zealand. We produce not just, of course, the figures which came from Westfield yesterday and also the figures which have been produced from other sources as well, but the retail sales data again produced officially today demonstrates that we had, through the measures provided by the government uh, at the end of last year, investment by consumers in consumption which helped support uh, all those businesses employing people out there in the retail sector. Those opposite, those opposite who claim from time to time, depending on the season, to stand up for the interests of small business, fail to understand how much small business is concentrated in the retail sector. Are you seriously saying to the government that the investment which we made through that uh, allocation to families at the last year, the impact which it's had on retail sales, and the flow-through effect which that has had, the flow-through effect which that has had to the small business sector in the retail uh, businesses of the country, is of no consequence. Well, can I just say it demonstrates one thing: those opposite have embarked upon a campaign of negativity, negativity, negativity. We are in the business of embarking upon a positive course of action to see the nation through, and the Leader of the Opposition Order, the Prime should think will better of the retail— Prime Minister, will assume seat. The Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Uh, Mr Speaker, we would like the Prime Minister to engage in a campaign of relevance, relevance, relevance. Order. The Leader of the Opposition will assume seat. Has the Prime Minister concluded his answer? The Prime Minister has concluded his answer. The The member for Page. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Education, Employment and Workplace Relations and Social Inclusion. Would the Deputy Prime Minister please update the House on reaction to the government's $14.7 billion building the education revolution? The Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for her question and know how interested she is in the circumstances of schools in her electorate. Uh, can I say, Mr. Speaker, that we have had reaction to the announcement yesterday from all of those who are in touch with the needs of Australian schools, those who work in schools, those whose children go to schools, those who represent schools in the public debate. Those in touch with the needs of Australian schools have, of course, welcomed the government's historic Building the Education Revolution package and its historic $14.7 billion investment in primary schools, special schools, schools that service primary and secondary students together, K-12 schools and into secondary schools. And to give you just a flavour of the responses, Mr Bill Daniels, who represents the Independent Schools Council, welcomed this substantial investment in capital infrastructure and said it would greatly benefit school communities across Australia. The president of the Australian Primary Principals Association, Leonie Trimper, said, and I quote, uh, the announcement is fantastic news for Australia's 7,500 primary schools. This is fantastic win-win for all Australians. It is a lasting investment in Australia's future, our primary students. And I could, of course, go on to a host of other supportive comments, but perhaps the sentiment was best caught by Mr Bill Bird, the principal of Kingsgrove Public School, who was quoted in today's Australian. He described the package as brilliant and said he looked forward to replacing the demountable library which had been there after the original building burnt down several years ago. He said, and I quote, it will give a new sense of permanence and purpose. This is extremely important. Not only that, it will result in an environment that is actually conducive to learning. These are the voices of people who are in touch with the needs of schools. Then, unfortunately, Mr Speaker, we've also heard the voices of those who are completely out of touch with the needs of schools. 
first and foremost the Leader of the Opposition, who uh, in his contribution earlier today asked rhetorically, is the most urgent infrastructure deficiency requirement in Australia primary school assembly halls and libraries? Well, I suggest he walk into any school in this country and talk to the principal, talk to the teachers, talk to the uh, parents of children in that school and ask them what they think is important to the future of this nation and what they will say is important to the future of this nation is having a 21st century education system that invests in primary school students. And the Leader of the Opposition wants to play some funny game about priorities. Well, the government is very proud to say we think this nation's priority is its children. We think this nation's hot prize priority is the next generation of Australians our highest priority for economic prosperity, our highest priority for equity. We will unashamedly say that in every school in this country, and presumably members of the Liberal Party will be walking in the door to say kids aren't a priority, because that's what the Leader of the Opposition believes. And of course, the Leader of the Opposition wasn't the only Liberal voice putting this position. We had the member for Higgins describing this 14.7 billion dollar investment in Australian schools as a poor quality spend. Well, the only poor quality in relation to this announcement is the completely out of touch reaction of the Leader of the Opposition and his Liberal Party. They don't understand the importance of schools to Australia's future. They don't understand the importance of a first class education for Australian school students to this nation's future. They are completely out of touch with principals, with teachers and with parents and with all those Australians who care about our future and most particularly <coughs> care about the education of Australia's kids. Order. Order. Before I call Deputy Leader of the Opposition, as the mention of young Australians sent the House slightly haywire, I think it's perhaps appropriate that at this time I welcome the young Australians from regional and rural communities that are here for the Haywire Youth Issues Forum. Of course, Haywire is an initiative of, the a of ABC Radio. On behalf of members, I welcome them to the House and wish them all the best with their activities throughout the week. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Treasurer, the government forecasts economic growth of 3 per cent in 2011-2012 and is forecasting to run a deficit of $25.7 billion in that year. Can the Treasurer explain to the House how the government intends to maintain a budget surplus over the economic cycle while it has plans to run a huge deficit in a year of average growth. The Treasurer. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr Speaker. The uh, Deputy Leader of the Opposition just can't get it right. We project, we project trend growth in that year. We don't forecast it in that year. Let's be very, very clear about that. This is this is, there's a very, very big difference. This is a very important time in the history of this nation. Order. One's a projection, Order. the other has been modelled, of course. Order. Now, now, Mr Speaker, the economic illiteracy of those opposite is just truly stunning. For the first time, Mr Speaker, for the first time in the history of this country, we have had a major political party and its leader come into this House and say, that they intend to deliberately vote for higher unemployment. That is, that order. is exactly, order. That is exactly the what they have said. Order. The Treasurer resume his seat. Order. Order. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition on a point of order. Apart from the offensive nature of that allegation, Mr Speaker, order. on a point of relevance. Order. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition has the I ask the Treasurer to come back to the point about how they will maintain a budget surplus over the economic cycle when they are forecasting 
Order. In the a Deputy year Leader of, the of assumed will resume. Proceed. The Treasurer will respond to the question. Treasurer. Uh, certainly, uh, Mr. Speaker. And the opposition doesn't believe that we need an economic stimulus despite the fact that there has been Order. such a substantial contraction in demand, Mr Speaker. They don't, think, they don't think, for example, Order. that we need bonus payments Order. targeted at lower income earners, targeted at lower income earners to boost consumption precisely at the time that this country needs it, when the world is doing the worst that it can possibly throw at us. What this government is going to do is to act to support jobs. And to do that, we do need to have a temporary deficit. And that is provided for in the Ford estimates. And our commitment to fiscal rigour over the long term remains. And we have Order. made it very clear in the document, in the, U the UEFO, that we intend to return to surplus as soon as we possibly can. Consistent. I Order. Mr Speaker, it sounds order. like all of those opposite know the date that world global conditions are going Member to normalise. Do you know that date? Of course you don't. Of course you don't. Member for so when growth returns to trend terms, we will begin to move back to surplus. That is the responsible <coughs> thing to do. And of course, moving back to surplus would not be helped by the approach of those opposite. Because we've had the deputy leader of the opposition suggest the way to get future growth and future tax revenue is to give even bigger tax cuts. She said that bigger permanent tax cuts would increase revenue. Well, we would suggest that's a recipe for higher and higher deficits and higher and higher borrowings. That's exactly what it is. And of course, it's interesting to look at what the Leader of the Opposition has had to say about her position on this. This is what he, uh, he had to say this morning on ABC Radio. Interviewer, can you explain Julie Bishop's suggestion on the weekend that you can increase your tax revenue by cutting your tax take? Mr Turnbull, well, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, a point. It's like a lot of economic uh, points. It has merit, but it isn't right, you know, in, a, in an extreme form. The Treasurer of Jimmy's seat, the Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. Mr Speaker, I'm trying to save the Treasurer from himself here. Mr Speaker, he was asked a question. Uh, if he believes he's keeping to his own formula, why is the government projecting 3 per cent growth and yet running a $25.7 billion the, deficit. The Manager of Opposition Business will resume his seat. The Treasurer will respond to the question. Are we listening very closely to the Treasurer? Treasurer. Mr the Speaker, so the interviewer went on. Do you agree with Julie Bishop? Mr Turnbull, well, it, 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 it. I Order. simply, rather than... The Treasurer will resume his seat. To, the Treasurer will resume his seat. The Treasurer will resume his seat. Treasurer! Treasurer! The Treasurer will resume his seat. The... the member for O'Connor on a point of order. Yes, Mr Speaker. Whilst recognising the limitations upon yourself in terms of the answering of a question, it is still required to be relevant, and a question asked about the government's business and the government's budget hardly requires reading to this parliament some interview that was conducted Order. in the, on the radio. Order. I don't care who it was. Order. I'm the telling you, let him answer the question, Order. even the if it's with his escape clause. Resume his seat. The interjectors will stop interjecting. The member for O'Connor will ignore the interjections. <laughs> there is a there is a character that has a name in common with me that has a saying, "Make my day," but I'm not going to. All right. <laughs> 
I will be listening very carefully to the Treasurer's response. There are difficulties, as I said yesterday, with the way in which uh, the House has allowed this type of uh, material to be used in answers, which I have a problem with because it is bordering on debate, which is not allowed in the formulation of a question, but the traditions of the House have allowed it. I will listen carefully to the uh, Treasurer's response. The Treasurer has the call. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I was merely making the point that the opposition Order. has a policy to send the budget into deeper deficit permanently. Permanently. And what we are doing with a targeted stimulus is to support jobs right now when they're needed, Mr Speaker. And of course, we've made the point and we've made it publicly. Uh, in the documentation that we published yesterday, that as soon as the economy reco recovers, as soon as the economy grows above trend, the government will take action to return the budget to surplus. That is as it should be. The member for Melbourne Ports. Uh, speaker, my question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer update the House on the retail trade figures released this morning and their implications? The Treasurer. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, the nation building and jobs plan that we oh, announced uh, yesterday, and of course the economic security strategy that we put in place uh, last October, do demonstrate how Australia can get through this global recession in better, in better shape than most other advanced economies. Because we can use our strengths, we can use our strengths in fiscal policy and monetary policy to to stimulate demand in this economy and to support jobs. And that is precisely uh, what we are doing. And it's precisely the intention, that was precisely the intention of the economic security strategy last October. And if these retail trade figures today demonstrate anything, they demonstrate how out of touch the Leader of the Opposition is and his entire front bench is from what is actually happening in Australia. Because contrary to the Orwellian language Order. of the Leader of the Opposition earlier, what these retail trade figures show is that the economic security strategy gave a significant boost to demand in December last year. A significant boost to demand in December last year, supporting employment, supporting employment particularly in the retail sector, uh, Mr Speaker. The December retail trade figures show that retail sales increased by 3.8 per cent in December. You know, that's the biggest monthly increase since August 2000. But consider the backdrop to this, Order. because it goes Order to the, the, the core of the inaccuracy of what the opposition has been saying in this place over the last 48 hours. Because the backdrop the to Bowman. this is the sharpest contraction in global demand in December seen in the history of the modern market economy. And in other countries around the world, what you saw was substantial falls in retail sales. And if you go through them, in the US, retail sales fell by 2.7 per cent in the month of December. In Japan, sales fell by 2 per cent in December. In Germany, they fell by 1.2 per cent. And in the UK, they fell by 1 per cent. And it's also instructive to look at the data as to where the sales were biggest or where they increased the most, because there is this uh, allegation from, from the other side that Australian families are out there wasting it. That's the implication of what they're saying. Let's just look at where it was spent. Department stores, an increase of 8.3 per cent. Clothing, 5.8 per cent. Other member household for goods, 9.9 per cent. And this is occurring in the midst of the carnage on global stock markets, the collapse in demand and growth right around the world. This is a very substantial achievement, and it has been a very big boost to employment in this economy at a critical time for so many Australian families. And I would say it certainly demonstrates the wisdom of the government's approach in targeting our assistance, particularly to those who are credit constrained and who are on lower incomes. And it demonstrates why most of the economists around the world and most of the official bodies back our view that making these payments to people who are credit constrained and on lower incomes and doing it in a lump sum works. It works. 
And of course, we, we, we get this from the IMF most particularly. If we could just uh, look at what John Lipsky has had to say on the 17th of no November. He's uh, the deputy chief of the IMF, the former chief economist. For example, measures to support low-income households would be particularly helpful in boosting demand and would be targeted at those most in need. Or even go to the Business Council of Australia and their budget submission. And I could go on and on, quoting economists around the world, Member including Nobel laureates, who provide a very sensible source of advice, which common sense tells you is correct that if you target your support at those who need the assistance most, then their propensity to spend will be highest. And of course, that is the orthodox position. It is not the position, of course, articulated by the Leader of the Opposition or by the Deputy Leader uh, of the Opposition. And it now brings us to this point, and it's very important to consider it in this light. By refusing to support the package that we have brought forward and being so critical, of the consumption measures that we have put in this package, if they were successful in their endeavours, they would leave a gaping hole in our economic defences, a gaping hole against the contraction in demand that is occurring on a global basis. And this government does not intend for that to happen. We, we are intent on putting in place this, this uh, jobs plan, this package to support employment in the Australian economy for Australians right now. And anyone who won't support it is simply supporting higher unemployment and is utterly irresponsible. The member for North Sydney. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, uh, is, well, is the Prime Minister aware of reports that over 90 per cent of National Australia Bank mortgage customers are still paying above their monthly minimum repayments? In other words, mortgage holders are paying down their debt rather than taking the savings and interest rate reductions. Given this pattern of saving by householders, how can the Prime Minister be confident that his cash handouts will be spent and not saved by nervous householders? Order the Prime Minister. The Prime well, Minister um, resume his seat. Prime Minister resume his seat. The member for Bowman will leave the chamber for one hour under 94A. The order the member for banks. Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I uh, thank the honourable member for North Sydney for his question. And uh, it does uh, bring back into stark relief the um, Leader of the Opposition's uh, proclamation of the Turnbull Doctrine yesterday that the thing about money is you either spend it or save it. Um, <laughs> those essentially representing the two strategic <coughs> options uh, which are available. Um, Mr. Speaker, uh, this government is not in the business and can never be in the business of forcing any individual consumer or taxpayer to deploy their funds in a particular way. Uh, what we can do, however, is assist the family budget by the practical measures that we outlined last year in the economic security strategy and, again, as a part, or one quarter of, in fact, uh, the nation-building plan that the government released yesterday. If individual uh, households and consumers elect to spend, then of course that directly assists sectors of the economy, such as retail, but other sectors as well, and therefore that supports employment directly. And that is why there's such a strong body of uh, advice from organisations around the world as to the virtue in employment terms of such measures. Secondly, however, if consumers elect to save in part, as many of them will, then that can have the effect of then offsetting later decisions to return to spending. I'll give you a practical example. If someone is now electing, for example, to take part of the $950 cash bonus to make a temporary down payment or a temporary reduction in their credit card bill, that's a matter for them. But if that is their decision anyway, what that provides is a greater opportunity for that person to, re to return to other levels of spending a little later on. These things do not exist as stark alternatives to each other. That is why a proper and rational response to the global economic recession and its impact on Australia is to have an entire armoury of measures, those designed to support uh, households, 
those designed to support consumption, those designed to support private residential construction, hence the first home buyers boost of last year, hence many of the construction-related initiatives we announced yesterday, including the one-off extraordinary investment of into 20,000 units of social housing. That is why you must also embrace as part of your strategy encouragement of business to resume decisions on private fixed capital investment, hence our decisions to bring in uh, an accelerated temporary investment allowance. And on top of that, why we must also uh, push the uh, throttle into fast forward in the direct government investment in critical public infrastructure like schools, like roads and uh, other elements of transport and related infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, a rational response to the impact of the global recession on the Australian economy must embrace all elements that I've just referred to. It's not one or the other. That is the only way in which we can reduce the impact of this global recession on Australia. The alternative, as the member for North Sydney knows full well, is simply to let the free market rip. That's the alternatives that the Australian people are confronted with. Our strategy is clear. The member for Braddon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Families, Housing, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs. Will the minister update the House on how the government's nation, national building and jobs plan will support Australian families such as those in my electorate of Braddon and of any responses? The Minister for Family, Housing, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Braddon uh, for his question and for the very hard work that he uh, does for the families in his uh, electorate in that part of Tasmania. Mr Speaker, yesterday there was uh, some new hope for Australian families. Mums and dads could breathe just a little easier with the announcement of the government's $42 billion nation building and jobs plan. It is uh, an economy-boosting plan from a government that is determined to take the decisive action needed to support families and jobs. And under the plan, 8.7 million taxpayers get a tax bonus of up to $950. 2.7 million school-aged children attract a $950 back-to-school bonus. 1.5 million single-income ha family households get a $950 single-income family bonus. And families relying on the housing and construction sectors could feel a little more confident knowing that 21,000 jobs were going to be supported by the government's investment in uh, the social housing sector—$6.4 billion of investment. But now what we see from the opposition leader is that he wants to kill that hope and confidence of Australian families. He doesn't care about the millions of jobs, the millions of jobs under threat if families don't get these tax bonuses and payments. He doesn't care about stopping support for the 21,000 jobs in the housing and construction uh, sector. So every single time, every single time an Australian parent loses their job, every single time the opposition leader will need to answer to those parents about why it is that he's opposing this nation building and jobs plan. Now, all of us on this side of the House, and I think many other Australians, know exactly why the Leader of the Opposition is doing this. For base political purposes, no other. I have to say uh, it, must be a pretty, it must be a pretty lonely place over there because from the Business Council right through to Anglicare, they all understand why it is that uh, this uh, plan needs to be supported. The opposition has got this gravely and dangerously wrong, gravely and dangerously wrong. And just this morning, as the Prime Minister and the Treasurer have said so clearly today, we've got the final nail in the opposition leader's coffin with the uh, retail sales figures up by 3.8 per cent. The leader of the opposition might not have noticed these are the biggest monthly increases since August 2000. The figures don't lie. The economic strategy payments in December 
did their job, and he should now make sure he supports the government's actions in our $42 billion package so that people can keep their jobs. The member for Casey. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Can the Treasurer point to a country where a stimulus package providing one-off payments to families and individuals has successfully created jobs? Australia. <laughs> Order. The Treasurer. Treasurer. Order. The House will come to order. Uh, Mr Speaker, they're so out of touch they don't know what country they're living in. I can point to the success of the economic security order. strategy. I can point order. to the success of the economic security strategy of last October in Australia. And I can and I can say I can say to the honourable member that the overwhelming research work that has been done around the world by the expert bodies studying this matter over the years most notably the International Monetary Fund, is absolutely unambiguous in its recommendation for our approach. But, you know, it's not only, it's not only people like uh, Paul Krugman, Nobel laureate, it's not only a large body of economic opinion, not only in the United States and Britain, but it's also shared by many people in this country. So could I just quote from a recent budget submission uh, given to the government? It says this. Measures most likely to immediately impact demand are direct purchases of goods and services by government and or transfers directed to members of the community with a high propensity to spend. Now, who would have that come from? Could that have come from the ACTU, maybe? Maybe. It came from the Business Council of Australia, Mr Speaker, because this is accepted wisdom. The only place it's not accepted is by those opposite who are so terminally out of touch they can't see the urgency involved here and the need to support Australian jobs and Australian industry. The member for Petrie. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer outline for the House the economic benefits of the Nation Building and Jobs Plan and why it is so important the plan can be implemented as soon as possible. The Treasurer. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Look, it's very important that this uh, legislation passes the House this week. Uh, we have been advised by the Tax Commissioner and also by the Chief Executive of Centrelink that we do need key legislation through this House if the payments are to proceed through Centrelink in March and if the tax bonuses are to be paid uh, by the tax office in April. That is just a fact. And given the urgency of what is occurring internationally, it is very important that there is no undue delay. Now, I've seen the Leader of the Opposition today talk about what we should be doing instead, for example, of providing uh, the tax bonus and some of the other payments. And he suggests that what we should do instead is bring forward the 2009-10 tax cuts. That was one suggestion yesterday. Now, of course, if you were to take the Leader of the Opposition's suggestion, that would deliver $150 to a taxpayer on $30,000. Only $150. There's no stimulus there. That is $800 less than our tax bonus that we will deliver in April. If you're talking about someone on $65,000, he only wants to deliver in that period $150. Once again, $800 less than the tax bonus that we will deliver in April. Now, of course, he would deliver, through his proposition, $2,150 to a taxpayer on $200,000. And that's a real indicator of the priorities of the Leader of the Opposition. Now, I think because I pointed out this mistake to him yesterday, he changed his tune in the House today. And I think in the House today he suggested that they would be in favour of bringing forward the tax cuts from 2010-11. I think that's what he said in the House today. Now, if his proposal were to be adopted, 
That would result in $300 to a taxpayer on $30,000, $650 less than the bonus that we would provide in April. But for somebody on $200,000, that would deliver $3,450 to that taxpayer, $3,450 more than they would receive through our temporary bonus. But it is worse than that. It is worse than that, uh, Mr. Speaker, because it goes to the point that I made to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition earlier, because they are arguing in favour of permanent tax cuts. If the proposition was put and implemented by the Leader of the Opposition to bring forward the 1011 uh, tax cuts, the Leader of the Opposition's proposed tax bring forward would cost $11 billion, $11 billion, $11 billion on a permanent basis. Hence my observation earlier that they are in favour of higher deficits permanently. The Leader of the National Party. Mr Speaker, my question oh, is also no. to the Treasurer, and I refer the, uh, the Treasurer to weekend newspaper reports that $81 million from the government's first spending package went to recipients living permanently overseas. <laughs> Treasurer, how did these payments overseas stimulate the Australian economy? The Treasurer. <clears throat> Mr Speaker, I think, uh, I think the member has a very short memory. Uh, it is the case that we do have reciprocal social security agreements with other countries, and payments Order. are made to Australians living overseas, and uh, residents of other countries have payments Order. made to their residents living here. And Order. I do have a long memory, because I have, a, I have, a, I have a, me a memory of a time when the member who asked the question Order. was actually a minister for social security in this House. And I think you'll find he might have negotiated some of those agreements. <laughs> well I think that's the case. I think that's the case. And he was certainly a member of a government that was, that was negotiating the well current right. arrangements that apply now and have always applied under both sides of politics. Yeah. The member for Hasluck. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government. How will the government's nation building and jobs plan improve road safety and stimulate local economies? The Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for Hasluck for her question and her ongoing issue, in go, ongoing interest in, in uh, transport, in transport and infrastructure development, including in her electorate. The package that is before the House today <coughs> provides an additional $90 million for the Black Spots program. The Black Spots program improves safety right around the nation. For every dollar spent, there is a far greater saving due to the fall in costs in terms of uh, health costs from accident reduction and in terms of efficiencies on our roads. This will fund an additional 350 projects. It brings spending on black spots to over $250 million over the next two years, more than double, more than double what the former government was planning to spend over the same period. Now, we're also providing an additional an additional $150 million for repairing and maintaining regional roads. In order to do all this, of course, we need to get the package that is before the House passed. Now, you would expect, you would expect the National Party to at least be supporting regional road projects. If nothing else, you would expect them to be supporting that. But you had, of course, you had, of course, the leader of the National Party has already made his contribution to this debate, the Shadow Minister for Transport, and he's dismissed the $150 million. He has dismissed it. Indeed, he has spend, so called it a paltry effort. He has said you could spend all of that on one road in my electorate and you still would not have caught up on the maintenance backlog just for that road. Who was the minister? Order. Who was the minister who presided over 
the maintenance backlog. Who was the Minister for Transport in the former government? He and his national colleagues presided over, presided over massive cuts in road funding, including, including a cut of 35 per cent in 2005-06, it was $4.3 billion, down to $2.8 billion in 06 7 A cut of 35 per cent in road funding. But so out of touch are they with uh, people that they used to be a part of uh, their constituency that they, engaged, that they engaged in. So out of touch are they. This is what people in the sector have had to say about the package put forward under the Nation Building and Jobs Program. Wendy Machen, President of the NRMA, said yesterday, the NRMA warmly welcomes this additional funding, particularly the fact that a substantial proportion of the money will be immediately available to be spent this financial year. Trevor Martin of the Australian Trucking Association said, we are very pleased the government has looked beyond tomorrow's headlines and is putting money into fixing the roads and making them safer. Every road user will benefit from the government's plan. The fact is that the opposition are just so out of touch. It is all about themselves. It's all about the politics. The Leader of the Opposition is more concerned with protecting his own position as Leader of the Opposition than he is with defending the interests of the nation. So that the default position, the default position, because his party room is just so divided, is to come in here and simply say we'll oppose the whole package. Well, they stand, they stand condemned. They stand isolated from their own base. They stand isolated from their own communities. And over coming days, weeks, and months, there will be a real political price to pay for their political opportunism of the Leader of the Opposition. The member for Stirling. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Education and Social Inclusion. I refer the Deputy Prime Minister to yesterday's updated economic outlook, which forecasts a loss of 300,000 Australian jobs. How can the Deputy Prime Minister reconcile that loss of jobs with the government's claims that its recent spending packages will create or support 330,000 jobs? The Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the uh, Shadow Minister for his question. And the answer to the Shadow Minister's question is, in fact, obvious. The government is engaged in the economic security strategy in this nation building and jobs plan to promote economic activity and to support jobs. And as the Prime Minister has said on as the Prime Minister has Order. said on more than one occasion, we are in difficult times. We are in difficult times. But what we can certainly say about the economic security Order. statement and about this nation building and jobs plan is that it will support economic growth and consequently support jobs. And whilst we are in difficult economic times, Order. clearly Clearly, the nation will be in a better position with this stimulus in our economy than if the nation followed the lead of the Leader of the Opposition and the members of the Liberal Party, who Farrell. have taken a conscious decision today to come into this parliament and to vote for higher unemployment, to come into this parliament and vote against nation-building oh, propositions, no. including, including the Stirling. biggest historic spend on our schools in this nation's history. That is what the Liberal Party has chosen to do. The Treasurer during the course of question time has taken the Liberal Party 
to the evidence from the retail trade figures about the difference that the economic security strategy made. And if members of the Liberal Party are so economically naive, so economically incompetent, that they can't reason from those figures into understanding that stimulus packages make a difference to economic activity and stimulus packages consequently make a difference and support <coughs> jobs, then really I do wonder what hope there is for them. And I would have to say Order. to the Leader of the Opposition the that if he can't explain that basic economics to his front bench, one does wonder what skills you needed to have to be a merchant banker. Order. The member for Ford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Finance and Deregulation. Will the Minister advise the Government's Order. nation building and jobs plan will maximise support for jobs? And why is a temporary stimulus through targeted payments and investment a better mechanism for supporting economic growth and jobs rather than tax cuts for the higher income earners? The Minister for Finance and Deregulation. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Government's nation building and jobs plan is designed to push back hard against the very powerful negative economic forces emerging from overseas that are causing major problems for the Australian economy and at the same time leave a legacy of new and upgraded infrastructure for the future of Australians. The individual payments that we are committed to will hit the Australian economy first in March and April but continue to flow through for some months thereafter because people may in some cases save initially and then spend subsequently. The investment in insulation of Australian homes, in schools, in housing will ensure that we rebuild the infrastructure of this nation, both the community infrastructure and the productive infrastructure, for the benefit of future generations. And it's legitimate to ask, Mr Speaker, what exactly would across-the-board tax cuts favouring wealthy people, permanent tax cuts, do for future generations in terms of productive infrastructure and community infrastructure? How are they going to improve the productivity of this nation? Now, yesterday, Mr Speaker, I reminded the House of the infamous Order. statement by the member for Curtin on Sunday where she advised that the Coalition's response was, quote, broad and sweeping tax cuts that will increase the tax base and increase tax revenues. Now, as I've already pointed out, this is based on the discredited theories of Professor Arthur Laffer that if you actually cut taxes, that will mean tax revenues grow. And I note the Leader of the Opposition's response to that in a radio interview where he stumbled, Order. he bumbled, he weaved, he ducked. Order. He was unable to avoid actually sort of saying, well, I kind of agree sometimes with his own deputy leader, his own shadow treasurer. There was lots of, well, it, 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 and simply this, and I'm not going to. And Minister of Finance, resume his seat. The Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. Mr Speaker, this is like Groundhog Day. Mr Speaker, except that the second order. time round it's far more presentable. Order. I would ask you to bring him back to the question that he was asked by his own order. side. Order. The, I'm listening closely and the uh, question asked for a uh, the comment on target and, uh, targeted and uh, tax cuts, and that's, I think, what the minister's doing. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. There is another element in the statement by the Deputy Leader of the Opposition that warrants some examination too, and that is the reference to, quote, increase the tax base. Now, increase the tax base means one thing, and that is you start taxing things that currently aren't taxed. That's what the former government did by introducing the GST. That's what increase the tax base actually means, Mr Speaker. And I note that the opposition Order. that is today making such, a, such an emphasis on the issues of deficit is, such a, is, is saying that its alternative strategy, its alternative strategy outlined this morning by the Leader of the Opposition, involved a stimulus package Order. of $15 billion, $15 billion minimum. And when asked on radio in Perth Dixon. today, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition was asked if you were going to spend $15 billion in a recovery package, would that send the Australian economy into deficit? And her answer was, 
quote, it would balance it, in fact, at this point. Now, not only has she not caught up with the collapse in government revenues that the, the Prime Minister announced on Monday, $115 billion collapse in revenues, but even if you measure this against the projections in the mid-year economic and fiscal outlook papers published in mid-November, you would see that this statement is 100 per cent wrong. She cannot even add up. She cannot even add up, Mr Speaker, because that stimulus package they proposed would take the, the budget into deficit, even without the recent updated analysis of the collapse in tax revenues, Mr Speaker. Now, the statements from the Deputy Leader lead to one of two conclusions, Mr Speaker. Either the opposition has a strategy to impose new taxes, perhaps broaden the GST, put it back on food where it always wanted to do, or or she has absolutely no idea what she's talking about. Those are the two options, Mr Speaker. Now, I concede, I concede Mr Speaker, that there is quite a bit of evidence to support the second hypothesis. There is quite a bit of evidence to support that hypothesis. But having been in this place for a while, I'm a bit of a cynical type. I'm a bit more suspicious. I tend to believe in politics that where there's a little bit of smoke, there's going to be fire, Mr Speaker. Where there's some smoke, and I note with interest that Late January, she also said that one of the first things the, oppos the opposition would do in response to the global financial crisis is revisit industrial relations laws. Mm. I wonder what that's a reference to. Now, I believe in watching what people do, watching what people do in politics, and what we've really seen hinted at by the deputy leader of the opposition, and, and walked away from, to a degree, for public presentation purposes by the Leader of the Opposition is the real traditional Liberal Party strategy, which is tax cuts for the wealthy, increase the GST's scope and bring back work choices. That is the strategy of the Opposition. Now, the government rejects these approaches, the government rejects these approaches Mr Order. Speaker, because Order. we are investing in the long-term infrastructure needs of this nation. We are getting spending moving into the pockets of ordinary families to ensure that the retail sector, the ordinary small business of this country can continue to grow and to sustain employment, to sustain jobs and growth. The member for Sturt. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister, and I refer the Prime Minister to his No Child Shall Be Without a Computer between Year 9 and 12 and a Trades Training Centre for Every Secondary School promises at the last election. Given that the free-falling Computers in Schools program has doubled to $2 billion and only 34 trades training centres have been approved for Australia's 2,650 secondary schools, what confidence can the Australian people possibly have that yesterday's promises for schools will be any less hollow? The Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker. The government stands unapologetically for an education revolution in Australia. I thought that would get him going. An education revolution in terms of what we build in our schools, our primary schools, our secondary schools, our TAFEs, our universities and in our research. And the reason we believe in that is because we need to equip this nation for the 21st century economy. I said yesterday that when I said at the last election that we needed to prepare for that day when the mining boom was over, those opposite, when they were in government, scoffed and laughed. That was a little more than a year ago. Guess what? The mining boom's over. And what you did for 12 years was to turn your back on developing the knowledge base of the economy to deal with the challenges of the 21st century. And if it's escaped the attention of the member for Skirt, Sturt, in, in, midst of his, um, in the midst of his um, well, I think he must have an interesting set of arrangements at the moment in terms of his loyalties between the member for Wentworth and the member for Higgins. Well, just think about that for a minute. Order. The Prime Minister will resume his seat. The member for Sturt on a point of order. Mr Speaker, the question was very specifically about the hollow promises made at the last election and their failure to be delivered. It was about order. outcomes, not rhetoric. Order. The, the Prime Minister should Sturt be brought back to the question. Seat. The member for Sturt will resume his seat. The member for Sturt will resume his seat. The Prime Minister is responding to the question. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And a key part of the education revolution is to ensure that our kids have access to the digital education revolution of the 21st century. That means that all kids 
not just those in the richest and flashiest schools, but all kids have an opportunity to participate in the information economy of tomorrow. And that means that we've got to work hard to do it. What the, those opposite, when they had 12 years to act, did was simply push it all into a too hard basket. Nothing happened on high-speed broadband. Nothing happened in terms of a rollout of effective computer access within our schools. Uh, when it comes to trades training centres in schools, as we have gone around the country, we've seen capital works or capital infrastructure in our secondary schools, which hasn't been updated for 30 or 40 years. This is a disgrace. We need to invest it to fix it. And what we've sought to do, adding to that with the nation building plan which we outlined yesterday, was to add language laboratories, to add also science wings in our primary schools, 21st century libraries, also multi purpose halls. This is part of building the best education system that this nation can possibly have. And we will honour our pre election com commitments on trades training centres and on computers in schools as given. Order. The member for Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Trade. How will Australia's trade policy enhance the economic impact of the government's nation building and jobs plan? The Minister for Trade. Mr. Speaker, I thank the honourable member for his quest her question and make the point that the um, global financial crisis is having a huge impact of trade on trade flows around the world, and despite the fact that Australia posted a strong surplus yesterday, trade surplus yesterday, we won't be immune. And the reason for that is that six out of our top ten trading partners are already in recession. We've got the IMF forecasting that trade flows will decline this year by 2.8%. And we are seeing very worrying trends in terms of reversion to protectionist policies, most evidenced by the dairy decision in the EC and the Buy America campaign uh, emanating from the US Congress, both uh, measures which we have strongly opposed. But because we are not immune, uh, Mr Speaker, it is the reason that we as a government here have to act decisively, as well as in international fora in arguing and taking action for a positive and constructive path forward. And that's why yesterday's $42 billion jobs and nation building package is an essential part to our response, not just for what matters here in the country, but in terms of a global call for those countries that are in a position to spend and inject the fiscal stimulus to do so. And the IMF has called for countries that are in that position to spend at least 2 per cent into their GDP. Yesterday, of course, we also saw the Reserve Bank responding, not just to the circumstances here, but to the urgings again of banking authorities for the um, central banks to ease interest rate pressures. And it's also the reason that our endeavours in the international fora to free up trade is so important to this coordinated approach. The reason for that is simple, Mr Speaker, because trade itself is a stimulus. And that's because world trade has historically grown faster than world output. And each time that there's been a successful conclusion to a trade round, that multiplier has increased. So the point that we make, Mr Speaker, is this. What is the point? What is the point in the coordinated approach to fiscal stimulus unless you're prepared to work on the multiplier as well? And that's why we have been advocating the conclusion of the Order. Doha round, not just in the Order. forums of the WTO, but through, but the, through the G20. Now, Mr Speaker, this is a government that has responded and acted in terms of the coordinated action. But who is standing against that action in this country? Those that sit opposite. Because what they would do was to oppose the stimulus message and the stimulus call 
that the international organisations have called for and to which Australia has responded. Their action is irresponsible. It doesn't just fly in the face of what's being called for globally, but it condemns Australian working families to the worst excesses of what will happen out of this global recession. The member for Dixon. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health and Ageing. Would the minister outline the government's, how the government's spending package will provide relief to patients and doctors in hospitals around the nation, including the Dubbo Hospital, where doctors haven't been paid since October, and regular maintenance, pr maintenance programs are not being undertaken? Why won't the minister deliver on the government's promise to fix public hospitals? The Minister for Health and Ageing. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the member for his, que his question because it allows us to take the opportunity to remind the House about the very significant investments that have already been made in health in the last 14 months. In contrast, in contrast to the approach taken by the previous government, which used to rip money out of the public hospital system. So let me just recap in case any members over the Christmas break have forgotten about the 64 billion dollars of health investment for a 50 per cent increase on the previous government in this health care agreement. Order. I don't hear anybody saying that a 50 per cent increase on the previous government's health care agreement is an underinvestment in health. I didn't hear any criticism about $1.1 billion going into Order. workforce. For I didn't hear any criticism when we put $750 million onto the table for emergency departments across the country. Order. I didn't hear any objections to that, something that they never did. I didn't hear any the objection from constituents in the electorates of those opposite and in the electorates of our members when we committed to putting $600 million into elective surgery. And I can report to the House that 35,000 procedures— for, The minister will resume her seat. The member for Dixon on a point of order. On a point of order, uh, Mr Speaker. The question went to the $42 billion spending package by the government and why there was not one dollar toward order. those hospitals order. in the $42 billion the announced for, by, the, by the Prime Minister. The member, for Dixon, the member for Dixon will resume his seat. I would suggest that he review the latter part of his question. The, member for, the Minister for Health has the call. Thank you. I will get to the question of the Dubbo Hospital in a moment, but let me first report to the House order. that I haven't heard people uh, complaining about the extra 35,000 plus procedures, <coughs> hips, knees, cataracts, that were paid for by this government's investments in its first days in office that have now been delivered across the country, yeah. more than were promised. But let me, let, me go particularly, let me go particularly to the question of the Dubbo Hospital, because it is a very bad situation. And I have in answer order, to order. previous questions in the House, made clear that we do not uh, uh, and are not apologists for what is clearly an inadequate situation at that hospital. Order. But I would like order. to read. I would like to uh, read a quote to the House um, because it seems that sometimes those opposite don't like to uh, hear my views on these things. But I wondered whether they might like to hear the member for Dixon's view. And his comments last week on 2SM. It will be very interesting for you because he said, and I quote, this is uh, 2SM radio last week, the issues at Dubbo Hospital, of course, have been around for a while. The hospital and the public health issues in general have been around, frankly, for the last 10 years. <laughs> We've done more in the last year than you ever did. Minister, for, Minister resume his seat. The member for Dixon on a point of order. On a point of order, uh, Mr Speaker. I'm happy to clarify it. For the last 10 years, order. Labor's the been in New South Dixon Wales will and they've ripped patients off. It. The member for Dixon. The House will come. The House will come to order. The House will come to order. 
The member for Dixon is reminded that that is not a point of order, and the Speaker's tolerance is getting very stretched. The Minister has concluded. The member, the, the Minister for Trade. The member for Morton has the call. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Education, Employment and Workplace Relations and Social Inclusion. Would the Deputy Prime Minister advise the House on the opportunities for members to play a role in the rollout of the Building the Education Revolution initiative? The Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Morton for his question and know that he's deeply interested in education in his electorate. And can I say to the member for Morton Order. and can I say Order. to all members in this parliament who are in touch with their local schools that our new program for building the education revolution, our 14.7 billion dollar program, a historic investment in every school in this country, in every primary school, in every secondary school, in every special school, that this new investment offers opportunities for members of parliament who are in touch with the schools in their community to assist. And of course, members who are in touch with their local schools know what their local schools' infrastructure needs are, and they know that local principals, local teachers and parents have seen yesterday's announcement and now want to start working it through. And of course, members of parliament who are in touch with their local communities can play a role in getting that information to school communities, and I would recommend to members of parliament in touch with their local communities that they visit the departmental website, my department's website, where in the building the, ed the education revolution section they will find <coughs> fact sheets to assist schools to work out how their school benefits from this program. And of course, the benefits of this program are enormous for local schools but so are the opportunities for supporting local jobs as people get about the construction and repair and maintenance activities that will be financed by this historic new investment in schools. And of course, the government is anxious to work with in-touch local members on this program, and we are anxious to work with those who want to assist with the rollout of the program. And in that regard, I would refer to the statement of the Premier of Western Australia, the Liberal Premier, uh, Mr Colin Barnett, who said, and I quote, the federal government's plan, that's our nation building and jobs plan, emphasises the areas of housing and education, two areas that I'm confident the Western Australian government can help to deliver. And then, of course, the uh, Liberal Treasurer in Western Australia, Mr Buswell, said, and I quote, that type of stimulus, whether it impacts on consumption expenditure or investment, is something that the state government welcomes. People who are clearly prepared to work with the federal government in delivering these new investments for Australian schools and, more broadly, through our nation building and jobs plan. Of course, there are then those members of parliament who are so out of touch with the needs of their local school communities that they are opposed to this $14.7 billion investment into schools to make sure that they are able to meet the needs of the 21st century and offer a world-class education. Now, the Leader of the Opposition earlier today was inviting members of parliament to imagine what would they would say looking into the eyes of school children as they talk to them about Australian politics and about matters that involve the Australian nation? In touch, members of parliament will be able to say that we are making an historic investment in their schools and their future. Out of touch, members of parliament from the Liberal Party who are voting against it presumably will say they were members of a government that used to have a program called Investing in Our Schools, which they brought to an end by way of prime ministerial press release on 19 February 2007. 
that they then contested an election in 2007 without promising one dollar more to that program. And then in his response today, his, uh, the Leader of the Opposition floated an idea that maybe $3 billion could be put into that program, but failed to explain that's an 80 per cent cut on what the Rudd Labor government is committed to, a nation building and jobs plan for every school in the country, as opposed to the Liberal Party investing in our schools program brought to an end by the then Prime Minister by way of media release on 19 February 2007. The member for Moncrief. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer the Prime Minister to reports which show 93 per cent of small businesses are under cash flow stress. Prime Minister, how does your government expect small business to take advantage of the increase announced yesterday in business investment allowance if 93 per cent of small businesses don't have the cash to invest? The Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the honourable member for his question. And the government uh, has been um, working its way through a range of options to try and assist the small business community across Australia who are bearing the brunt of this global economic crisis. Small business is extremely important. It generates employment of a large order of magnitude across the country. There are millions of small businesses. Each of our communities, each of our communities is well represented by the men and women of small business uh, who are out there putting often their houses on the line in support of their small businesses and generating jobs for themselves and incomes to support their families. These small business uh, men and women have not caused this crisis, not one bit. That's been caused by other factors which have been the subject of debate here and elsewhere. The practical question we face is how can we support those businesses? And what we have done so far is implement a range of measures which assist, do not remove or eliminate the impact of the global economic recession on them, but assist in reducing that impact. One of those measures has been derided uh, uh, almost universally by those opposite, and I refer there to the measures we've taken to support private consumption. Small business operators, as the honourable member will know from the Gold Coast, are very much concentrated, not exclusively, but concentrated in the retail sector. Therefore, when you provide direct stimulus to consumption, it flows through in large part to retail. The measures, the statistics referred to by the Treasurer before about what happened with the retail sales figures at the end of last year reflect therefore a direct flow through to small business operators. It is not the end of the story. It means that more measures must be taken. But we are acutely conscious of the fact that small business out there at the front arm of retail are bearing so much of the brunt of this impact, and therefore our direct support for consumption last year and this year is a direct relevance to them. Secondly, when it comes to the stability of the financial system and the ability of banks to provide credit at all, and I'll go to the question of the extent to which banks are properly providing credit to small business in a minute, the first and foremost responsibility of this government, and given the extraordinary events of last September and October, was to ensure the continued stability of the financial system, period. In this country, uh, our overwhelming focus has been on what we needed to do to make sure that Australia's main commercial banks remain viable into the future. If you look across the world and what has happened with the mainstream banks in other major Western economies as they have fallen like ninepins, 30 of them either collapsed or have had to be bailed out by governments. That is of fundamental and continuing concern to this government, hence the actions we took and which were in large part opposed by those opposite in the double guarantees that we provided both to depositors and to banks for interbank lending. Why have we provided uh, support for interbank lending? So that order the member for Moncrief on a point of order. Mr Speaker. Whilst this is a general meander through the government's response, the Order. fact is that my question was specific about the initiative announced yesterday. Order. The Prime Minister has been speaking for six minutes and is yet to address in any way the question Order. I asked. Prime Minister is responding to the question. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, and I'll come to the measure announced yesterday, which uh, relates to the accelerated investment allowance uh, once I've described the impact of supporting banks and their ability to provide credit, period. 
You see, the debate in this parliament about what we do on stimulus is important. It goes to the questions of government direct action supporting jobs and also government direct action in building necessary infrastructure in our schools and elsewhere. But in the overall global scheme of things, what happens with the normalisation of private credit markets is of fundamental importance. If we don't get that right globally, then stimulus can only do so much, even global stimulus, macroeconomic, <coughs> including both fiscal and monetary policy measures. It's getting global credit markets operating again, which uh, is so fundamental to allowing credit to flow again at reasonable price to small business borrowers as well. That is why we are so actively engaged in the whole uh, the whole exercise of ensuring the continued stability of our major banks and our overall financial system. Also what has been criticised by those opposite is our direct engagement in a measure with the banks uh, to support the uh, private commercial property market. Those opposite need to reflect on this. In the event of the withdrawal of foreign participation in the syndication associated with the commercial property markets, as the Leader of the Opposition audibly groans, what you are effectively signing up to by opposing that is to allow the collapse in asset values of so many of the major companies of this country who have substantial investments in the commercial property sector. That sector alone employs some 150,000 people, and the number of small business contractors directly affected by any such collapse in their asset values, over which, over which the member for merchant banking, otherwise called the Leader of the Opposition, uh, seems to be completely oblivious and disregarding of. On the measure that we announced yesterday, which goes to, which goes to the investment allowance, we have, specifically, we have specifically embraced measures to reduce uh, the uh, overall threshold of that which uh, small business can apply uh, for uh, their, uh, their uh, handling through the measure that we have uh, embraced before the threshold was 10,000. Now it's been reduced to 1,000. We have also increased the actual amount uh, from 10 per cent to 30 per cent. We are acutely mindful of the decisions which small businesses have, must make. On the supply of credit and the cost of credit to small businesses, as I also said yesterday, we will remain heavily engaged with the banking sector to do whatever we physically can to support the proper flow of private credit to small businesses as they need it. Mr. Speaker, small business, together with other sectors of the economy, are critical and represent a critical focus of what the government seeks to do. We are engaged in a grave debate in this parliament about how Australia should respond to this global economic crisis. And what stuns me about the debate today and the position taken by the Leader of the Liberal Party is that the Liberals, demonstrating how much they have lost touch with the Australian community and economy, are now threatening in the Senate to block, what, block tax bonuses to 8.7 million Australians to block the biggest single, the biggest single building program across Australia's 7,500 primary schools, and frankly, they should reconsider Order. their position. Order. Has the, oh, has the Prime Minister concluded? The member for Capricornia. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Housing and the Status of Women. What has been the response to new investment in social housing in yesterday's Nation Building and Jobs Plan? Minister, what positive effects will this have on keeping construction workers in Capricornia employed after the recent layoffs in the mining industry? The Minister for Housing and the Status of Women. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Capricornia. I know that she has been very concerned about recent job losses in the mining sector and is very concerned to keep construction strong in Capricornia. Mr Speaker, the Nation Building and Jobs Plan released yesterday includes an historic investment in social housing, which will have benefits right across the nation, in areas like hers, in regional centres, in rural and remote areas, in suburbs and cities, right across this nation. We'll be building 20,000 new homes and uh, renovating another 2,500 run-down homes to make them livable again. Mr Speaker, this is the largest single investment in social housing ever made by an Australian government. The package will help us meet our targets on homelessness and provide affordable housing for low-income Australians who are struggling in the private rental market. We've had, uh, unremarkably, I suppose, very strong in endorsements from the community and welfare sector. 
The Council to Homeless Persons has said this is great news for the more than 100,000 Australians who are homeless. The Brotherhood of St Lawrence has said we haven't seen this kind of government investment in social housing for decades. Not only will it bring lasting benefit in terms of protecting construction jobs, but it will also boost the stock of affordable housing for disadvantaged Australians now and into the future. ACOS have said we are delighted that social housing has been given a much needed boost. But Mr Speaker, it's also the fact that this package makes great economic sense. It will support jobs in the housing and construction industry. The Housing Industry Association says the spot purchase of private sector new dwellings will provide a rapid and necessary boost to economic activity. It will activate the commencement of many approved private sector dwellings that have stalled due to a lack of working capital. The Property Council of Australia says Every dollar that goes into construction has a multiplier effect. It is spent three times over in the economy. This makes for an ideal measure of a well-thought-out stimulus package. The Residential Development Council. In committing this money to the sector, the government is ensuring projects that are already in the development pipeline are built and, more importantly, that new projects get off the ground, which is difficult in the current market. Mr Speaker, this measure is right for our economy. It's right for building our nation in the long term. The opposition's decision to block these measures will be a blow to the many low-income Australians who are struggling to put a roof over their heads. And it will be a blow to the construction sector, to all those tradies, small businesses, building supply companies that are struggling to keep their heads above water and struggling to keep their apprentices employed. The responsible thing to do, the compassionate thing to do, is to pass these measures now. The member for Cook. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Housing and the Status of Women. Given that the government has already brought forward more than $1.8 billion in projects for homelessness and affordable housing, I might add, supported by the opposition. Can the minister explain why committing order. the taxpayer? Order, order. The member for Cook has the call. Talking about your existing programs, the Albert. member for Cook Keep will up. ignore the interjections. The interjections will cease. I'll start again, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Can, given the government has, the has already brought forward more than $1.8 billion in projects for homelessness and affordable housing, which the opposition has already supported. Can the minister explain why committing the taxpayer to additional $6 billion in debt for public housing is a more effective use of taxpayers' funds than providing support to boost construction for private housing, which represents 97 per cent of residential construction? The Minister for Housing. Order. The member for Banks. Unbelievable. Minister for Housing has the call. Um, Mr Speaker, I guess there's a few things that you can take from that question. The first thing you can take from that question is that the $3 billion cut by the previous Howard government from social housing is their continuing policy. That's that right. the, the fact, Mr Speaker, is that if funding had continued on the trajectory that it had been on under the previous Labor government, we would have 90,000 extra public housing homes in this country today. We've got 100,000 homeless Australians on any given night. 100,000 homeless Australians. If we had continued on the previous trajectory, 90,000 extra for public housing dwellings. That doesn't matter. We'll put that to one side. That doesn't matter. Um, Mr Speaker, uh, the honourable member has asked why we wouldn't spend extra money building private housing. He may have missed the fact that we have set aside $623 million for a national rental affordability scheme. He may Order. have missed the fact that we have set aside $1.5 billion for a first home owner's boost, of increasing the first home owner's grant to $14,000 for existing properties, 
$21,000 for newly built properties. And what do people in the development uh, and construction sectors tell me? They tell me that they are relying, relying on these first home buyers who are walking in off the street with the confidence to buy for the first time in many years because uh, interest rates are low and the first home owners oh, boost is giving them confidence. They are relying on those first home buyers to keep themselves working. Order. The minister will resume her seat. The member for Cook on a point of Mr. order. Mr. Speaker, on relevance, my question was why was it better to spend it in public than on order. private housing? The member why for is it better Cook will resume there? his seat. The member for Cook, order. The minister is responding to the question, Minister. And Mr. Speaker, I'll conclude by saying it is ironic in the extreme that a party that ignored housing policy for over a decade, that presided over a growth in our homeless population at a time of economic prosperity, should raise this issue in this way. The member for Parramatta. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for the Environment, Heritage and the Arts. Will the minister update the House on support for the new Energy Efficient Homes program as part of the government's nation building and jobs plan? The Minister for Environment, Heritage and the Arts. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank uh, the member for Parramatta for her question. I know that she takes a keen and acute interest uh, in these policy uh, matters that we are bringing forward for people in her electorate. Uh, as the House would be aware, as part of the government's Nation Building Jobs Plan, we've committed $3.9 billion for the Energy Efficient Homes Program that will roll out energy efficiency to Australian suburbs on an unprecedented scale and provide immediate support for green jobs, drive demand in clean and green industries through insulation and hot water. And critically, Mr Speaker, the Energy Efficient Home Programs will also help relieve cost of living pressures for nearly $3 million Australian homes because it will reduce people's energy bills for years and years to come. And there will be significant savings of some 49 million tonnes, equivalent CO2 by 2020, akin to taking some 1 million cars off the road. And I'm asked what support there is for the energy efficiency home programs. I'm pleased to say that the re response has been overwhelmingly positive. And let me read, Mr Speaker, from one ins insulation fitter on ABC Radio yesterday who said, and I quote, our own company had to lay off a shift in one of our plants just before Christmas. We'll be putting that shift back on. That's exactly what the Energy Efficient Home Program is about. This is what the Clean Energy Council had to say about the package. I'm happy to read that quote. Insulation saves energy, money, jobs and the environment, so it's a win-win-win. These sort of packages help every Australian by cushioning the cost of transition to a carbon-constrained economy. That's exactly what the Energy Efficient Homes Program is about. And here from the Master Builders of Australia, and I quote, this initiative will help support much-needed jobs in the building industry, while at the same time assist in reducing Australia's greenhouse gas emissions and saving energy costs. And it went on to say, boosting the building industry is a proven formula for reviving economies and stimulating jobs growth and this recognition from the Climate Institute. There's no question that insulation and solar hot water are at the top of the list in improving the energy wastage and carbon pollution from our Australian homes. And, Mr Speaker, so these statements of support from the government's announcement yesterday goes on. And this is exactly what the Energy Efficient Home Programs is all about, and it's exactly what these positive responses show. This is the right package to put out at the right time. And, Mr Speaker, these programs are already open for business. Order. Action on an unprecedented scale, insulation to around 2.7 million Australian households, including half a million rental homes, and by increasing the solar hot water rebate from $1,000 to $1,600 and removing the means test, we're harnessing Australia's abundant, abundant sunshine for a true solar revolution in Australia's suburbs. And Mr Speaker, we heard another endorsement today, not from a third party, but as it turned out, from the party opposite. And this is in fact what the Leader of the Opposition has said about the government's rollout of insulation. And I quote it, we welcome the government paying attention to insulation, end quote. We then got some overblown criticism, ignoring the fact that the Liberals did nothing for some 12 years, before he went on to say, and I quote, 
The $1,600 subsidy will dot, 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 mean that over 90 per cent of jobs will be completed at no cost to the owner. Well, I would suggest to the Leader of the Opposition that's exactly the point. The $1,600 subsidy that the Rudd government will provide for sealing insulation means that over 90 per cent of jobs will be completed at no cost to the owner. That's the point of this particular measure. But he went on to say the subsidy is not means tested. We would support an insulation subsidy of a lower amount. And I would suggest for the government's consideration, one that is, for example, $500 for all houses, increasing to $1,000 subject to a means test. A similar approach could be taken to solar hot water. Well, Mr Speaker, that's quite incredible. And what must the member for Flinders be thinking? After spending most of last year, after spending most Order. of last year asserting the great injustice Order. of a means test on the $8,000 rebate for solar PV, a rebate that continues to run at record levels, despite the member jumping out of an aeroplane saying that was in free fall, <laughs> we now have the leader of the opposition trying to means test a package that is all about value for money, delivering energy efficiency savings for Australians, nearly three million households on an unprecedented level and driving the demand for green jobs. Mr Speaker, the opposition has lost the plot. It's time they supported this bill. The member for Dixon. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, nice to be back. Thank you. Uh, my speaker, uh, my, Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Ageing. I refer the Minister to reports that not-for-profit aged care providers are refusing to take up placements for high care residents. Minister, with a crisis in aged care, why was not one cent of the government's spending package allocated to help older Australians in need of high care? The Minister for Ageing. Minister. Thanks, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for his question. Can I point out to him that this government has, in fact, um, record funding when it comes to aged care, $41 billion over the next four years? And that's in uh, comparison to 12 years of neglect by the previous yeah. government. That's right. But you know what we're always hearing from, uh, from this side, Mr Speaker? They're always talking down the aged care sector. That's what they're always doing. They're always, you're always talking them down. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the honourable member Order. referred to the honourable member referred to the uh, the latest aged care approvals round, in which we had very, very healthy and competitive numbers of people applying for those places right throughout the country. Indeed, when it came to uh, high care, we had a huge amount. When it came to community Order. care, we had a ten to one. Over subscription. What it shows is there's a huge interest out there from providers when it comes to applying for those particular places. <coughs> Order. The member for Dixon has asked his question. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the uh, I thank the member for pointing out the issue of the aged care approvals round because I'd also like to um, to give some information to the House and that is the uh, latest allocation of capital grants for aged care in the 2008-09 ACAR creating new aged care places and indeed can I say that there is 44.5 million dollars in capital grants towards residential aged care facilities in this year's aged care approvals round. Order. So I thank the member for pointing out the latest round of ACAR in which we had a major oversubscription, in which we're seeing major capital grants to our aged care providers right throughout the country. And Mr Speaker, as I said at the beginning, this government is committed to providing aged care services for our older Australians. Order. Twelve years in the neglect we had from them, Order. and what we're Remember doing, record Gooley. funding, $41 billion over the next four years. Order. We're doing that to provide services to our older Australians when they need and deserve them right throughout this country. The member for Longman. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Families, Housing, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs, and I ask, Minister, how is the government supporting older Australians during these challenging times? The Minister for Family, Housing, Community Services and Indigenous Australians. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And, uh, I thank the member for Longman, who, do, who certainly does understand that older Australians who have worked very hard all of their lives 
are certainly feeling the pressure of the global financial crisis. It is the case, Mr Speaker, that older Australians are amongst the millions who will benefit from the government's $42 billion nation building and jobs plan. Those uh, self-funded retirees who paid tax in 2007-08 as a result of their investments or other incomes will uh, receive the $950 tax bonus. And part pensioners who paid uh, even $1 in tax last financial year will also receive the $950 tax bonus. So that means around 290,000 older Australians, self-funded retirees and part pensioners can expect to benefit. This, uh, of course, uh, Mr Speaker, is on top of the benefits uh, that were paid to both pensioners and self-funded retirees uh, back in December. Those economic security strategy payments went to four out of five of the 2.8 million Australians aged over 65, both pensioners and self-funded retirees. Of course, very importantly, uh, many pensioners who are suffering in the private rental market will benefit from uh, the government's $6.4 billion investment in social housing. Many, many, of the, uh, uh, pen many pensioners in the private rental market are under severe housing stress, and we certainly hope that some of them will be able to benefit from the 20,000 extra homes that will be built. This support, uh, of course, builds on many other initiatives that the government put in place last year for older Australians. And I think these figures are very important for everybody to be aware of. In total, and this is excluding the normal indexation that pensioners uh, receive, the government has provided an additional $2,337 of assistance to single pensioners and $3,537 to pensioner couples, all that in the year since we came into office. We have certainly also committed to delivering long-term pension reform, and this has been recognised uh, by the uh, National Seniors Chief Executive Officer Michael O'Neill, who said yesterday, and I quote him, I think uh, the relief has come already and there will be a further lot of relief with the reform in May in the budget. Well, Mr Speaker, unfortunately for older Australians, there's only one thing standing in the way of them benefiting from this uh, nation building and jobs plan, and that, of course, is the opposition. It's the opposition that's going to prevent self-funded retirees and part pensioners getting the tax bonus uh, it, that uh, we have proposed. He also seems to want to stop those pensioners who are under severe financial stress in the private rental market from getting the, uh, from getting the help that they need. It demonstrates just how out of touch this Leader of the Opposition and the Liberal Party are. They have no intention of making sure that older Australians get the help that they need. The member for Dunkley. Thanks, Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Does the Prime Minister accept that his failure to get the National Broadband Network project underway, the government's single biggest infrastructure election promise, has deprived the Australian economy of a significant economic stimulus. The Prime Minister. <clears throat> Mr Speaker, uh, the question uh, just asked uh, by the member for Dunkley reminds me of all other questions posed today by those opposite on the question of national economic infrastructure. And, and it begs one fundamental question. What did you do for 12 years? What did you do on broadband for 12 years? What did you do on building our schools for 12 years? What did you do on building our hospitals for 12 years? What did you do when the investment in our universities went backwards rather than forwards? What did you do to make sure that our research infrastructure was in fact world class? Answer to the above. Nothing, nothing, next to nothing, nothing and nothing. That's the answer to each of those questions. And as the member for Dunkley works his way back to the dispatch box. The member for 
Dunkley on a point of order. Um, thank you. As a matter of relevance, we're wondering how the NBN stimulus is going. That was the order. question, Prime Minister. The member will resume his seat. Prime Minister will respond to the question. Prime um, Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, on the question of, uh, of infrastructure, including broadband infrastructure, uh, the government will stand by each and every one of its pre-election commitments. Uh, these are vital for the nation for the 21st Order. century, because, um, because our vision for the nation is to ensure that we have 21st century infrastructure. This government stands for nation building. Those opposites stand for sitting on their hands. That's the alternative. And again, I say to those opposite, including to the leader of the Liberal Party, the Liberal Party, by its decision today, demonstrates how out of touch it has come with all Australians and the needs of the Australian economy and Australian families by now threatening to block this nation-building plan in the Senate. So out of touch have they become that they have no mind whatsoever as to who will pay the price of this global economic recession. I tell you who won't be paying the price will be the merchant bankers. Order. Who will be paying the price will be those who are out there depending on this government to act in Stewart. order to fill the gap left by the withdrawal of private sector activity by assisting with the measures that we've announced. Those who will benefit from the package the government has put forward, we have already uh, underlined through the statements the government has made yesterday. But those who will pay the price for this action taken by the Leader of the Liberal Party today are the mums and dads who are facing every day the challenges of paying back to school costs, those out there who Order. are waiting for decent primary school facilities, and Order. those out there Order. who expect their governments to act and not just Order. to wave the through Minister, the recession onto their shoulders. Has the Prime Minister concluded? The member for Bass. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Small Business, Independent Contractors and the Service Economy. Will the Minister advise the House of the response to the government's nation building and jobs plan, in particular to the initiatives that will benefit small business? The Minister for Small Business, Independent Contractors and the Service Economy. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And could I thank the member for Bass for her question and for ongoing support for the Business Enterprise Centre in Launceston and the small business community uh, more generally. I can advise the House, uh, Mr. Speaker, that the response of the small business community to the plan announced yesterday has been extremely positive. Extremely positive. Indeed, the uh, Council of Small Business of Australia described the plan as a confidence boost for small business that will provide benefit to many small businesses and to the communities in which they live and operate. We have heard from the uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry of Western Australia. What do they say? They describe it as a timely shot in the arm for small business. It says that the $2.7 billion tax bonus that has been criticised by the Coalition uh, is an important and timely investment in the lifeblood of the Australian economy, small business. The New South Wales Business Chamber has said that this is a shot in the arm for the New South Wales economy. It says New South Wales businesses will particularly welcome the $2.7 billion package of tax breaks for business. Okay, what do we hear from the master builders of Australia? They have said the building industry is predominantly made up of small businesses, which should benefit from the government's 2.7 billion small business and general tax break. The point they're making, the point they're making is this is a plan for tradies. This is a plan for the tradespeople of Australia, as the Prime Minister pointed out during question time and again this morning. What have you got against the contractors and the tradespeople of Australia? You're supposed to be supporting small business, the tradies and the contractors, but you're opposing each and every one of these measures. The National Farmers Federation, what have they had to say? They say in support of the, of the package, further, the $2.7 billion tax break for small business will be greatly appreciated by those small family-owned farms. Well, it would be appreciated if we could get it through the parliament. And then the Restaurant and Catering Association has said the small business tax break may just be what our small businesses need to convince them to buy that new piece of equipment in the market. There you go, the member for Con there you go, the member for Moncrief. 
And it says, very importantly on this question of spending, consumers now spend nearly 10 per cent of their household income on meals out on average, and these additional payments, which will come just prior to the next school holidays, of course, if we could get them through the parliament, will be spent in restaurants and cafes. So there's the Restaurant and Catering Association. Now, the fact is, the only critics of this plan, the only critics of this plan, are members of the opposition. The criticism led last night by the former treasurer, the member for Higgins, who formally began his campaign for the leadership yesterday and last night. And I'll bet we have the member for the opposition who's always taking an each way bet. A bob each way. Well, I'll bet there's a very big chance, and I'll back it on the nose, that the that member for Higgins, the former treasurer, will oh, be the leader be. of the opposition. Minister, resume your seat. But... Minister, resume your seat. <laughs> the member for Canning on a point of order. Realistically, Mr. Speaker, how can this rant be relevant to the question asked? Order. The minister will respond to the question. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I'm responding to the decision of the opposition to oppose this package. The temporary opposition leader is condemning the Australian people to more hardship, to more job losses, more people losing their homes and more people losing their businesses. He is completely out of touch with the needs of the Australian people. He is completely out of touch with the needs of small business. And I call on the opposition leader to put aside your personal short-term political interests, small, support the small business community of Australia, support the Order. Australian people and support the Australian national interest and pass this package. The member for in, in, the member for Goldstein. Thank you, thank you Mr Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. I refer the Prime Minister to the repeated statements in the months leading into the last election that Labor had a plan for major infrastructure. Prime Minister, after well over a year in office, well over a year in office and two so-called stimulus packages totalling $50 billion, why have there been no major new infrastructure projects announced to date? The Prime Minister. Um, order. Order. They, uh, Mr. Speaker. Order. The Prime Minister has the call. They really are a bunch of buttes, aren't they? On, on infrastructure. Twelve years, nothing. One year, fix the lot. Okay. That's terrific. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. One year, fix the lot. Trains order, out across order. the country. Member for There's Goldstein a few things asked called question. the odd tendering process. The There's a few things Prime called Minister that will that resume his seat. Prime, Prime Minister. Prime Minister. Prime Minister. Order. No. The member for O'Connor on a point of order. Can I draw your attention to the obligation of speakers, be they at the dispatch box or otherwise, to not only address you through the chair, but not to turn their back upon you order. so they the can play for some O'Connor. computer. The member TV for O'Connor will resume his seat. The Prime Minister will address his remarks through the chair. The Prime Minister. Well, Prime on, the Minister. Question, on the question of infrastructure, let us all um, bring close to mind the absolute debacle in the Senate last year when those opposites sought to vote on the nation building That's legislation. Right. Do you remember that? Do you remember that? And I, nice, and, uh, I noticed the uh, honourable member who's just interjected, um, from the great state of West Australia. I thought that after 12 years of um, umpteen studies by those opposite about partnering with the West Australian government on the future development of the ORD, this government uniquely has now said to the government of Western Australia, the Liberal government of Western Australia, we're going to be partners with you in that development. And that's why I went up to Kununurra with the Liberal Premier of Western Australia, because we're going to get on with the business of developing the Great North West, as opposed to those who twiddle their thumbs for year on year on year. Furthermore, I'd say to the member for Goldstein, in answer to his question, on two occasions last year we advanced uh, two blocks of half a billion dollars to the universities of Australia to advance much needed capital works. That work is now underway Order. through planning processes and the rollout of project work. 
We have done the same in the stimulus package last year, a half a billion dollars released also to the TAFE sector of the country to do the same. I would suggest to the member for Goldstein that he also pays attention to the other contents of the $4.6 billion Nation Building One program that we released last December, including the massive investment in the Australian Rail Freight Corporation and what will happen to the Australian Rail Freight Network across the country. These are decisions which are already been taken, and we support each one of them. Has the Prime Minister concluded? I think I should be charitable and let that just ride. The member for Flynn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Will the Minister update the House on the reaction to the government's nation building and jobs plan, including the farmers' hardship payment? The Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Flynn for, for the question, uh, a member who is well in touch with the farmers in his electorate. It is critical that the government invests in long-term nation-building projects in rural and regional Australia in order to support jobs and boost long-term growth. We referred yesterday to the reaction from the NFF as one of the first farmers' organisations to explain their view of how this would affect farmers in need, where they said the government's $950 tax-free bonus for all drought-affected farmers reaching some 21,500 farmers in need will be a much-needed fillip to families and regional economies. But the most extraordinary thing has not been the reaction, the positive reaction from the farmers. The most extraordinary thing has been the reaction from some of the people within this chamber. Because while the member for Flynn understands that there's 550 farming families in need who will receive the $950 payment, I think people were astonished when the member for Wide Bay decided to announce that the more than 130 farming families who would receive the $950 payment in his electorate were going to be told that he would come in here and vote against the $950 payment for those 130 farming families in his electorate. But maybe it's because he didn't consult fully with the other members of the National Party and Liberal Party in this chamber, who have many more than 130 families who receive the benefit, but have now been committed to come into this chamber and vote against them receiving that benefit. I mean, did he consult with the member for Parks, who will have more than 800 farming families in his electorate, who he's going to walk in here and vote that they don't get the $950? Did he consult with the member for Murray, who has more than 1,900 farming families in her electorate who Order. will come in here and vote against it. Did he think for a moment about the electorate of Mallee and the extraordinary challenges, the extraordinary challenges that are happening in areas like Mildura, where there are more than 2,150 farming families who will receive the $950 payment and yet he will vote against. But the members for Flynn, the members for Blair, the members for Eden Monero, for Wakefield, for Ballarat, for Bendigo and Karengamite will come in here and defend the farming families in their electorates. Did we think about the member for Gippsland who campaigned, who campaigned during his by-election that he would support the upgrade of the Mafra Secondary College? And yet, and yet, when money is going to come forward to help fund, to help fund the up and upgrade at Mathra Secondary College, that he's been committed now to come in here and vote against it. Order. Or maybe, Order. Or maybe, Those maybe the member right. for Gippsland, maybe the member for Gippsland ought to have a look over his shoulder at someone who was elected on the by-election in another part of Australia on the same day, because the member for Lyon campaigned. He campaigned vigorously for the upgrade of Loriton Primary School, and he'll be able to come in here and defend his local primary school and vote in favour of it. Order. Mr. Speaker, Order. there are three political parties in this room. 
the political Order. party in this room Order. that represents the fewest country seats is without surprise the National Party. Yeah. Mr Speaker, there is a reason for that. Yeah. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, on that note, and Hockey Joe having had a bit of trouble rustling up a few more questions, we ask that further Order. questions be placed on the notice paper. Order. 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 The House will come to order. The House will come to order. Order the Leader of the House. The member for Barker again. Order. I present the Auditor General's Performance Audit Report number 19 of 2008 2009 entitled CMAX Communication Contract for the 2020 Summit, Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Leader of the House. I move that the report be made a parliamentary paper. Order. The question is that the report be made a parliamentary paper. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, documents are tabled in accordance with the list circulated to honourable members earlier today. I move that the House take note of documents numbers two and six. Full details of the documents will be recorded in the votes and proceedings and Hansard. Order the debate must be adjourned. The member for North Sydney. I move that the debate be now adjourned. Order. The question is that the debate be adjourned. The adjourned debate be made in order of the day for the next day of sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. If the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order. I have received a letter from the Honourable Member for North Sydney proposing that a definite matter of public importance be submitted to the House for discussion, namely the government's determination to drive the budget into a structural deficit and long-term debt. I call upon those members who approve of the proposed discussion to rise in their places. The Member for North Sydney. Thank you very uh, much, Mr Speaker. And I note the Prime Minister extended the length of question time just then. Uh, in order to avoid further scrutiny over the next few days about the details of his package. And the interesting thing is, Mr Speaker, is that we had at least another 30 questions that people were prepared to ask on the details of a package, the bills which we received today. The bills which we received today. Today, $42 billion of ask of the Australian people and the Labor Party scurrying out of the chamber deliver them to us today. So isn't it interesting, Mr Deputy Speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the bill that is most alarming is not the appropriation bills, even though we are going to vote against them. It is a Commonwealth inscribed stock amendment bill, 2009. The bill, which itself is less than one page, one page, but that one page is perhaps the most deadly page to the Australian economy and to future generations of Australians in economic terms that we ever seen, because that one page says that this Commonwealth government can increase the size of its credit card from $75 billion to $200 billion. I didn't hear that in the Prime Minister's speech yesterday. I didn't hear it in the press conference. I didn't get any early warning about this, but the Minister for Finance introduced this bill this morning to increase the credit card limit of the Commonwealth from $75 billion to $200 billion. And you know what? Take it or leave it, they say. Take it or leave it. You have to pass this bill. This bill must be passed not only by the House of Representatives today, even if, as now is scheduled, the House of Representatives will at least sit until 10.30 tomorrow morning. Because I say to you, Madam Deputy Speaker, every one of my colleagues is going to get the right to have a say. Yeah. And I tell you what, Madam Deputy Speaker, one further thing. Uh, the government can threaten the gag at 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock in the morning, as they've said they're going to do, but we are standing on a matter of principle. And it comes down to this one-page bill, 
which says that the Australian government is prepared to borrow up to $200 billion and wants 24-hour approval of this parliament without detailed explanation for that massive borrowing binge. Why $200 billion? Why $200 billion? That is the first time we have seen a figure of that scale anywhere in the papers, even in this uh, UEFA updated economic and fiscal outlook, copies of which not all members of parliament were able to receive because it wasn't widely circulated yesterday. Uh, the interesting thing is it doesn't say anything in here about borrowing $200 billion, but the legislation does. The legislation that we have to pass today, that the Senate has to pass tomorrow, says borrow $200 billion. Now, if the government is expecting that there's going to be a default associated with any of its guarantees, for financial institutions it should say so. I have no reason to believe that that is the case. If the government believes that there is going to be some other defaults that will require it to provide emergency funding, either to corporates or financial institutions, then they should advise us. And if not publicly, they should privately advise us. Absolutely. Or if they believe, as I suspect is the case, that state governments will continue to have problems raising money in financial markets and that indeed the Commonwealth needs to start uh, issuing bonds to raise money to pay for the states, then they should come clean with the Australian people and certainly they should tell us. But why on earth, out of today, question one from the Leader of the Opposition to the Prime Minister, why on earth does this government need to increase the credit card limit of Australia to $200 billion from $75 billion today? And the $75 billion today isn't even issued. The $75 billion today, even if we are in the debt markets, which we are, and the reason why, even though the previous coalition government had paid off government debt, the reason why we stayed in those debt markets was to keep some liquidity in the markets, to add to the liquidity and to have a yield curve that would provide some guidance and stability in the markets. That's why we still issued bonds. The interesting thing is we didn't have $75 billion on issue. And we certainly don't understand why this government wants to have a borrowing capacity of $200 billion. You know, the interesting thing is, Madam Deputy Speaker, when you look at, historically, the underlying cash balance of the Commonwealth, and naturally enough, the government issues bonds to pay for its deficits. Uh, if, as a percentage of GDP, you would say to yourself, well, uh, of course, there were various times when it exceeded the levels that are in the projections contained in UEFO, that in fact the Commonwealth has from time to time, particularly under the Whitlam government, gone to you know, three and a half, four per cent of GDP. In fact, uh, the, the largest one uh, on scant reading was 1992-93 under Paul Keating, where we went to 4.1 per cent of GDP uh, as a, a deficit. But in the main economic parameters revealed in the updated economic and fiscal outlook, you can see, Madam Deputy Speaker, the government says that in 2009-10 its forecast is uh, for three quarters of one per cent growth in GDP, and then it's going to go to three per cent the following year and three per cent the year after. Well, I'll tell you what, you want to strap in in 2009-2010 for the joyous ride of a massive acceleration in GDP growth, and you know what? The government is going to have a significant deficit not just in 2010 but 2011 as well, which is completely at odds, as the Shadow Treasurer said, completely at odds with their so-called plan 
to put the budget back into surplus when the economy gets to its average growth rates. And you know what the interesting thing is, Madam Deputy Speaker? These figures are ambitious. These figures, particularly projected revenue, is ambitious. And on the scant information that I've been able to obtain, including the 45-minute briefing from the lead, for the Leader of the Opposition and the Shadow Treasurer from the Treasury, and I might even say they weren't even the top officials at Treasury, they could not give us the answers about the questions to the questions that we were asking. For example, a $50 billion drop in, uh, in corporate taxes over the next few years. What is the assumption about the profitability of corporates over the next few years? You know what it is? They couldn't give us the answer, but you know what it is, Madam Deputy Speaker? The government's projections assume that corporates in Australia over the next few years are going to be, on average, more profitable, more profitable than they have been over the term average of Australian economic history. So they're saying corporates are going to continue to have <coughs> above average profits while the Australian economy drops, while unemployment goes to 7 per cent, while the terms of trade collapse, and yet they're projecting in their revenue estimates that you know, corporate tax, which is probably the most volatile of the taxes, I think the Minister of Finance would agree in terms of estimated revenue, is going to be above average. <coughs> Go figure. Go figure. And you know what? Every dollar that is spent today, under the scenarios that all the economists and the global experts are saying, every dollar spent today may well have a value of $1.50 at a later date. If it's well spent, if it's targeted, it will provide the stimulus to create real and sustainable jobs when there is confidence. And when you see economic projections such as these, which are ambitious, if not extremely optimistic. You say to yourself, these guys are not being fair income with the Australian people. And yet they come into this place and they say to us, approve a credit card limit of $200 billion. Approve immediately the biggest fiscal stimulus in, in, in memory. Of $42 billion. Approve it now without question, without demur. And by the way, and by the way, we're telling you the whole story. Well, they're not telling us the whole story. No way. Not the whole story. I want them to come clean about the current account deficit. Yep. Their fears about the current account deficit. Yeah. I want them to tell the truth about the great risk that the uh, overseas purchases of all of our minerals and energy are going to default on their contracts. I want them to be fair income with the Australian people. After the Prime Minister said last year that he rang, he rang up the President of China and got an assurance that China would continue to buy all of our minerals and energy, and they, they gave him an assurance that they would honour the contracts. They didn't deliver on those words if they were, in fact, the words provided by the President of China. So you know what happens, Madam Deputy Speaker? Australia faces this unenviable position where the government is being overly optimistic with its projections. It's not being fair income about the risks, but it's asking us to sign off on the biggest spending initiative in Australian history. I'll go one step further. As the intergenerational report stated at various times, at the various volumes of the intergenerational report, there is a danger of a structural deficit for Australia. That structural deficit, by the initiatives of this government, has just got a whole lot worse. And it's hard yards to get it back into surplus. The reason why it cuts to our core to see a new government come in and spend money flippantly. The reason why it does is because we know what you have to do to get back into surplus. It is hard yards. And there are thousands of economists out there that will say to you, spend, spend, spend under these circumstances. But it will be those same economists 
in 10 years' time that will say cut Medicare in half, take $50 to $100 off the pension, abolish the family tax benefit, uh, cut the defence budget, all the things that will really hurt the fabric of the Australian nation. Those economists will argue for in good times, and you know what? They shouldn't be listened to in those good times, just as sure as they should not always be the Bible during bad times. And when we start citing economists, I look at Ross Gittins last year, who said we should dump the government, should dump the Costello tax cuts. I look at Access Economics, who said, Chris Richardson said, we should dump, the government should dump the tax cuts because at the end of 2008 they would be awash in so much money they wouldn't know what to do with it. I reflect on the fact that the Prime Minister said that Australia was going too fast at the beginning of last year, that the inflation genie was out of the bottle. Uh, and uh, I well remember the Treasurer referring to the inflation monster. And at that time, the then Leader of the Opposition, the member for Bradfield, the then Shadow Treasurer, the member for Wentworth, myself, were all saying, guys, Look at what's happening to credit markets overseas. Look at what's happening. There has been a complete meltdown in confidence in credit markets, not just in the United States but around the world. The tsunami will hit Australia, and at that time the Prime Minister was urging Australians to rush down to the beach to have a look. What a mistake that was. A dramatic mistake. 180 degrees wrong. And then the Prime Minister talks up the panic. It's going to be bad, really bad, he said on the 12th of October. Well, if there was any confidence left amongst Australian consumers, it was wiped out by the Prime Minister's words on that weekend. It's going to be bad, really bad. You know what? You can put $100 into the hands of someone, but if they think for one second that they might not have a job in 12 months' time, that they not, might not be able to feed their kids, that they might not be able to pay the rent, they'll be holding on to that $100 because they might need it in a rainy day. And when the Prime Minister says there's graphic storms on the horizon, they'll hold it back. We say the Labor Party is the party of debt and deficit. That's, right. That's what they are. That's why today we will not support them with their initiative because it's bad policy with bad consequences, particularly for our children. I call the Minister for Finance and Deregulation. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Today, the Liberal Party and the National Party have taken the astonishing decision to try and run the country from opposition in the middle of a national economic emergency. The government is responding by seeking to stimulate the Australian economy in response to the enormous negative forces that are bearing down on our economy. And the opposition is determined to block the path to recovery, to block the path to defending jobs and to in thereby increase the job losses and economic pain that will flow as a result of this global financial and economic crisis. It's interesting that the member for North Sydney has presented the opposition's case today. Yesterday we had the Leader of the Opposition. The question that many of us will ask is, where is the member for Curtin? Where is the Deputy Leader of the Opposition and the Shadow Treasurer in what is going to be one of the biggest and most important economic debates in this parliament in recent times? No sign of the Shadow Treasurer. We have the member for North Sydney auditioning for the position and uh, doing a very florid job, I'd have to say, but a little bit light on content, and also making the extraordinary assertion at the commencement of his remarks that the government allowed question time to extend further than usual in order to avoid scrutiny. We are under the impression that question time is actually about scrutiny, and the opposition certainly on many occasions has asserted that. The government, in pursuing its response to the global financial economic crisis, Madam Deputy Speaker, is following the advice of the International Monetary Fund, is doing what governments in many other parts of the world are doing. The Liberals are off on their own little planet, in their own little world, fighting dead ideological battles of 20 and 30 years ago. They have lost touch with the, with the reality of what is occurring in the world, what is occurring in the ordinary homes and the businesses and the workplaces around this country. 
The package the government's put forward has had a great deal of thought, a great deal of consideration and a great deal of analysis go into it, and naturally extensive advice from Treasury and from the other central agencies. We have sought to achieve a critical balance between short-term stimulus, getting money flowing in the economy, and long-term nation building, long-term building of productive infrastructure, productive economic capacity and community infrastructure that will benefit our children. And the balance that we pursued is roughly about 30, 70 or thereabouts, about 30 per cent on short-term tax bonuses and payments, and around 70 per cent or so that goes on longer-term infrastructure. Much of it flowing very quickly, much of it in smaller or localised infrastructure, much of it will unfold in the next year or two. I've outlined to the House before, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the argument about whether payments are being spent or saved is largely fallacious, because the bulk of the payments that may be saved today, because money is interchangeable, will in effect be reflected by increased spending next week, the week after, next month and in the ensuing months thereafter. Some of it will be long-term saved, but I would suggest not much, and the retail sales figures today show that the outcome of the stimulus package put forward by the government in December has been to overwhelmingly to stimulate spending, to stimulate economic activity, to stimulate the retail sector, sector and most importantly to support jobs. Most importantly to su support jobs. The long-term benefit which will flow from the government's package is that we will rebuild the primary school infrastructure of this nation, long overdue. We will further enhance the secondary school infrastructure of the nation. We will add substantially to the social housing stock and indeed 800 odd new defence homes. It's an area that we do require further effort. We will insulate the homes of the nation and, of course, improve the road and rail infrastructure around the country as well. The question that people need to ask is what would the Liberal Party be doing on all of these fronts to build the long-term infrastructure of the nation? What would they be doing with respect to our primary schools, our secondary schools, our roads, our rail infrastructure? The answer thus far is virtually nothing. Now, I want to turn to the substantive accusations by the member for North Sydney about the issues of debt. You will see first, Madam Deputy Speaker, that the profile of the collapse in revenue as a result of the global economic slowdown, about $115 billion over four years, is very similar to the projected deficit. So, in other words, the primary villain in driving the budget into deficit is the fact that tax revenue has collapsed. So much for the accusation that the government is driving the budget into deficit. In fact, it is the collapse of tax revenue that is doing that. And it's notable that, as I indicated in question time today, the absent shadow treasurer is simply unable to add up. That even the figures put forward by the government, the revised estimates of future surpluses in the mid-year economic and fiscal outlook papers in November last year, which showed a surplus this year of $5 billion, about $3 billion next year, about $2 billion the following year. She claimed, even against those now out-of-date figures, those now optimistic figures, she claimed that a Liberal surplus package of $15 billion wouldn't drive the budget into deficit. It would keep it in balance. Now, you do the maths, Madam Deputy Speaker. Somehow you subtract 15. Even if you put all those three years together, they're still not up to 15. The impact of the government's position, Madam Deputy Speaker, will see the deficit peak at 2.9 per cent of GDP. And that compares with somewhere in the vicinity of 6 or 7 per cent across the developed world and in places like the United States, 8 to 9 per cent. And the net debt figure, which is currently in negative, in other words, more, more is owed to the government than vice versa, that will increase to around 5.2 per cent of GDP, which compares with the average across the developed world today of 45 per cent of GDP. The reason why the ceiling on debt raising that's been put forward in the legislation by the government is at $200 billion, is that there was already a facility and already mostly taken up for $60 to $70 billion of debt, which of course is offset by similar assets, mostly in the future fund held by the government. The government has made commitments to enable uh, lending to go to non-bank mortgage brokers up to $8 billion and, of course, the Australian Business Investment Partnership of $2 billion. And when you add in the projected deficits, that's where you get the need for a ceiling of that kind. The strategy the government's put forward to return the budget to surplus is very clear and straightforward, and that is we will allow tax receipts to resume their normal growth 
up to a ceiling, on average, of the tax as a proportion of our total economy we inherited from, it, we inherited from our predecessors, as we promised at the election. Second, we will restrain spending growth to 2 per cent of a 2 per cent real increase per year once growth in the economy has resumed that trend. And thirdly, at that point, we will require that uh, and have a clear objective that new policy proposals, new spending proposals from within the government will need to be offset with contrasting savings. I turn briefly by, uh, by way of explanation on the question of the projections in the later years, in the four years, something that any respectable shadow minister for finance should know, and that is that the first two years you see in a budget, set of budget papers are forecasts, are fully modelled, they are forecasts. The second two years are projections, and what those projections consist of is simply the average, the long-term average. So if you look at those two years, you'll see that they're actually identical. Projection of growth, 3 per cent, 3 per cent, and the same goes through the others. So the, it is a completely misleading and ignorant way of presenting these things to suggest that that compares with the projected deficits, which the deficits, which of course are not pro, uh, projections based on 20 or 30 years of data. So this is a completely fallacious proposition that has absolutely no meaning, and it does. I think, underline, I think it does underline the point that the member for North Sydney made again today about his respect for economists. He said it today earlier on on 2BL, the quote, economists will always go to extremes. Economists will say in downturn, spend, spend, spend. Now, I'm not quite sure, Madam Deputy Speaker, who the government is supposed to turn to for expert advice in the middle of a national economic crisis other than economists. Perhaps we should be asking aromatherapists or astrologers or other such experts. Perhaps we should turn to people who can really look into the future and tell us perhaps where things are heading. I understand, as we all do, numerologists, probably, that's probably not a bad idea. The uh, Shadow Minister for Finance might take you up on that. I understand, as we all do, that you get different perspectives from economists. and There are people, there are outliers on both ends of any debate in the economics profession, but you have got to take advice. You've got to form your own view on that basis, and to denigrate them, as the member has done, is simply absurd. The alternative that is put forward, the alternative that is put forward by the Liberal Party is across the board tax cuts, across the board sweeping tax cuts. Quote, broad and sweeping tax cuts that, that will increase the tax base and in, increase tax revenues. That, of course, courtesy of the infamous and much discredited policies of Professor Arthur Laffer, adopted by none le the less than George Bush Jr, not his father, but by George Bush Jr has sent the US budget into massive deficits and created a huge problem for the entire nation, not just the Obama administration. And it's code for tax cuts for the wealthy, tax cuts for higher income earners. And it's code for don't target the money, don't try and get the money into things like construction and retail and all the parts of the economy that naturally contract very quickly when a downturn occurs. Just spray it everywhere, particularly to the better off. Now, it's also notable part of this formulation referred to increasing the tax base. That, of course, is code for expanding the GST back to where they in government originally wanted it to be, which was on food, on virtually everything, and they were forced to retreat from that. So the shadow treasurer, it's not surprising that she's been kept in a box over the ensuing days after this performance. The shadow treasurer has let the cat out of the bag on what the Liberal Party is really on about. And of course, finally, on radio a couple of weeks ago, she said, well, the first thing we do in response to the global financial crisis, if we were in government, was to revisit these proposed industrial relations laws. What's that code for? That's code for bring back work choices. So you've got a simple trifecta. The alternative, the alternative from the Liberal Party to the government's package is tax cuts for higher income people. GST expanded and bring back work choices. And they're the three pillars of the traditional Liberal Party position. So we know what the member for Curtin's talking about when she's talking about increasing the tax base. She possibly doesn't know what she's talking about, but we certainly do know what she's talking about. We've got a three-point plan juxtaposed against the government's package, and that three-point plan is very straightforward. And the end result of that plan would be massive indefinite budget deficits like the United States, ever-mounting inequality in Australia and, of course, your rights at work stripped away. Your rights at work just stripped Order. away. Now, now uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, you, you've changed. Yes. Uh, uh, there have been a lot of comparisons 
There have been a lot of comparisons made in recent times in commentary between contemporary circumstances in the 1920s and the 1930s. And you'd have to say the, the opposition are certainly doing their bit for this because they are seeking to return us, to return Australia to the economics of Stanley Melbourne Bruce, to, the day, to Lord Bruce of Melbourne, the days when the natural rulers of the country wore spats and top hats and waistcoats and all that kind of thing. They were blind to human suffering, indifferent to job losses, indifferent to business failures, and fixated with the elegant virtues of the free market, no matter what the cost, and of course horrified at the prospect of governments intervening to invest for the future of the nation. And there is no better person, Madam Deputy uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, there is no better person to do a latter-day impersonation of Stanley Melbourne Bruce than the Leader of the Opposition. There is no more appropriate person. And I think that the ordinary person, the ordinary working person in Australia will be today asking themselves, after Order. all the carnage on Wall Street, after all the destruction of value, after the people who've lost their jobs and their life savings, courtesy of the behaviour of investment bankers, is Australia ready to have an investment banker as Prime Minister? I'd say probably not, Mr Deputy Speaker. I would say probably not. That'll be a question that the Australian people may get the chance to decide towards the end of next year if he lasts as Liberal leader, if the member for Higgins decides that his on-again, off-again affair with flirtation with the prospect of Liberal leadership goes into recession yet again. That'll be something that we'll see in due course. But this is something that I think lies underneath, that lies underneath the position that the Liberal Party have taken today, and which means, in effect, what it means, in effect, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that we will see the uh, attempted blocking of a government plan that will result, if that blocking succeeds, in more pain for working people in this nation in the face of a giant economic challenge, more people losing their jobs, more people losing their homes, more people losing their businesses. It will mean there will be no investment in rebuilding our schools across the nation, particularly our primary schools. It will mean that the effort to insulate our homes and to take a big step forward in reducing our carbon footprint collectively, in improving our greenhouse gas emission uh, performance, none of that will happen. It will mean that our effort to improve social housing, to reduce homelessness, to build more accommodation, none of that will happen. And it will mean that a vast array of small businesses, of retailers, of uh, contractors will lose sales, will shed staff and, in some cases, go out of business. And, of course, in total, it will also mean that there will be less investment because there will be no investment allowance for large and small businesses to attract further investment. Mr Deputy Speaker, the government's committed to this plan. We're committed to fighting all the way to get it through the parliament, to get it in action, to get the money moving, to get the investment moving and to do what other governments are doing around the world to protect their citizens, to protect their working people, to support the jobs in their economies, to support the businesses, large and small, that create wealth and jobs. And we're going to stick to Order. that and we're going to fight all the way. I uh, thank the Minister for Finance. I call on the member for Cowper. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, this is one of the most important matters of public importance to be debated in this parliament. The MPI contrasts the differing approaches between Labor and profligate spending and responsible economic management as proposed by this opposition. It is an issue of whether we want to manage this country's financial affairs responsibly or whether we want to go down the path of debt which is running out of control. The $42 billion economic package introduced into this House today is vintage Labor. It's introduced on the basis of no care and no responsibility, Mr Deputy Speaker. It is Whitlam on steroids. It is a massive package. It's a package that will be certainly welcomed by many in the community. Many of those who receive it will certainly welcome it. But the important question is, is it the best package to achieve the three primary objectives of government in 2009, and that's jobs, jobs and more jobs. We are duty-bound in this House to ask whether it's the best use of taxpayers' funds. Are there better ways that we can spend this money to achieve those three objectives of jobs, jobs, jobs? Is the quantum of this package the appropriate quantum, given the economic circumstances in this country? Because why, if it's such an effective strategy, to spend such a huge amount of money, why don't we double it? 
Why don't we produce even more jobs by doubling the package? If it's just as easy as spending more money, why don't we go into more debt and create, as you allege, more jobs? Because the problem is that this package is plunging us into debt which will become unsustainable. Debt which will have to be paid by our children. Debt which will limit the ability of future governments to deliver services and to deliver tax cuts to the people that they will represent. This government has made the almost Orwellian claim that it built a surplus, Mr. Deputy Speaker. That they built a surplus, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Let the Hansards show that they have not built this surplus. They inherited a surplus. They did not build a surplus. And what did they do with the surplus that they inherited? They converted it very quickly and very effectively into a deficit. A deficit indeed. They converted a $22 billion surplus into a $22.5 billion deficit. The previous coalition was handed $96 billion in debt by the, the Labor government which preceded it, a government which took, went to great lengths to ensure that they concealed a budgetary black hole from the incoming government, a government that didn't deliver a surplus. It delivered a massive deficit. And the question needs to be asked, what debt is this government going to hand on to the next coming government? What is the black hole that this government is going to hand to the government that follows? And more importantly, what impact will that debt have on the children of this country? The hollow men at Spin Central round at the Prime Minister's office have created a new economic term, Mr Deputy Speaker. They've created the notion, and it's a new one to me, the notion of a temporary deficit. I can't imagine that you'd find that term. You, I can't imagine that you'd find that term defined in Robert Barrow's book on macroeconomics, a modern approach, or Taylor and Wipana's recent influential book called Principles of Macroeconomics. The notion of, of temporary deficit has no basis in economics. It is purely more labour spin. This is not a sound term. It is a term designed to con or contrived to deceive and mislead. It is a term designed to deceive and mislead the Australian people by this Prime Minister and the excuse for a Treasurer we currently now have. Because the people of Australia know labour deficits aren't temporary deficits, they are permanent deficits. They are a burden on the Australian economy, but they are the Labor Party stock and trade. In this House this morning we saw the introduction of one of the most frightening pieces of legislation that I have seen introduced to this House in regard to the Commonwealth inscribed stock amendment bill. Because this is a bill I believe which should strike fear in the hearts of anyone who lived through Paul Keating's recession we had to have and anyone whose taxpayers' dollars were used to repay the, former, the debts of the former Labor government, the results of their previous tax binge. This bill in one section increases the debt to, or potential debt to some $200 billion. $200 billion. It is a frightening increase. It is an increase which should concern all Australians. The sort of debt bins that we're talking about by this government is clearly reminiscent of the Whitlam era. I guess the ghost of Kem Lani is stalking the ministerial wings yet again. But the people of Australia don't want financial management Rex Connors style. They know that the electorate must repay the debts of this government and they should rightly be concerned. The Prime Minister is asking the people of Australia to take him on trust. But uh, when we look at the, the uh, current government's responses to the problems that they've faced, they have cert their responses have certainly been flawed. Last year we saw the Prime Minister goading the Reserve Bank to push up interest rates, despite the fact that the world markets were already in turmoil, despite the fact that growth was already slowing, despite the fact that growth was in fact collapsing overseas, there we had the Prime Minister and the Treasurer goading the Reserve Bank to push up interest rates, not for the benefit of this country, not for the benefit of taxpayers, but for the benefit of Labor's political ends. They introduced an unlimited bank guarantee, a rush decision which threw financial markets into turmoil, with thousands of investors having their funds frozen. And why was that? Why was this flawed plan introduced? 
It wasn't introduced because it was good policy. It was introduced because the Prime Minister had a media deadline to meet, and because of that he didn't consult the Reserve Bank, he didn't take the proper advice, he rushed the decision so that he could meet the, the media cycle, so that he could keep his spin machine rolling. And then we had the first stimulus package, $10.4 billion, half of the surplus. It was going to save the world, yet the first stimulus package has virtually disappeared without a trace. It's $10.4 billion, half the surplus, and it's virtually gone. And here also we've had a, uh, a government which uh, has misread the, the economic climate time and time again. And the Prime Minister says, trust me, the Prime Minister says, trust me, this package is going to work. That's the message he's given. $42 billion, an ongoing structural deficit being put in place, and he says, trust me, it's going to work. He's going to run a deficit of $22.5 billion in 08-09. $35 billion in, in 09 10, $70 billion over the forward estimate, and he says, trust me, it's only a temporary deficit. Well, based on his form to date, I think the Australian people are wise not to trust the Prime Minister. I think the Australian people are wise to listen to the words of the opposition when they show real concern for the future of this country, real concern for the taxpayers who will have to pay back Labor's debt, which is being put in place not to benefit the Australian people but to benefit the political needs of the Australian Labor Party, who need to be seen to be doing something, doing anything in the face of what is a very difficult financial position. We've had a stimulus package being put in place for December. We've got a stimulus package now. What happens, Mr Deputy Speaker, if things don't improve? We're going to have another $40 billion in another three, three months' time and another $20 billion in three months after that. Where is this going to end? Where is it going to leave the Australian people? The way they are lurching into deficit really is Labor showing its true colours. We have a stimulus package that enshrines debt as a factor in Australian government and commercial life. We went for years with the notion of surpluses. We went for years on the, uh, with the methodology that the government was repaying debt and was managing responsibly, and that has been replaced by a new paradigm, a paradigm of debt, a paradigm of put it on the never-never, and this new notion of a temporary deficit, a temporary deficit for which there is no plan to repay. As I said when I started my contribution, Mr Deputy Speaker, this, this is pure Whitlam, Whitlam on steroids. And steroids, like long-term debt, can have some very serious consequences. It can, it can stunt growth. Steroids can cause baldness. Steroids can call, cause baldness, but the financial repercussions of long-term debt, long-term debt out of control, can be far more problematic for our Australian economy. We have to reject Labor's notion of profligate spending. We have to support the opposition's plan to have responsible economic management so that this country lives within its means, so that it creates jobs for our young people, so that we invest in Australia's future, not spend for the benefit of the Australian Labor Party. Uh, I thank the member. Uh, I call on the member for Lindsay. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. We're all very much aware of the significance of the challenges that we are facing right across the globe at the moment. And one of the most challenging aspects of the situation we currently face is that many of the old economic orthodoxies have had to be thrown out the window. In fact, we all know that an over-reliance upon neoclassical economics has at least in part been responsible for the international economic mess that we're all trying to come to terms with. Now, that's, that's a reality that we all confront. The message that's coming across through the many international discussions that are occurring at the moment is that, for the first time, the international economy has faced a massive downturn of this sort in the global era. era. And it's in that global era that we require a global and a coordinated policy response to deliver the best possible outcome, to fight against the economic challenges that we face and try and deliver stronger economies right across the world into the future. Now that's the challenge, the challenge to work globally. If we're going to have any chance of working globally, we need a little bit of support and a little bit of cooperation locally. 
Now, on the issue of, of debt and deficit, I hear those on the other side say that the Labor Party is the party of debt and deficit. Well, let's, let me make a few points. The first one is the first budget surplus in Commonwealth history was delivered under a Labor government in the 1980s. Now, have a look at all of the years of government that preceded that, and I can tell you, as unfortunate as I think that fact is, many more years were under Conservative rule than were under Labor rule. Now, these are the same people that just a short time ago were telling you that the Labor Party was the party of high interest rates. Well, with interest rates at the lowest point since the 1960s, yeah. the lowest point since the 1960s, there's been a slight adjustment in the rhetoric. Yeah. Slight adjustment in the rhetoric. They want to call us the party of debt and deficits. They want to accuse us of driving the budget into deficit as if there were some choice as if in the present international economic environment there was some choice. Have a look around. Have a look at all of the developed economies in the world. They're all in deficit, not as a matter of choice, but as a matter of economic reality. Now, when you have $115 billion wiped off your tax revenues, it stands to reason that's going to have a really big impact on the budget bottom line. That fact is going to drive a budget into deficit. There's no active decision taken on the part of a government to do that. And if those on the other side have an answer, a solution, a strategy to combat that, to minimise the loss of $115 billion worth of, of tax receipts over the forward estimates, then I, I really want to hear it. Because if they've got a solution, it would be in the national interest to put it on the table right now. But they don't have a solution. In fact, the only solution, the only thing that even resembles a solution that has been put on the table has been what the shadow treasurer refers to as broad and sweeping tax cuts. The, the very flawed and defective theoretical basis that has underpinned the American economy and led the world into the great disaster that we currently face. Reaganomics. Reaganomics. George W. Bush, the administration under George W. Bush. What we've seen is this attempt to provide those broad and sweeping tax cuts and some hope that that will stimulate the economy. Well, have a look at the budget deficit. Have a look at the debt that the United States economy is carrying. And tell me that it hasn't got anything to do with that strategy. So if you want to come into this place and complain about debt and deficits, you're going to have to do a little bit better. You're going to have to do a little bit better than come up with broad and sweeping tax cuts as your panacea or your prescription, because, frankly, it won't cut it. For those of us throughout the world economy that have listened to those types that have led us down that path, we're all now saying, you are wrong. You were dead wrong. Not only were you wrong, but we're all paying the price now. So what we say is that we want to be a part of the global effort to bring our nation through this crisis. We know that there are massive challenges, but we want to work and we want to draw upon the very best instincts and values of the people in this nation. We want to take advantage of the opportunities that are presented, even in the midst of the great challenges we face. We want to invest in those areas that our nation requires investment. Now, for those on the other side, it's almost an acknowledgement of the failings of their time in government. They don't want to talk about it because, frankly, if I were on their side of politics, I'd never go into a school. Because every time I go into a school in my community, the schools tell me about how they need more resources. And that if the Rudd government wants to deliver an education revolution, it will have to do what the Howard government failed so abysmally in doing, and that is to invest in our nation's future, to invest in educational opportunity. We are committed, determined to build the education revolution. And that's why this second major instalment, the second big stimulus package, the Nation Building and Jobs Plan, following hot on the heels of the economic security strategy. And I've got to say that those on the other side, they all talk about, oh, well, it, it hasn't really achieved anything. The economic security strategy was a bit of a fizzer. Well, all I can say is let's just take ourselves back to when we introduced the package. Those on the other side who at first said they weren't going to quibble, they then went on and said, oh, well, this is too much money. You're blowing all this money in one hit. It's, uh, you know, surely the economy is not in such dire straits that we need to be spending that sort of money. 
It's going to drive up inflation, drive up interest rates. These were the sorts of things that were being said by those on the other side. Now, I just put the question to the House through you, Deputy Speaker. Where would we be if we'd failed as a nation, as a government, to take the strong, the early and decisive action to put that money into the economy, to ensure that, that the wheels of commerce in this country continued to turn over? that small businesses continued to have customers coming through their doors, that people continued to have the opportunity to get up and go to work each day, that people continued to have the opportunity to provide for their families. Now, all of that has been evidenced and has been shown up in the retail trade figures that were out today. Those figures, apart from showing a 3.8 per cent seasonally adjusted increase in retail trade figures for December, importantly, from my perspective, show a 4.9 per cent increase in New South Wales, in the state that I'm from. A 4.9 per cent increase. Now, those on the other side have to get their story straight. Are they saying that we've done too much or not enough? Do they now go back and say, well, they were wrong to say that we were spending too much money on this package? Do they acknowledge that the fiscal stimulus provided back then had an impact? We hear members from the other side come into this place and ask questions and, and say things uh, that, that really demonstrate that they are out of touch with their communities. If you were in your local community talking to retailers, you would know. You wouldn't have to have waited for the retail trade figures today. You would have known, talking to shopkeepers, shopkeepers you would have known that they've been doing it tough and that this really did help. And, and what's, what's the solution that's being put forward by those on the other side? Where do we go from here? Well, they say, let's sit on our hands. We've got all the time in the world. All the time in the world. I can understand that. When it comes to economic management, they want to claim the mantle as being the great economic managers. To them, the last decade in office, it was about operating a cash register. The money was flowing in from corporate tax receipts in particular. The mining boom was providing the, the, the windfall that the government needed. Now that was a great opportunity for the country. The great shame and the great tragedy was that there was very little investment in our nation's future. And that's left the challenge, the job ahead for us even greater. But we're determined to invest in our nation's future. If those on the other side want to block the package uh, that is currently before the House, as they've indicated, then they will have to account to the Australian people. But I simply issue this plea. Don't fool yourself into thinking that this is just about statistics. This is just about a debate or finding some cute debating point. There are people's lives at stake. People in my electorate, people right around the country. There are jobs at stake. This package stands to support up to 90,000 jobs. When you're voting against that package, just think about those people. Those people that won't have the opportunity to go to work because money that would otherwise be pumping into the economy, providing more stimulus, would be denied. That's the challenge for those on the other side. You either want to be part of the solution or you want to stand in the way between us and delivering a stronger economy in the longer term for the people that we're all meant to be here representing. I thank you. I recognise the member for New England. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, I think we're all aware of the global crisis and we're hearing and reading about uh, many of the issues and uh, no doubt this parliament uh, in the last day has uh, been discussing some of those issues. But the point I'd like to really make today is not really to get into uh, the debate about the bills, um, but is to issue a warning, I guess, to both sides of parliament uh, that we should not rush this debate. I think the member from North Sydney made an important uh, point earlier on, that, and the Prime Minister has made the same point. This is a very significant and crucial issue. This nation has never been where we're at before, and the last thing that the people in the community want is the game being played as if it was just another traditional political issue where the two sides can face each other and the one with the numbers wins. That is not going to develop confidence within the community at all. Both the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition have talked about confidence and fear, and the contributors to this debate in the last few minutes have talked about those same issues. What this needs 
is a parliament that actually does deliberate the issues in a constructive sense rather than the politics of the issues. The country doesn't need references to Whitlam. It doesn't need those references back uh, to the 70s. This is a different issue. What it does need is both the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition to look very seriously at what's actually happening here. We all know that the Prime Minister doesn't have all the answers. We all know that no one in the, on the globe really knows what's going to happen in terms of this financial collapse. So there will be mistakes made, and I'm sure in this package uh, that uh, the government is trying to rush through the parliament, there will be some mistakes in it. Uh, on the surface, I'll be supportive of the legislation, uh, but there's areas that do need proper scrutiny, not political scrutiny and references to you know, debt-ridden uh, and addicted labour and uh, Whitlam on uh, steroids or whatever the references were earlier. I don't think that does anything to enhance uh, confidence within the community about the parliament actually trying to come to grips with solving an issue. And the government doesn't control the Senate. We do have two houses, two, two houses of parliament. The government doesn't control uh, the Senate. But I think it would be in the interests of the government to slow down on this issue and actually have the debate, have the debate about uh, these critical issues, not in a political sense where you can gag it at three o'clock in the morning because you've got the numbers. That would be the worst thing that could be done in terms of th this issue. This is a lot of money. Uh, there are in my view, serious attempts by government to address some of these issues through uh, money going into a whole range of areas uh, from schools, local government, community, uh, and obviously the various tax and investment uh, allowances and things that are built into it. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, uh, we've got the climate change issues that are there. They all send significant single, uh, signals to the community. But the signal that's coming out of this place now is one of, not unity, but one of the game is the same. This, this, everybody is suggesting, and I think the general public feel, that this is an issue that they don't understand. You know, we, a lot of the institutions that we trusted globally, a lot of the people we trusted globally in terms of their, uh, their economic theories and the way in which uh, they uh, developed confidence in uh, various policies that governments around the world put in place. Alan Greenspan. You know, we, most of us thought that he knew everything that was going on. He's apologised. Well, the member for skirts mightn't. But, <laughs> but, the, uh, but a, lot of his, a lot of his colleagues did. But, uh, the point I'm making is that a lot of these institutions, confidence has been undermined. Uh, in the general public's mind. And I think the way in which this de debate is developing, and even the gimmickry today at, uh, at question time, where question time is supposed uh, to take the time to provide scrutiny in terms of the, the I legislative... I thank the member. His time has expired. I call, recognise the member for Colwell. Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, the opposition's rejection of a stimulus package that has been designed to bolster Australia's economy during an unprecedented economic crisis is an irresponsible, obstructive tactic at a time when Australians are looking to their, gov to their government for responsible leadership and support as they struggle to keep their jobs and their homes. This package is not just about one-off handouts. It is about the Australian government providing an immediate stimulus to the economy and, more critically, it is about supporting Australian jobs by bringing forward massive infrastructure programs through which Australians will see immediate and much-needed benefits. Far from being irresponsible, this package strikes the right balance between supporting growth and jobs now and delivering the lasting investments needed to strengthen the economy for the future. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, this is good quality policy. No more is this commitment more obvious than in the massive $28.2 billion of direct investments in schools, housing, roads and other essential infrastructure. Deficit, um, not a long-term debt. It is a sensible long-term investment in our future uh, prosperity. 
It is these young Australians. Oh, sorry, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in investing in education, we are investing in the future of young Australians. It is these young Australians who will be the future workforce of this country. It is these young Australians who will create our future wealth. It is these young Australians who, through their talents and skills, will be the drivers of our innovation capacity. By investing in our schools through infrastructure and facility upgrades, as this package aims to do, we are equipping these young people with the resources and the tools they need to create our future prosperity and grow our economy. Now, we often talk about a decline in interest by school children in areas of science and maths. My own Committee on Industry, Science and Innovation recently released a report called Building Australia's Research Capacity, detailing the decline of young Australians pursuing a research career. We must heed these alarm bells if we are truly committed, Mr Deputy Speaker, to increasing our knowledge and scientific capacity. Building modern science labs is fundamental to reinvigorating young, uh, young people's interest in science, and it is critical to our country's economic future and prosperity. This stimulus package responds to this need, and if we accept that we need to develop capability in the areas of science and maths, then we need new science laboratories and we need them now. And if we accept that we need to develop our language capabilities in order to be competitive in a global community, then we need language laboratories, Mr Deputy Speaker, and we need them now. Mm -hmm. By injecting funds into schools, the government is investing in the nation's future. Now, for the opposition to obstruct this investment and to try to paint the government as financially responsible indicates that they do not see the value of investing in our nation's future through our schools and they are in serious denial about uh, what other countries around the world already know, and that is that the effects of the global financial crisis are unfolding before our eyes. Australia is not immune, and we must act now. Now, is it possible, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the opposition just doesn't get it? And if this is the case, can I take the opportunity to inform the opposition that other Australians do get it? And I'd like to have a look at what others who know a little bit about these things are saying about the government's stimulus package. Heather Ridout from the Australian Industry Group says, and I quote, that the nation building and jobs plan announced by the federal government today is simple and substantial and will provide a big stimulus to help the economy moving together with the interest rates cut. It's been a day for monetary and fiscal policy. It's a case of all hands on deck, she says. And I say, what a pity that the opposition has chosen to not get on board. Ron Silberg, Silberberg from the Housing Industry Association also says, and I quote, that the government's recovery plan appropriately spends for jobs in the short term and invests for future prosperity. And of course, Angela Gavriolatos from the Australian Education Union, who seriously understands the need to invest in our schools and lobbies hard to ensure that this happens, says, and I quote, in addition to providing an important economic stimulus, today's announcement is the most important infrastructure investment the government can make. This investment will provide the opportunity for our schools to engage in urgent upgrades and to develop modern learning environments which will improve education outcomes for students. Mm -hmm. And finally, Wal King from the Australian Constructors Association says, and I quote, this is a very thoughtful and well-targeted program. This is the right time to invest in Australia, to protect the future, and the announcements are an important I contribution. I thank the member for her contribution. The time for this debate has lapsed. Uh, I call on the Chief Government Whip. Mr Deputy Speaker, I do thank you for the call. And I do ask leave of the House to move a motion to refer a bill to the main committee for further consideration. Is leave granted? Thank you. House, Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the Aviation Legislation Amendment 2008 Measures No. 2 Bill 2008 be referred to the main committee for further consideration. I advise all honourable members that this motion enjoys the support of the honourable member for Fairfax, the Chief, Government, uh, Chief Opposition Whip. Uh, thank you. I put the question. All those in favour, aye. Against, no. It is carried. Yes, um, thank you. Um, I have to report that the Families, Housing, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs and Other Legislation Amendment Miscellaneous Measures Bill 2008 
has been fully considered by the main committee and has been agreed to without amendment. I present a certified copy of the bill and I understand that it is the wish of the House to consider the bill immediately. The question is that the bill be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye, against, no, carried. Uh, the bill has been agreed to. Uh, I'm sorry. I recognise the uh, parliamentary secretary at the table. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I ask the Leave of the House to move the third reading immediately. Is leave granted? Thank you. The leave is granted. I move that this bill be now read a third time. I put the question. All those in favour say aye. Against, no. The bill is agreed to. Thank you. Clark. Uh, third reading. A bill for an act to make amendments relating to the Social Security Appeals Tribunal and technical amendments and for related purposes. Thank you. Now, the following message from the Senate has been received. Uh, the Senate returns to the House of Representatives a bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes and informs the House that the Senate has agreed to the bill with the amendments in the annexed schedule. The Senate requests the concurrence of the House in the amendments. Thank you. Mr Deputy Speaker, I move that the amendments be considered at the next sitting. Um, all those of that opinion say aye, against no, that is agreed to. Thank you. Business. Next order of the day, Appropriation Nation Building and Jobs Bill No. 1, 2008-2009, resumption of debate on second reading. Before the debate is resumed on this bill, I remind the House that, in accordance with the resolution agreed to earlier, this bill is being debated concurrently with the, appropria with the Appropriation Nation Building and Jobs Bill No. 2, 2008 to 2009, the Household Stimulus Package Bill 2009, the Tax Bonus for Working Australians Bill 2009, the Tax Bonus for Working Australians Consequential Amendments Bill 2009, and the Commonwealth Inscribed Stock Amendment Bill 2009. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I recognise the uh, member for Gippsland. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And it's a pleasure to rejoin the debate. And as I was saying, there is actually no one on this side of the House or in the broader public who has much confidence in the capacity of the state governments to deliver on the education and schools program, either on time or on budget. And it was interesting in question time to hear the Minister for Agriculture lecturing me today about the needs of Gippslanders and the Mafra Secondary College. And it was a very unusual choice of examples by the Minister, given the debacle which surrounded the funding for the Mafra Secondary College project. The State Government of Victoria put out a press release announcing funding for the Mafra Secondary College and then said, whoops, slips, no go. There's actually no funding for Mafra Secondary College and backed right away from the project. It only uh, required some few street marches, petitions and campaigns by the local MPs and the uh, community residents themselves to actually get the funding restored. So it's an unusual choice by the minister if he's hoping to build any faith at all in the capacity of state governments to deliver on these, uh, these projects under the education and funding program. But Gippslanders really do know how much the minister cares for them anyway. He's visited the region three times, all in the lead-up to the Gippsland by-election, and hasn't been seen since. We'd love to have him back. He's most welcome to come to Gippsland any time, particularly as our farmers are dealing with the ongoing struggles with the drought. But as I was saying earlier, Deputy Speaker, there is great support for investment in the education uh, programs associated with this package. But the problem with it is there's no balance to the package. There's nothing there for the health needs of my community. There's nothing there in terms of the aged care needs, not even mentioned at all. I'm not uh, one, and I do take up the comments from the member for New England who uh, called for a bit, of, a bit of caution and perhaps people take a bit of, a bit of a slow down, take a breath about this whole debate and uh, given the importance of it. And I'm not one to completely discount the package and say it's, uh, it's, all, uh, it's all poor public policy because I believe there's a lot of uh, good policies in the package and I've uh, referred to a few of those earlier today. There are some good initiatives, but again, I fear in the roads and transport area that we're to some extent just bailing out the state governments from their responsibilities. One particular package of interest is the $150 million for the boom gates to improve safety at level crossings. Now, there's no argument on either side of the House regarding the need to improve level crossings, but we're talking about $150 million, though, for 200 projects 
and right across Victoria there's probably a thousand unmanned or sort not even unmanned un unregulated crossings which have been the subject of great community debate. I would believe we could force the state governments in fact to go a dollar for dollar and match the funding get four hundred uh, boom gates installed if, if that was the, uh, the uh, preference for the treatment for those particular level crossings. I think we're leaving the state governments off scot free on their obligations in relation to the, uh, the safety at level crossings. But there's a little bit of extra funding for the road black, stock, black spot program, and as the Minister for Regional Development pointed out today, he would expect the nas nationals to support that, and we certainly do support the additional funding in relation to the regional roads projects. Uh, it was the, the nationals in conjunction with the Liberal Party which initiated roads to recovery. One of those Thank programs, you. roads to recovery, which has stood the test of time and hasn't been disbanded by the current government. Roads Recovery is one of those excellent programs where the local communities get to decide the local priorities. And I would hope that in this particular package there's some option for that to happen if the uh, package is passed through the Senate later on. There is some uh, good news also. I do, do believe in the package in relation to some of the environmental aspects of the, uh, the package. But again, it's, it's, a, it's the sheer scale of the package and the, uh, the lack of uh, the negotiation or discussion with a, with a broader a community in terms of what is the most effective spend in this regard, which bothers me in relation to this whole package. There's, uh, there's no extra funding here, for example, for land care, which is the real, the real practical labour-intensive programs. We're talking about job creation. This is one of the real opportunities for labour-intensive intensive work in weed control, pest animal removal, erosion and revegetation works. It would create jobs and deliver real benefits to the environment right across regional Australia. I do accept the ceiling insulation program and the solar water rebates are both reasonable initiatives. But again, I just question the scale of the program. Is this the best way for be spending $42 billion as part of this initiative? And I, I do believe that, again, we have failed to uh, negotiate on this, uh, this package and involve the broader community in a debate when we, we, could have, we have got the time to do so. Can we really afford uh, the extent of these programs and really stimulate the economy and create the jobs, which I believe should be, and the Prime Minister himself has indicated, is the main focus of, the, of this entire strategy. We have no evidence that the first package worked, and there's still no proof that this one will either. And while I'm on the environment, perhaps there's that the little matter of actually delivering on previous promises. And my, my good friend, the Minister for Agriculture, I'm sorry to be talking about him in his absence, but the Minister has promised $3 million for the Gippsland Lakes, promised in November 2007. Uh, Thirteen months later, not a single cent has been delivered on the promise. We've exchanged correspondence on the issue. Apparently, we're waiting for contracts. So for 13 months, we're waiting for contracts for a $3 million project. We're talking about a $42 billion project to be rolled out over the next uh, four years, I have very little confidence on the capacity of the government to deliver on that promise. The Gippsland Lakes funding that I'm referring to is a critical program which uh, has widespread support across the community to reduce the nutrient flow into the Gippsland Lakes. It's an icon of the Gippsland region, and I urge the minister to uh, uh, expedite that funding as soon as possible. So, given we couldn't even deliver $3 million on time, I have no reason to be confident that the, uh, the rollout of the $42 billion will work particularly once we involve the dysfunctional state governments. And, uh, we've, all seen, we've all had experiences of the, the state government's failure to manage money properly in recent years. The housing and construction and public, the, uh, housing construction public program, particularly relating to the uh, to defence forces, um, has a lot of merit. And as myself, as a member for Gippsland, the East Sale RAF base is a critical component of the regional economy. And I would, you would be a, a madman not to suggest that uh, improving the, uh, the um, the stock of Defence Force housing is not a good strategy. I'm certainly in support of that. But again, I just, I just seek the more time to negotiate these issues through with the government. There are elements of the package, as I've repeatedly said, which are quite good, and I can see how they deliver benefits in terms of uh, um, uh, jobs in the construction industry related to the, the building program. But on the overall scale of things, I'm, still, I'm stunned with a $42 billion package, and we're given 12 or 14 hours to debate it here today with no preparation whatsoever. whatsoever. And I think just uh, it's, it smacks of arrogance and it's a, it's a real it's a discredit to the government itself. And really, the failure of this government to negotiate or to talk to others about it reflects their view that they actually know everything. I look at uh, alternate viewpoints are being put in the public already. That Michael uh, Costa, the former New South Wales Treasurer, suggesting the government should focus its attention on providing an environment that supports business confidence. The quickest way for the government to restore business and consumer confidence is through tax cuts. That's in the Daily Telegraph today. So these are alternative ideas that we're talking about. When we're talking about a $42 billion package, they should be fully explored before we just rush headlong into this program. I do accept the need for a stimulus package, but not this one, and I'll be opposing the bill. I urge the government to go back to the drawing board to slow down and to take the advice of the member for New England in that regard. Listen to the views of others and return with a realistic package we can all support. It's easy to be popular, to give away money we don't even have, but it's Thanks much harder to do the right thing to make the tough decisions. I call on the member for Franklin. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. 
Uh, I must say um, I'm pleased to be able to make a contribution. This is an important debate that we're having today. And I think that both sides of the House are in agreement that the global economy has in the past months deteriorated to a point where some of the biggest economies, such as the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany and Japan, have all fallen into recession, and we all acknowledge that before us are tough economic times. But the global economic conditions are worsening at a faster pace than first thought. The International Monetary Fund has reminded us of this very fact when recently it cut its forecast from global growth three times in just four months. It is now expecting a global recession. The global financial crisis has impacted significantly on our forward projections for revenue over the four years of the budget estimates. This means that there is now a $115 billion shortfall. As the global financial crisis impacts on the daily lives of people around the world, this government and I also believe time for the government to act again. Last December, this government took decisive action. The $10.4 billion economic security strategy was common sense. It was economically responsible and it was dealing with the state of the global economy at that time. And just today we had the ABS statistics released that were referred to in question time with the retail trade figures for December 2008. And as we know, they were better than expected. They were 3.8 per cent, in fact. And the ABS said total sales hit a seasonally adjusted $19.16 billion. In fact, the ABS said, and I quote, the package implemented in December has impacted on Australian retail turnover. This economic strategy that we had it was a responsible package and it had a positive impact on the Australian economy. But since December, news on the global front has changed significantly. We cannot sit idly by waiting for the market to correct itself. What we need to do is actively put in place further nation-building packages that will not only support the Australian economy but will support Australian jobs and will leave us with a better infrastructure and a better country than when we started this. And this is exactly what the Rudd Labor government has done. Again, we've acted decisively. Without the significant action, it would be difficult to hold back the economic tide that has engulfed some of the world's biggest economies. It is clear that the Australian people want to feel secure as we head through the turbulent economic times. It is clear that they are looking to their government to take action, direct action, through this extraordinary and historic economic event. It is also clear that those opposite aren't heeding the warnings before us. What they're insisting on is an ad hoc approach at best, an it'll be all right made approach, bringing tax cuts forward and letting the market correct itself. It's clear they really don't have a plan at all. And we heard that yesterday with the finance minister kindly pointing out the shadow treasurer's confusion in the House yesterday from the weekend when she said that the government should pursue broad and sweeping tax cuts that will increase the tax base and increase tax revenues. If we don't take decisive action now, Australia's at the risk of losing some jobs. If we don't take more action now, there will be no guarantees that Australia's economy will sustain this economic emergency. Our plan in both this package and the previous one was to strike a balance that supports short-term relief and long-term initiatives. It's a plan that will immediately support jobs, while over the longer term one that will deliver an infrastructure package that will strengthen Australia's economy in the coming years as we come out of this global crisis. It's also about stimulating the economy in the short term, providing direct payments to low- and middle-income earners, as well as encouraging private sector development. This nation-building and jobs plan continues the Rudd government's action in the face of the worsening global financial crisis. We also know that China's growth has halved. It has forced the Australian government to reconsider and to bring on this another stimulus package, a package that must be supported by all in this chamber if we're to ride out these economic conditions. It is not since the Great Depression that we've witnessed such comparable financial and economic times. And Australia is better placed than most other economies, but with the growing emergency before us, we can no longer think that we'll be totally immune and we need to do something about supporting Australians and Australian jobs as we go forward. As a federal member for Franklin, I welcome the measures contained in these bills because I know that the constituents of Franklin will want some support and assistance during this crisis. The household stimulus package that will ensure the economy is strengthened and the government will provide upfront lump sum tax bonuses of $950 to around $8.7 million tax, tax paying Australians earning $100,000 or less. The working Tasmanians in my electorate of Franklin are set to benefit. The household stimulus package will also assist single income families with a bonus of $950 to provide some additional assistance to families that have one main income earner. We are also supporting those on the land with a $950 payment that will be paid to farmers and others receiving exceptional 
exceptional circumstances, a training and learning bonus of $950 to those returning to, to study or training. The infrastructure investment, as we know, is one of the core initiatives of this Rudd government's $42 billion nation building and jobs plan. The plan will deliver $28.2 billion in direct investment in schools, housing, roads and other local infrastructure. And it's our schools that will be the central focus. We will deliver a $14.7 billion boost to the education revolution over the next three financial years. And we're calling it the Building and Education Revolution. All of Australia's 9,500 schools will benefit. There are three key elements of this Building and Education Revolution. $12.4 billion, which will be allocated to primary schools to build or refurbish large-scale infrastructure. The $1 billion will be allocated to build up to 500 science laboratories or language centres in our secondary schools. The $1.3 billion to refurbish and renew existing infrastructure and build minor infrastructure in all schools. In my electorate of Franklin, I have 55 schools. All the schools will benefit in some way. The primary schools, such as Howard and, and Hewanville Primary Schools, with more than 400 students, will each be eligible for up to $3 million in infrastructure that will assist them to expand or, or upgrade their existing uh, facilities. In my travels in the electorate, I've come across many schools in my electorate that will benefit greatly from these. I've seen temporary classrooms on many of the school grounds, as we have around the country. I've also seen schools that have no shelter for their students when it's raining or protection from the sun. I too, as the Prime Minister mentioned today, have got many schools that don't have areas big enough to hold a school assembly, where the whole student population can actually meet together in one place. I'll be encouraging all the schools in my electorate to, to access this money and talking to them about what they're going to spend it on. We'll also be helping around 9,000 families in my electorate who will receive the back-to-school bonus of $950 to help with the costs of kids returning to school. And if this uh, package is actually passed sometime this week, those payments are supposed to begin on the, 11th, the fortnight beginning the 11th of March. So I'd hope that uh, we can actually get some of this legislation through because people are relying on this money and they're counting on it. And those opposite are the ones letting them down. But these payments are what we are paying on top of the education tax refund. And it's not only the schools that will benefit in my electorate or the households with the direct support, but it will also be a benefit to Southern Tasmania's roads. There will be an additional investment in the Black Spot program to further reduce accidents on Australia's roads. In December 2008, the government announced we'd more than double the Black Spot funding from 50 million to 110 million. The government will now invest an additional 30 million in 08 09 and 60 million in 0910 to further extend the coverage of this project. And as chair of the Tasmania Black Spot Committee, I welcome this funding. I'm sure that uh, many councils and local government roads in Tasmania will benefit greatly from that money. We're also turning our attention to making sure households are well insulated. This will modernise Australia's existing stock. Australian owner occupiers will be able to access free insulation and support of ceiling insulation. Uh, with solar hot water panels of the rebate of $1,600. This will save them on their electricity bills in two ways. We're also looking to support tenants in rental accommodation, with landlords able to access the increased rebate. We're also helping Australian households to install climate-friendly hot water technologies, as I mentioned. Again, I'll be encouraging all of my constituents to take up these offers to improve the energy efficiency of their homes. And on top of these initiatives, we're putting money into social housing. $6.4 billion over three and a half years has been allocated for the construction of new social housing, as well as a further $400 million over two years for repairs and maintenance on existing public dwellings. In Tasmania, we have a large proportion of our population reliant on government income support. We also have a very large waiting list for public housing compared to other states for our population. At least 20,000 low-income households will be assisted by having access to secure and affordable public housing. This will help accommodate people who are homeless, who are at risk of homelessness, or those who are paying very high rental costs and are unable to continue to do so. It will also stimulate building and construction industry through further additional dwellings and increasing expenditure on repairs and maintenance. These are local jobs and, and supporting local jobs. It will be a win-win situation for all. But I just, as I finish, want to quote some of the responses in my home state of Tasmania on this package, particularly the Tasmanian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, who said, and I quote, this is a brave package and one that will impact on the nation's fiscal and economic position for many years to come. The master builders of Tasmania, who said the plan 
The planned dual benefit of having falling interest rates in conjunction with this kind of fiscal stimulus will certainly alleviate some of the pain that is coming for this industry. I too support these economic packages. These are tough times, and this plan strikes an important balance between supporting growth and jobs now and delivering on investments in our future. It's a plan to support the Australian people. It's what they expect of us. It's time to show some leadership, and it's time to act. I commend these bills to the House. The question is, the bill will be now read a second time. The member for O'Connor. Yes, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Madam Deputy Speaker, many members today have chosen, including ministers, to read, uh, of course, the, um, the thank you notes from those who see themselves or their people they represent receiving money. The leading talkback commercial station in Perth has as one of its speakers, one of its um, uh, announcers, a fellow called Bob Mormel. Known Bob for many years. He's a hard-nosed Labor voter, Bob, and he would say so publicly, and I admire him for it. He's not a bad horse trainer either, and we've had many discussions in both areas. And I thought the House might be interested in what this hard-nosed Labor voter with a huge interest in democracy and the proceedings of parliament has had to say on air today. To put it in simple terms, he says, pull your head in, Kev, let the opposition do their job. And I might add the member just hearing the House would well know Bob Mormel. And he goes on to say, well, the opposition has every right to take reasonable time to carefully examine these latest spending proposals. In fact, it is the opposition's duty to do so. And the question might be asked why Bob has to give that lecture to his Labor colleagues. It might be that Bob knows that we've been in recess for nearly two months, but while the Prime Minister was writing his treatise on the advantages of socialism, we could have been called back here to give this a couple of weeks' consideration and meet the deadlines for which the government is so anxious. To come back and in the first or second sitting day to have $42 billion of virtual mini-budget dumped into this House with the obligation of an analysing it and giving good service to the community is, of course, ridiculous. Ridiculous and bad, and one can only doubt the motives of the government in so doing. As much as there are needs to try and keep ahead of the current international situation, it is not that urgent. It seems that getting money out might have more to do with the schedules applied in Newspol than the welfare of Australians. And it's interesting because I look at this legislation and its intention and I ask myself, when we fought the last election, there were some very significant promises make it, made by the government. The first one being, of course, economic rectitude. We will guarantee to maintain surpluses. Trust us. And then, of course, in, in that context, we were told we would have an education revolution, funded in a proper budget, which was to retain a surplus. And then, of course, we were going to have a housing program for the poor and the needy, funded without the need of borrowing. And where are they? I mean, I heard the minister today telling us about her new program, all to be funded with debt. But I thought she'd fix that according to answer after answer she gave in this place some time ago. She'd done a deal with the private sector. They were queuing up in their thousands to take the deal from the government, whereby they would construct the housing and rent them out on the basis of a subsidy. 
good practical policy, I might think, but one can only wonder why it is now necessary for the government to borrow billions to build houses. And of course, like that lovely gift of free computers, there's nothing in this legislation that tells us who pays as they suffer the normal deterioration applicable to rental premises. They cost a lot more to look after than does uh, other premises uh, that uh, people might buy in with their own money. And it's the same thing. The, the states are saying, oh, wacko, give us the money. But not one of them yet answered the question, help. What do we do with 20,000 houses as the windows get broken and the floors get ripped up and all the other things that most of us have perceived in this particular area? Not a word. We know what's happened with the free computers. The overall cost has doubled. And in fact, that's probably not enough because it's been established the maintenance cost of these little black boxes is far in excess of their actual hardware purchase. And we know it. So the first couple of questions we have is, what is this all about? It's certainly not an attempt to turn the Australian economy or, or crank it up. I mean, it's all right to talk about whether or not extra money was spent at Harvey Norman, etc., or Bunnings, or many of the places I visit as a shopper, I noted what happened. Yeah, when the turnover went up, the queues at the checkout got longer. But I didn't see any extra checkout checks. And nobody stood up in this place and said, here is the evidence of increased employment relevant to this costly injection of funding. Yeah, you can say maybe some didn't get the sack, but there's no evidence of that. And when we get to the much-hated work choices, there is evidence of 50,000 new jobs in a month in Victoria and New South Wales immediately after small business discovered it no longer had the threat of paying go-away money under those particular rules of unfair dismissal. So when we want to compare the statistics, it's not a bad idea to put the facts on the table. But uh, there's so many questions that can't be answered in the course of a day or two. I mean, this legislation should have laid on the table for at least a week while the broader commentators might have had a look at what it all meant. And I was a bit surprised that the Minister for Trade put his head above the, the trenches today to make his contribution and repeat the lines that were carefully crafted, which were like decisive and uh, the we're out of touch and everything else, because I read into his remarks that the IMF have said that Australia's got to spend more money to save the rest of the world. And you can go back and read his comments, but that was a clear implication that I worked out. And this is what annoys me as the representative of farmers, miners and all those primary industries, the people that carry the Australian economy and, of course, the people where the workers have lost their jobs. What are they all going to be under this new spend, spend, spend regime? Check out, check out chicks. Or maybe they'll get a job as a barman or a croupier. But they won't be getting a job in mining under this package because there's not one cent for the export industries. Tourism, that's an export industry, if people possibly understand. They said a little while ago, things are dreadfully tough for us, can you help? And the answer from this government was no. So how do we drive an export-oriented economy when we give them no help and we give all the money to people to go and buy imported goods? <laughs> and, and, and maybe that truth came out through the comments of the Minister for Trade when he said, oh, the IMF are pressing for this. Australia's apparently got to save the world. But then, of course, overnight, there's no talk anymore of a, um, of a surplus. 
from this moment on everything is borrowed money. When all those people get their 900 bucks, the interest bill starts now for them. I don't know if anybody thinks we materialise money in this place. Of course, the Whitlam government did. But if we're real about it and we borrow money, and we borrow it out of a very restricted market, where do the profit generators get theirs? Where do they get it? You might like to tell me. Are they going to get it overseas? That seems to be the problem. So we're going to have government back in the money market, hip and shouldering every other business that might think it can borrow some money and do something for the economy out of the way. And it's all right for the Reserve Bank to say what interest rates will be. When money gets short, it's out of their control. They become commercial rates. The banks talk of it of cost of borrowing. So when 40 odd billion dollars worth of government paper comes on the market, and people, of course, will buy it, because they at least hope they'll get their money back there, then what happens in the private sector? Historically, our banks have gone overseas, and of course there's certain government initiatives that have helped them there. But I mean there's rumours in the trade at the moment that letters of credit are fundamental to the export trade are not being honoured. Now, has our government been out there at actually no cost and said to importing nations, what is your government doing to guarantee these letters of credit? Nothing. Nothing. All they want to do is get out there and start to cover their backside for their election promises. Everything of substance in this package was promised in the election. We're going to look after the schools. We're going to look after social housing. Well, why don't you do it, as you promised, within a surplus budget? Because you can't. That's why you can't. And so you're going to put the kids of Australia back into debt. The member, and the member will refer his comments through the chair. I beg your pardon? Would the member refer his comments through the chair? Oh, I would be delighted to, and, but unfortunately for yourself, you're dragged into this matter, Madam Chair, as a government member. So uh, you, of course, have to answer some of these questions. But of course, and I respect your right, and I will do that. But uh, yeah, my my reference to you was, of course, very much to the people that are here, that are going down the road, of borrowing money, and saying, "Oh, don't you worry about that. You know, it'll all come good." and we will pay it back. Well, the record of Labor governments in my living memory does not say they ever paid a debt back. They let it accumulate. And that's the other point. You know, there's an item here, um, well, the home unit, $6 billion. How soon will the interest bill be $6 billion? Bucks? Ongoing. And when will it be $10 billion? Ongoing. And where then do you find the money for the schools and everything? But let's go back, of course, to the commencement of this government. We had a thing called investing in our schools program. Oh, that was dreadful. That was a program where individual school principals and their PNCs assessed their classroom, assessed their school, and made an application for money. Up to 150,000 any school. And I got 150 schools in my electorate, and many of them thought $10,000 was enough. Others took the lot. One purchased their own new classroom. They bought computers galore. They bought musical instruments for the kids. But they did not all think they needed 150. So now they're going to get 200. Now, is that good public policy? The locals worked out what they needed. It was for free. There was no strings attached other than the state government over there ripped 17 per cent out of it by insisting it managed the money for them, which I thought was pretty outrageous. But there was a program cancelled, and now we've got a look-alike under the label of what? Not good public policy, a label of um, 
uh, saving the nation, um, a crisis um, response. And then, of course, we had regional partnerships. Oh, that was absolute daylight robbery and rotten, and there were thieves. And uh, let's say a couple of the projects did not meet proper standards. And I created that program, and I got a letter from the Auditor General saying, "Not under my watch." But the reality of it was, we've got we've got a new regional partnerships, but there's no basic. Uh, managing the money, it's just hand it out and hope they'll spend it. Is that good public policy? No. So what do we go? I mean, we're going to build all these new houses, and uh, we haven't built the ones that uh, were previously funded. I don't think they're out there for rent in any number. The question was asked today. Uh, you know, the member for um, education, Minister for Education and just about everything else has lectured us over the years about all the money well, over the year that she's put into education. But when the shadow minister stands up and says, well, where are the things so funded? Well, they're not there yet. In fact, on, on one very significant trades training issue, there's five around Australia that have been approved. So they've still got the opportunity to contribute to the stimulus and give some jobs to workers. But when you look at it, this, if this project had any sense, I agree with our leader. Firstly, tax cuts would have been the better stimulus and whatever the cost they flow through. And we, as a government, introduced tax cuts for about three years and delivered a surplus as well. So all this argument that you can't have tax cuts in a surplus is defeated by history. But nevertheless, when you get down to it, why would you borrow all this money for such mundane tasks? If we really and truly want to do something, and just give those 1,800 miners that I represent down at Ravensthorpe a job, why wouldn't you go into a major production project. I mean, when the much quoted Roosevelt addressed the problems of the United States during the Depression, he built the Hoover Dam. If anyone reads the public works history of Western Australia, nearly every water catchment, every dam in our state was built during that same period to give people work, but it's still a lasting benefit to the community. Now, we've got a few lousy millions for, to put uh, pink bats or something in things, and nobody's told us what the carbon footprint of manufacturing that sort of insulation is, but if it's rock wool, there's an awful lot of heat goes to burning rocks into fluff. But that doesn't matter. It looks good. But if the amount of money that was allocated for the Christmas party before Christmas had been put into one renewable energy project utilising the tides of the Kimberleys and the interconnection of that energy on a two-way basis with the coal fields of Western Australia and Victoria and Tasmania, that could have been done for less than that $10 billion. And I've circulated that information widely, and that would have been job-creating now and, of course, left a wonderful legacy—4.2 gigawatts initially of electricity, 10 per cent of Australia's total generation, 120 per cent of Western Australia's. And if the government had paid for the infrastructure, the electricity was free. Now, how would that have helped the elderly and the needy? And, of course, what would it have done for our environment? And these are the issues that a competent government would have looked at major construction projects and, of course, housing is a responsibility of government 365 days a year and that you don't have a cop-out and go for these sorts of fancy schemes under the farage of a, of a, um, of a, a, a package to save the economy. It is just silly. And it's a mixture of all those things, 
and there's no credit to the government at all in the thing they've taken. Yes, they could have had these opportunities. What about flow-through taxation provisions for the mining industry? So people out of a job go out mining because there's people will invest for the tax deduction that can flow through to them from the company that's losing money looking for minerals. They'd have a job now, and whatever they find, we'll be programming and projecting into our future when we need the money. There's all these good options, and the ones that the government has presented us have no credit whatsoever. The member's time has expired. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. The member for Corio. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I rise to speak in support of the package of uh, bills which provides the legislative underpinning for the economic stimulus package which was announced yesterday by the government. An American president a long time ago said, we cannot escape history. We of this Congress and this administration will be remembered in spite of ourselves. No personal significance or insignificance can spare one or another of us. The fiery trial through which we pass will light us down in honour or dishonour to the latest generation. In saying those words, Abraham Lincoln was, of course, talking about a tragedy which far exceeds what we are dealing with today in the American Civil War. But his sentiment in placing in context the role of public policy historically in the way it applied to that crisis is a sentiment which is very apt to what we are dealing with right now. Whether we like it or not, we are faced with the single biggest economic shock that the world has seen since the Second World War. And we will be remembered, no matter what we do or what we do not do, on this day and in this chamber. And whether we act or whether we do not act will not just have an influence on Australians in the months and years ahead, but it will have an influence on Australians for decades to come. And so for me, the question is very simple. We must act. We must deal with the historic task that we have been given in the circumstances that we have been presented with. When the Rudd government came to office, it inherited an education deficit. During the Howard years, Australia was the only country in the OECD which reduced its expenditure on tertiary education as a proportion of GDP. And that is just one figure among many which demonstrates the extent to which education withered on the vine during the Howard years. When the Rudd government came to office, we inherited an infrastructure deficit. And we don't just say it. Engineers Australia, a respected peak body of engineers, has said that in the final years of the Howard government, from 2001 through 2005, infrastructure in this country went backwards on roads, on the electricity grid, on seaports, and that again is just one comment in an ocean of comments, which demonstrates the extent to which infrastructure in this country rotted during the Howard years. And we inherited a government which had failed to acknowledge the role that humans had played in climate change, so that amongst developed nations we stood alone with the United States in failing to ratify the Kyoto Protocol. The Howard economic formula was simply to transform this country into Asia's quarry, to leave everything up to the mining boom without any thought at all of what might happen when the mining boom came to an end. And yet now it has. And nothing was done to take the proceeds of that mining boom and put it in a place and reserve it for a day that we face such as today. The economic laziness of the Howard government saw no investment in human capital in this country, in the productive capacity of this country, and it had absolutely no comprehension of the Australian government's responsibility for dealing with climate change, in a sense the global issue of our age. When we came to power, we discovered that this government for 11 years had been asleep at the wheel. And the very first thing we did was crank up the engine and get Australia moving in that direction. And then within the first 12 months of the Rudd government, we have been faced with an almost unprecedented, unprecedented economic phenomenon, this incredible global economic shock. And we have heard a lot about the dimensions of this, but if there is one fact which puts it in some form of context to me, it is that the IMF now predicts for the first time the lowest rate of economic growth since the Second World War, less than half the previous 
lowest rate of economic growth since the Second World War, the first time that economic growth, global economic growth is being put at a position of less than 1 per cent. This decline in economic growth, as we are seeing at a global level, but also as we are seeing in a place like China, combined with the end of the resources boom, has seen $115 billion of government revenue wiped away over the next four years. In October of last year, the government announced its $10.4 billion economic security strategy, which has put much needed cash into the hands of pensioners and low- and middle income earners. And that was principally done in December of last year. And the retail figures that have just come out indicate the significant impact that that has had on our economy, the significant positive impact that that's had on our economy. But at a global level, over the uh, Christmas New Year period, we have seen a further deterioration in global economic conditions. Indeed, the IMF has revised its forecasts down three times in the last four months, now predicting serious recessions in the major economies of the world, serious recessions in our major trading partners. Which brings us to yesterday's economic stimulus package, which brings us to today, where we consider the legislative underpinning of that economic stimulus package. The stimulus package provides for $42 billion, $30 billion of which will be spent on infrastructure, and almost $15 billion of that will be spent in education. In my electorate, Madam Deputy Speaker, in Geelong, we are an economy which is in transition, transitioning from an economy dependent upon manufacturing to a much more diverse economy. And we know how important education is in providing people with the skills for the jobs of the future. More than $800 million will be spent on roads and local infrastructure. And in Geelong, we know what local infrastructure can do to stimulate a local economy. The first stages of the Geelong Ring Road were opened just last December. And that ring road is going to give rise to some of the best transport and logistics land in the country. It will help establish Geelong not only as a Victorian centre for transport and logistics, but as a national centre for transport and logistics, and there are jobs in that. And more than $3.8 billion will be spent on making our homes more energy efficient through insulation and through increasing the solar hot water rebate. And in Geelong, we certainly know the effects of climate change, particularly recently. Last Thursday, Geelong experienced its hottest day ever recorded, and we are a city which is water-starved. Madam Deputy Speaker, my son began high school on Monday, and for almost the entirety of his life he has lived in a world of water restrictions, a measure which I had always thought was something that came into place in the most extreme of circumstances he sees as the definition of normality. In addition to the spending on infrastructure, $12.7 billion of financial assistance is being provided to middle and low income earners, so that almost 80 per cent of working Australians will receive some of the tax bonus of up to $950, which means that through that and through the measures that were implemented in December, almost 10.6 million Australians will benefit from these two economic stimulus packages. The net effect of all of that is to keep our economy in growth. As a result of this package, Treasury predicts that economic growth in 08 09 in Australia will be 1 per cent. In 2009 2010, three quarters of a per cent. Modest growth, to be sure, but growth in the context where our major trading, trading partners are experiencing a recession. And this package will also support 90,000 jobs. And really, that goes to the heart of what we are doing here. Because on this side of the House, we value jobs far more than flat earth, dry economics. Because we are about protecting the economic security, the self esteem, the human dignity that comes from work. And we are about avoiding the destruction of human activity, of human creativity from joblessness. The current American president when talking about his own economic stimulus package in America, said, it's a plan that recognises both the paradox and the promise of this moment. The fact that there are millions of Americans trying to find work, even as all around the country there is so much work to be done. That paradox exists in Australia as well. 
And our stimulus package is absolutely aimed at providing jobs, but it is aimed at providing jobs in areas where we do the work that needs to be done in this country, rebuilding our education system, rebuilding our nation's infrastructure, dealing with our responsibilities around climate change and in other areas that I haven't mentioned, in areas of homelessness and in bolstering the small business economy. Our economic stimulus package is about giving Australians work and having them work in these great areas. It is about engaging Australians in the grand endeavour which will take this country through the 21st century. The question is the bill will be now read a second time. The member for Casey. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I speak on these uh, five bills and in doing so fully support the position outlined from this side of the House, starting from the Leader of the Opposition earlier this morning, a position which he outlined in great detail, a position which he conceded will inevitably not be popular in many quarters, but a position which is responsible. We have seen from this government throughout the months of this global financial crisis panic and fumbling, an emphasis on announcement rather than substance, a determination to try and dominate the media cycle, which, if only matched by an equal determination to get the policy details right, would have stood Australia in greater stead. We know that spending massive, massive amounts of money is popular. $42 billion of spending will be popular. $84 billion would probably be twice as popular. But at the end of the day, you have to look at the quality of the measures and you have to answer the question of how that money will be repaid. You have to think of those who repay it. And that is something those opposite have never done. Madam Deputy Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition outlined with great clarity the fumbling and failures that we've seen throughout the course of this year. The hypocrisy that the Prime Minister in particular has brought to the most important economic debate in our lifetimes. We saw the fumbling and the failure on the bank guarantee. We saw that famous weekend with the television footage where the cameras had to come in and go out because the Prime Minister needed to roll his sleeves up and get them back in again, where there was focus on all of that but the Reserve Bank Governor was never rung. We saw the aftermath of that. We saw the Treasurer of this country back in October or November of last year when he announced the mid-year forecasts, unable to say what his own inflation forecasts were because he had spent more time preparing his lines, more time ensuring that he got out the required quota of decisive and other such descriptives, that the press gallery sat there in stunned silence while he looked for more than a minute for his own inflation forecast, something, as I've said to this House before, that summed up perfectly the lack of focus this government has on what matters and their obsession with the short-term popular policy hit. Over the course of the summer holidays, we Australians found out on Saturday morning that the Prime Minister had spent his time writing an 8,000-word essay. And again, that reminded me, if only he spent as much time thinking and consulting on the policy responses as he would have spent writing that. The other thing that came to mind is I felt sorry for his family. Can you imagine having to endure the triumphant recitals of draft after draft over the summer holidays of his latest essay. 
We've seen this Prime Minister bring a juvenile aspect to the debate, a juvenile determination to try and blame previous governments, and we saw that with his attack on 30 years of neoliberalism, forgetting, as has been pointed out, that around half that time Labor governments were in office. Until he wrote his essay, we were being reminded day by day by those opposite that, in their view, all the heavy lifting of reform, all the deregulation had been done by the Hawke and Keating government. It was Paul Keating, the former Prime Minister, who, as Treasurer, floated the dollar, cut taxes, engaged in deregulation. This was part of the proud Labor story until the weekend when we discovered that actually Paul Keating was just a nasty neoliberal after all. But what of course the Prime Minister forgets is at the very same time he's writing his essay and sending his essay to the newspapers, his own Deputy Prime Minister is telling the world at Davos what a great regulatory system Australia has. We have, an open and competitive market. we have open and competitive markets backed up by a world-class financial and prudential regulatory system. Indeed, given the flaws exposed by the global financial crisis in our financial and prudential regulation, I would have to say our system is even better than world-class. Our system also has an independent reserve bank. A reserve bank created by the previous government, an independent reserve bank that those opposite opposed, an independent reserve bank that those opposite tried to sue the then government for establishing. And today we have the Minister for Small Business saying much the same thing in the newspapers. You have the Prime Minister of the country in one breath able to say that Australia is in a better position than other countries, and the finance minister saying the same thing today, but unable to acknowledge that some of the fundamental reasons why Australia is in a better position include the regulatory strength that was introduced by the past government and the fact that we had paid off all our debt and we have a strong budget position. He couldn't even say it yesterday. And that just spoke volumes about him, I have to say, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm prepared to say that the Hawke and Keating government engaged in some good reforms. Uh, previous uh, ministers on uh, the other side have previously acknowledged that the Howard government engaged in some good reforms. That's what this public debate needs, not cheap, pathetic, juvenile approaches. And what we've seen with this package is more of the rushing and fumbling, where the Prime Minister's attitude is he's got together a package, it's comprehensive, uh, it's produced, there's minimal time for this parliament to consider it. It's released, and the attitude is, there it is, you haven't even got time to read it. Uh, if you don't agree with everything I've said, well, you're opposed to Australia's interests. Well, that is pathetic, and it's particularly so given the track record of failure and fumbling that we've seen through the course of this year. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, we have outlined our position on these bills. We have said where we think the emphasis is wrong, and we have said the scale of debt that involves is too high. The $96 billion of debt left by Prime Minister Keating 
60 billion or more of that was racked up in just five or six years. From 1990 to 96, net government debt increased from 30 billion to 96 billion. It took 10 years to pay off. Former Prime Minister John Howard summed up this situation rather well a few weeks ago. Going into deficit and debt is like riding down in an elevator. Getting out of it is like climbing the stairs. It's very easy for the Prime Minister, with his focus on spin and announcements, to not think about that, to not ensure that the spending is right. But Australians intuitively know this, and what he is proposing is something far, far bigger than that. This is not like getting an elevator down. This is like abseiling down a mountain and having to climb back. And it won't just be the taxpayers of today, particularly be the taxpayers of tomorrow. And what we've seen with some of the measures is again the inkling and the evidence that they haven't all been properly thought through. You've seen it with the cash payments, and that's been the subject of debate throughout the day and was the focus of question time. We've argued instead for tax cuts. I'd urge those opposite to look at some of the, the uh, newspapers today. And I've got the Australian here where a report has interviewed a few people about exactly what they're going to do with this cash handout. One lady, Nicole Drumble, said it's nice to get the money for free, said adding that she planned to use the bonus to pay off her credit card. Exactly what the government don't want it to do, they wanted to spend it. Another person interviewed, Anna Hurtick, 29, earns about $50,000. While she's happy about the bonus, Ms Hurtick said cash splashes were risky short term and would entrench the pessimism in the economy. People are already nervous, she said. If the government is willing to spend that much money on workers, then people might lose confidence even more. Tax cuts were a more pragmatic way of reviving the economy, she said. Our approach has been to make some constructive suggestions, and for those opposite to do what they haven't done at all since the financial crisis began, and that's consider an alternative view and consider something calmly. $42 billion, a couple of days of sitting. The Prime Minister and the Treasurer are asking the Parliament to spend less time agreeing to the biggest fiscal package, less time than they spent over the weekend putting it all together. Now, when you go to the small business announcement, what's been announced by the government will be welcome to some small businesses. But we say, if you're trying to help small businesses, and small businesses are struggling with cash flow, those with big cash flow problems, those having trouble paying their wages bill now, as retailers with three or four employees, this is out in Main Street, Australia, this wouldn't fit into a 7,700 word essay because it's too mainstream. A retailer who's employed three or four people and he's got to go to the bank on his tapped out overdraft and pay the wages bill. A depreciation allowance is not going to help him. He's got to spend money. Now, there are smart people opposite. They know this. It doesn't fit with the control freak nature of the Prime Minister, I know. But to get a benefit, they've got to spend money. Money they haven't got. And hello, in a credit crisis, money that's difficult to get. 
So, in a constructive sense, we say look at measures that will directly help reduce that employment cost now to preserve people in jobs. Look at the superannuation guarantee, those costs that are there, as the Leader of the Opposition said, look at it constructively. We've made other suggestions as well. If the government is serious, they'll consider them. Unfortunately, we suspect they won't because they haven't to date. But the opposition will do and say and vote according to what is responsible and will do so through the course of this week and will do so into the future. The government should recognise its mistakes of the last year and it should recognise that perhaps there are alternatives that might be better which will help Australia and it should recognise and reflect on the size of the debt it is promising to handball to future generations. The question is, the bill be now read a second time. The Chief Government Whip. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, I want to be unambiguous in my support of this $42 billion nation building and jobs plan. I was very interested in the contribution of the Honourable Member for Casey. He wanted to get into an argument about who was responsible and who had contributed most to our regulatory system. Indeed, both sides of the House agree that we've got a good one. We've got a good one. But no matter how good the regulatory system is, it's not going to stop Australians, Australia, ordinary men and women and their kids from being affected by this world global crisis. In fact, they just don't get it. Madam Deputy Speaker, there is no textbook about how to handle this. We can't go back to the last decade and get examples or find the rules or get the guidelines. This is an economic calamity of a proportion that none of us in this House have previously experienced. Now, it was very interesting that when we introduced the first package uh, of measures, a package of $10.2 billion, initially the opposition said, well, we're supporting it. We'll offer bipartisan support. But then they said, well, you haven't modelled this enough. Um, we need, uh, you know, there should be more Treasury modelling. You're moving too quickly. Um, you need to take your time. And what's the criticism now of this package? Well, the member for Patterson, a very senior cabinet, shadow cabinet minister, uh, the shadow minister for defence, has said, well, we need to have a 2020 summit about it. We shouldn't have announced it today or yesterday, as the prime minister did. What he should have announced was a 2020 summit. Now, as I seem to recall, that when we announced the 2020 summit, all the opposition thought that this was a ridiculous idea. But here you have a very senior back, uh, 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 shadow minister, the shadow minister for defence, saying, "Well, look, let's have a summit. Let's not do it now. Not, you know, we're not. Not only are they not opposed to it, but they're opposed to doing anything, according." to uh, the member for Patterson, he wants to have a 2020 summit. Well, I say, and I think it's the government's view and certainly the Prime Minister's view, that things in this world global economic crisis are moving so quickly. But before I dispense with our first package, it was interesting that the retail figures were out today about what happened in December, whether or not the first stimulus package worked. And what did those figures say? Notwithstanding the opposition saying it was a waste of time, waste of space, the money wouldn't be spent properly, wouldn't be spent, the, retail in, uh, the retailers would see no benefit at all. Of course, there was a kick up in the December retail figures. In fact, the government was right all along, all along. I thought because the opposition seemed to think that this is merely a minor domestic debate about an economic measure 
that we ought to look at what's happening in other countries. In the United States, that beloved president of the opposition, President George W. Bush, put in a stimulus package of $146 billion. And of course, President Barack Obama is now trying to get his stimulus package through the Congress, through the House, trying to get it through the Senate, uh, just as we'll face that same challenge with ours, $819 billion. So in the United States, it's $146 billion, um, first package, and the second package, $819 billion. And you know what some of the criticism of the experts are over in the United States? That maybe the second package hasn't gone far enough. It needs to be bigger. That's what the criticism seems to be. Now, in China, one of the most important trading partners of Australia, the good news, of course, is that they still have growth, but the growth has been dramatically cut back. What's the Chinese government doing in response to the world global economic crisis? They've got a stimulus package of $586 billion. Can I repeat that figure, Madam Deputy Speaker? $586 billion. It's a huge package. In, in uh, the US, uh, the, the uh, uh, the, sorry, the UK, the British stimulus package is $30 billion, £20 billion. In Germany, it's $66 billion or $50 billion um, euro. And I could go on and on and on. So what's the point I'm making? No country is immune from the world global economic crisis, including Australia, no matter how well placed we are. And we know one thing for certain, and that is our economy is going to be affected. Ordinary men and women in our electorate are going to face economic challenges that they have not faced before. And what should a government do? Should we have the 2020, um, sorry, the, uh, uh, the summit that uh, the member for Paterson is suggesting that we should? Or should we take action on behalf of ordinary Australians to try and minimise the damage of this unprecedented—I repeat, unprecedented—world global financial crisis. And of course, that's what Australia is doing. No one can stand up and say in this parliament, "This is a perfect measure," or that we know absolutely beyond, without any shadow of a doubt, what the impact will be. But we are taking action, and we do know that it will do good. It will do good. It's aimed at two things. Uh, it's aimed at nation building and it's aimed at preserving jobs and trying to weather the storm, weather the international storm uh, that we face. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, we have taken action as a government in our first uh, 12 months of government, the first stimulus package the $300 million to build local community infrastructure, the $15.2 billion COAG uh, funding package and the nation building package it announced in 2008. And what's the key features of this package? Well, we're uh, doing something very good for the environment. Um, we're uh, providing free ceiling installation for about 2.7 million Australian homes, not only good for them, those that live in those homes, but good for the environment. We're really making a big hit on Australian schools. We're going to build or upgrade a building in every one of Australia's 9,540 schools. And we're going to build more than 20,000 new public housing dwellings to try and combat homelessness. We're going to um, uh, refurbish a further 2,500 of those homes and make them available for occupants. In defence, we're going to provide, and they're even opposed to this, we're going to provide 800 new homes in metropolitan and regional centres for the families of our serving men and women. 
who are required at a moment's notice to put their life on the line in service of their country. And we're making a $950 one-off cash payment to eligible families, single workers, students, drought-affected farmers and others. A temporary business investment break for small and general businesses buying eligible assets. We're going to provide significantly increased funding for local community infrastructure and local road projects. Now, wouldn't you have thought, in response to this package, Madam Deputy Speaker, that we'd get some support from the opposition, but not on your Nelly? For anyone who is following this debate, they know that in the face of the, one of the worst financial crises um, to face the world, uh, the opposition was opposed and will oppose root and branch the measures, the bills that we are debating. They'll vote against them in the House and they'll vote against them in the Senate. They'll provide none. If, and if they're successful, and if they're successful, it will leave the Australian people naked as they face the tornado of the world uh, global economic crisis. I say um, I, I don't think that uh, the opposition is being responsible. I've run through the deficits that other countries have not only uh, that have uh, legislated for. I think they're irresponsible, because if they are successful in this place and in the Senate, then ordinary men and women will feel there will be no cushioning, no softening um, um, for them. They'll face the harsh realities. It doesn't matter whether they're a farmer, a small businessman, a tradesman, an ordinary worker working at a shopping centre, they'll get nothing off the opposition. This is what they have decided to do. And it's no sense of leadership. There's no real leadership by Malcolm Turnbull in all this. It's just a default to what oppositions do. They just oppose. They just oppose. And that's what's happened as we've tried as a government to battle the unknown. No one's had experience of it, and we've introduced a, a, quite a variety of measures, but without the support uh, of the opposition. I say shame on you. I say for all those schools in my electorate that may now miss out on all the building and maintenance, shame on you. For those of my constituents who would have received uh, $950 that you're trying to deny on them, deny them. I just say shame on you. I wish I could speak more, but can I just finish on this note? This government has never guillotined a bill in this house. They're saying that that there's um, insufficient time um, to debate these things. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, in the last Parliament, these are all the bills that were guillotined, including the NT intervention where we had less notice, less notice to debate it and certainly didn't get a look at any of the legislation. But we supported the government. Notwithstanding the shabby treatment, notwithstanding the guillotine, we supported the government as uh, initiative in the 40, uh, 41st parliament. And I just say, if you want bipartisanship, if you want to do the right thing by the Australian people, support this package. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. The member for Higgins. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, in August of uh, 2007, uh, world financial and equity markets began fluctuating wildly, or falling rapidly, I should say, in response to mortgage default rising in the United States, particularly in an area of the market which was known as the subprime mortgage market. In this sector of the market, to which uh, there was um, a lot of easy money given to very bad risks, mortgage defaults began to rise and people began to become concerned not just of those borrowers unable to service their loans but of those lenders who had made unwise loans and would take consequent losses. During the period of the Howard government when I was Treasurer, uh, I frequently adverted to the risk that this would be to the US economy and to the world economy generally. It was easy to see that a problem was developing, although nobody was sure of the particular dimension. 
Uh, we in Australia were concerned about the fallout of this crisis, and we had taken steps to ensure that Australia did not ape the experience of the United States, that we did not have exposure to subprime mortgages uh, in anywhere of the uh, dimension that they did in the United States. And we did that in several ways. Uh, one uh, was uh, by contacting the Australian Prudential Regulatory Authority, APRA, an organisation which our government had established, and ensuring that it was in contact with financial institutions in Australia, uh, ensuring that credit standards were not diminished. Uh, on occasion, I also called in the chief executives of the major Australian banks and said to them that the government was concerned about credit standards and we didn't want to see credit standards dropping in Australia. Uh, we didn't call uh, low credit uh, borrowers uh, subprime borrowers. The expression that was used in Australia was low dock borrowing. Uh, but these were low documentation uh, loans uh, which sometimes uh, could be given to people who had no capacity to repay them. And, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, Australia was much more successful than the United States in reducing exposure to bad credit risk and thereby limiting the losses that uh, our financial institutions would be exposed to if mortgage default should rise. As far as our government was concerned, the response uh, to the international developments uh, was that Australia had to ensure that it kept a robust and growing economy. Uh, those people who remember the slogan that the coalition had in the 2007 election remember that our slogan was go for growth. Go for growth. That it was important that Australia continue on a path of, of growth and that it ought to be underpinned and supported by strong economic policy. And in fact, in the course of the 2007 election, I announced a major reform of taxes which would reduce tax burdens for all Australians. Uh, as is known, the Australian Labor Party copied 91.5 per cent of those uh, tax cuts uh, and put them in place on the same timetable, at the same levels, all with the exception of reductions in the top marginal tax rate in its May 2008 budget. Now, there were many economic commentators that said that it was irresponsible to go for growth, that it was irresponsible to cut tax uh, in 2008. Uh, but I think as we look back, uh, we can see these were wise decisions. And if we should have been doing anything in 2008, we should have been putting more effort into going for growth uh, before the events uh, that, uh, that unfolded during the course of the year. Now, what was the uh, Labor government? Uh, response to uh, these developments? Well, the Labor government uh, decided that Australia's problem was very different in 2008. The uh, Treasurer said that the inflation genie was out of the bottle, that uh, spending was out of control, that spending should be uh, reduced and, by implication, interest rates increased. Uh, and indeed, uh, the Reserve Bank of Australia famously increased interest rates in uh, November of 2007 during an election campaign and was egged on by the Labor Party to continue increasing interest rates, which it did until as late as March of 2008. In the light of the uh, massive reductions in interest rates since, uh, massive reductions which of course I support, it is clear. Uh, that the course and the conduct of monetary policy in late 19, 2007 and early 2008 was mistaken and that uh, the turning point uh, in the economy was overlooked. Now, Mr Speaker, um, why was it that the Labor Party focused so heavily on uh, the so-called inflation uh, genie? Well, when you inherit an economy which uh, has a budget in surplus, no net debt, which has unemployment at 30-year lows, where the credit rating has been restored to a AAA rating on foreign currency bonds, 
where you have a future fund of $61 billion and a higher education endowment fund which has been set aside for the educational sector, where you inherit an economy in that condition, you have to find a fault somewhere. If you can't find a fault somewhere, what problem have you got to solve? And so the Labor Party, naturally enough, looked for a problem. The trouble is it was the wrong one. It's hard to remember, but if we go back to January of 2008, 12 months ago, the Australian Labor Party had not only diagnosed the wrong malady, it was administering the wrong treatment. I am amused to hear Labor member after Labor member stand on their feet and talk about the importance of new spending. When you were arguing in favour of your budget in May of 2008, please go and check the hands up. You were arguing in favour of new expenditure cuts in this budget year, in this budget, in May of 2008. Uh, I, could, uh, I could go to many of uh, the historical documents. The one I like the best is uh, Kevin Rudd on the 21st of January 2008. Uh, his address on how to build Australia's economic future. January of 2008. He said this, quote, Prior to the election, we ran as fiscal conservatives. With the election behind us, we now intend to govern as fiscal conservatives. He went on to say, Today I announce a fiscal target that will guide our budgetary process. Right, this is for this year's budget, May 2008. The financial year, which doesn't finish until the 30th of June, 2009. This is what he was saying: how he would be guiding this financial year. Today, I announce a fiscal target that will guide our budgetary process. The government aims to deliver a budget surplus of at least 1.5% GDP. This will require a determined, disciplined approach to spending and a hard-line approach to savings. A determined, disciplined approach to spending and a hard-line approach to savings. We are debating here a $42 billion package which will drive the budget into deficit of over $20 billion this year, which will accumulate deficits of over $100 billion in four years with a promise that we would be having a disciplined approach to savings. Now, I mean, it was a massive miscalculation, and we can all see that now. But it continued right through the course of 2008, and as late as September of this year, less than five months ago, September of last year, September of 2008, less than five months ago, the Treasurer told this House we identified the magnitude of the inflation challenge and dedicated ourselves to addressing it. It was imperative we abruptly change Australia's fiscal direction and move away from the reckless spending of our predecessors. <laughs> oh boy, they changed fiscal direction. They changed fiscal direction all right, but they didn't change fiscal direction by moving away from reckless spending. They didn't change it by, uh, by tightening spending. Here we are five months ago. We've changed fiscal direction. We've changed fiscal direction from a $20 billion surplus to a $22 billion deficit. We've changed it all right. It's just that the direction that we went was not forward, it was reverse. And in the space of five months, all these born again Keynesians were in September of last year part of the neoliberal conspiracy. believing in tighter budgets. They were going to show the Liberal Party who the real he-men of fiscal conservative were, conservatism were by reducing savings and building budget surpluses. But Mr. Ms. Madam Deputy Speaker, the 2008 budget would be today probably the most worthless financial document in Commonwealth history. What it predicted would happen in this year bears no relation to reality. 
It can best be filed in the fiction section of the parliamentary uh, library, because every one of its forecasts are now out of date. In November, we had the economic security strategy, which was going to bring economic security to Australia. It was a $10 billion spend. It's been and it's gone. And now we're back here in February with a $42 billion spend, being told that this $42 billion spend is the medicine that's required. This is the one that will do the trick. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, we're going to have a budget in May. Is there any speaker on that side of the parliament in the Labor Party who can promise us there won't be another spending package by May or June or September? Anybody said in any of the documents this is the last shot of the locker? We were being told that $10 billion was the government's ask in November. Now we're being told it's $42 billion. And in between, by the way, I think uh, sometime over Christmas, the finance minister said he was going to form a raiser gang. A raiser gang. At the time that the government was apparently gearing up to a $42 billion spend, they were also going to set up a raise again. Now, what this tells me and what this statement tells me is this is a government which is unnerved and which is str struggling step by step with measures that it itself has not consistently thought out, and it's on the run. It was on the run in November. It's on the run in February. Now let's go to the documents themselves. The, the documents say that this $42 billion will support 90,000 jobs, not create, not keep, will support, make some contribution in Treasury speak. $42 billion, 90,000 jobs. It's about $400,000 a job. Do the arithmetic. Do the math. Do you think that's good value? for taxpayers' money—$42 billion for 90,000 uh, jobs. The government says, oh, well, the budget is sliding into deficit because our revenues are down. But if you go to the table, the reconciliation table 4.2, the budget has been driven into deficit by policy decisions, not by parameter changes. $10 billion in my EFO and another $18 billion in this statement. $28 billion off a starting point of 20 or 22. It's policy decisions. It's got nothing to do with revenues. The figure that the Prime Minister talks about of revenues, $115 billion, is in the out years. He's telling you what he thinks is going to happen between now and June of 2011. And if you believe that, you'd believe anything. This is a government that in May could not tell us what the position will be in February and now wants you to believe that it is telling you in February of this year what the position will be in June of three years' time? It has no idea. Those forward estimates bear as much relation to what is going to happen as the May budget bears relation to where we now are. All we can tell you is that the government wants to be able to borrow another $125 billion. Because that's the ceiling they've sought, $125 billion. That's what they think they'll need authority, and they are asking this parliament for authority to borrow $125 billion over the next few years. Well, when we came to office, when I became treasurer, Australian Net Commonwealth debt was $96 billion. It took us 10 years to pay that back. Labor has not even had one full budget year, and it is seeking authority to reborrow the lot, to take us right back where we were before we began a 10-year program to free this Commonwealth of its net debt. Ten long years. And as somebody who did take a budget out of deficit the last time Labor was in government, I can tell you it's hard to do. 
And even the government itself is not saying it will do it in this term. And even the government itself can't tell you what's going to be the financial situation in two years. And temporary deficits can last for a very long period of time. According to this statement, it'll last for at least four years. And that's even if growth returns to trend. And what if growth doesn't return to trend? What if growth doesn't return to trend? Where will the Australian budget be then? What will be the debt position? We are embarking now on a slippery slope where nobody can tell you what the final outcome will be and no one has an exit plan. And we are reversing 10 years of hard work. And we're doing it to support 90,000 jobs at more than $400,000 a job. Now, the other point I want to make about the quality of this spend is a large part of it is transfer payments. Transfer payments to stay-at-home mothers, to families with children. They will welcome those payments. Of course they will welcome those payments. But a family which is worried about the risk of losing its job is not going to take a payment and go and spend it. We've got a payment, get out to the cafe, we'll order a big dinner. That family is rationally going to say, if unemployment is rising and my job's at risk, I'm going to save the money or preferably pay down my mortgage. I'm going to de-gear the household, just like businesses are de-gearing. You can understand that. And this why is why, of course, the Treasury has not modelled more jobs as an outcome. But you know the thing that amazes me about these transfer payments is apparently there's nothing for the unemployed. It's a working tax bonus. If you had income in the previous year, you'll get a bonus. What if you were on un unemployment benefits? I thought this was a package to help people who are out of work. Nothing for the unemployed. And nothing for the businesses to reduce the costs of labour who might want to put on more employees. And, and nothing in there to give an incentive to add to the labour supply. Oh, there are transfer payments, all right, and they will be welcomed by the people who get them. But this is not a job strategy. Why else can I say this is low quality spend? I, I can tell you why else. Because the proposal to insulate houses was rolled up to me as Treasurer. This is not new. It was rolled up to me. This proposal didn't materialise because of the global financial crisis. This has been down in the Department of Environment for years. And what's happened, once it's become known in the Federal Public Service that the spend is on, the departments have dusted off their spending proposals. We didn't need a global financial crisis to go into the insulation of houses. That's been on the books for years. Similarly, in relation to the rebuilding of schools, that's been on the books for years. The state Labor governments have been responsible for that for years. That we didn't need a global financial crisis to rebuild educational institutions. What's happened here is that the departments have dusted off their spending programs. They've found a few neophytes who are running the government, and they've said, bring them in. Give it $42 billion. Take the budget down by $100 billion, and we'll be back in May for more. And if you think that this program is going to be the difference between recession and growth in the Australian economy, you have not read it. Half a per cent, the Australian Treasury says, for $42 billion. It's not value for money. It's taking Australia on a bad path into deficit and debt. It's hard to get out of those, and it is expired. not in Australia's. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Kingston. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I am very pleased to rise to support the six bills before us that combine make up the Rudd government's second stimulus package. And it was very interesting to hear the member for Higgins talk about uh, his prediction of the global financial crisis, not last year, but in fact the year before. In fact, he knew about it when he came up uh, with uh, Mr Howard with the Go for Growth slogan. The only issue is that the member for Higgins forgot to tell the rest of the world that, in fact, the global financial crisis was coming. But the legislation before us today is critical for the difficult world economic circumstances that face our nation. 
The $42 million nation building and jobs plan adds to the economic security package announced in October last year. Despite the ill-founded waffling of the opposition, the economic security strategy announced in October last year did have a positive impact on demand in targeted areas of the economy, including retail. In my electorate, evidence from those in the building industry indicate that the percentage of first home owners purchasing newly constructed houses have increased from 8 per cent two years ago to 25 per cent since the introduction of the first stimulus package, suggesting that first home buyers who had previously been excluded from the market will now, have now been able to fill the void left by the investors as a direct result of the first stimulus package. And since the announcement and delivery of the Rudd government's first economic stimulus package, the outlook for the global economy has deteriorated significantly, with the International Monetary Fund now forecasting a deep global recession. The global slowdown has driven almost all major advanced economies into recession, including the United States, the United Kingdom, Japan and Europe. In addition, growth forecasts for one of our major trading partners, China, have halved. Australia has not been immune from the unfolding global financial crisis. This global crisis has already had an impact on Australia's projected economic growth, unemployment and government revenue. Faced with this situation, the Australian government has a choice. The first option is to do nothing and let markets do their worst. The second is to act now to support jobs and growth. It seems that the opposition favours the former, do nothing, despite this being contrary to advice from the International Monetary Fund, other international organisations and inconsistent with action taken by other countries around the world. This government, the Rudd government, is committed to the latter. That is, when the markets have failed, the government must intervene to support jobs and growth. The government is committed to action, an action that has been widely supported by economists and peak business associations alike. The package before us today outlines our plan to stimulate our economy, to support jobs and families and, in doing so, invest in the long-term future of our nation. The package is made up of two broad areas, direct payments to householders worth approximately $12 billion, and the second is investment in infrastructure worth around $30 billion. The government will provide to householders a one-off cash bonus for those paying tax who have earned up to $100,000 in the year 07-08 financial year. This payment will be made to each and every taxpayer. In addition, there are a number of other bonuses, a back-to-school bonus which will provide an upfront payment of $950 for families on tax benefit part A for each eligible school child to assist with the costs of going back to school. In my electorate of Kingston, this payment will assist approximately 13,000 13, families. Further assistance, Madam Deputy Speaker, of a $950 bonus will be paid to those families on Family Tax Benefit B, farmers experiencing hardship and to those uh, receiving the education entry payment. These payments are designed to provide an immediate stimulus to the Australian economy. And as I said in the introduction, a large component of this package is also to invest in the nation's infrastructure. In particular, a large part of the package is to invest in our nation's schooling infrastructure. Now, as I've gone around my electorate, school after school principal has indicated to me that they believe they provide a world-class education. They have many dedicated staff and a committed school community. However, many have indicated to me that it is their buildings that have let them down. It is their physical environment that holds their school back. And therefore, I'm extremely pleased that the package before us today provides a huge investment to equip our schools for the 21st century. This package will provide all primary schools with the opportunity to build libraries, halls, gymnasiums or classroom refurb refurbishments, and for secondary schools to build science labs and learning centres. 
Now, the opposition has argued uh, on and on today that this package before us is not investing in our children's future. However, most sensible people do understand, even if the opposition does not, that there is no better or more direct way that you invest in a, your children's future by investing in their education, and that's exactly what we're doing. And as the Prime Minister has stated, not only will we will be investing in the future of our kids, but every school will be a centre of economic activity, supporting local building and construction jobs. In addition, the package provides investment in other critical infrastructure, including building social housing aimed at lifting the quantity of public housing stock, working towards this government's aim and a very admirable aim of halving homelessness by 2020, to invest to provide safer roads by fixing black spots, fixing regional roads and installing boom gates. The, na the National Building and Job Package also invests now to help householders adjust to the, a carbon-restrained res future by providing insulation to those that do not have it. This package also provides assistance to small business in the form of an investment allowance for small business. This spending package will affect the budget bottom line, and as announced on Monday, government revenue has sharply declined as a result of the global recession, and a temporary budget deficit is unavoidable. However, in these extraordinary times, a temporary budget deficit is the responsible course of action to project and protect jobs and growth. This course of action that the government proposes is action that has been advocated by both the IMF and supported by Australian business, business groups and economists. However, despite the current need for temporary budget deficit, this government is committed to returning the budget to surplus and has a plan to do this. We have committed that when growth returns, this government will allow tax revenue to recover naturally and has committed to cap spending in order to pay off this temporary deficit. Now, we have heard that some members of the uh, opposition say that rather than the targeted package that we're proposing, they would prefer an unspecified amount of tax cuts to stimulate the economy. Now, apart from the fact that this approach has been discredited and would not provide an immediate stimulus necessary, it would also plunge the budget into long-term structural deficit. And so, uh, in fact, what we're seeing here is the opposition is, is uh, advocating a much long, long, longer deficit than, than, in fact, the temporary de deficit that this government is uh, advocating. But now, today, the opposition has announced that it is opposing this package, um, just showing that the Liberal Party and Nationals prefer to have their head in the sand rather than face these serious economic times, focusing on cheap political point scoring rather than thinking about the welfare of the Australian people. This country is facing the deepest global recession since World War II. We must act now if we want to reduce the impact of this global recession on Australia. We need to stimulate our economy, and the plan before us here today does just this, but also invests in our nation's long-term future that will not only provide a benefit today, but for years into the future. Therefore, um, I do commend the bills before the, uh, before the House. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I call the member for Fadden. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. There is an ugly fellowship, a not-so-secret society that exists today. It's called the Fellowship of the Deficit. It remains unique. It knows no bounds and has no restraints. It's confined to no faction. It imposes no intellectual requirement nor geographic location. In the words of the mantra, union membership is required and blind adherence to collectivism is needed. No other circumstance or condition whatsoever, save the merit of lazy spending, shall entitle a Labor leader to membership of the Fellowship of the Deficit, as all post-war Labor leaders have become members. So today the coalition draws a line in the sand, a line that divides the experienced, prudent economic management of the coalition against a panic, deficit-ready government. A line that divides a coalition that paid off the last Labor government's exorbitant $96 billion debt with this Labor government 
that presented a bill of one page to thrust this country into up to $200 billion worth of debt. Today we draw a line in the sand that divides the coalition as those clearly able to manage money compared to a Labor government with a long line of deficits from Whitlam, Hawke, Keating and now the current Prime Minister. This Prime Minister has demanded that the Parliament approve his plans for $42 billion, every cent borrowed and has given 42 hours a billion dollars an hour and has refused to discuss, let alone negotiate, the package with the coalition. Almost all economists agree that the recession has a long way to go. This will not be a V recession. We pray it won't be an L recession. It may likely be a U recession. And yet the Rudd Labor government is panicking. It's loaded its magazine and fired off all the rounds in one burst, rather than a few highly targeted rounds with enough left in the magazine to see through the action. And even with this reckless handout of cash and massive debt fuelled spending, the Prime Minister's package still predicts unemployment topping 7 per cent in just over a year, a third of a million Australians out of work. The previous Labor government left a legacy of $96 billion in debt, of unpaid and unaccounted for super liabilities approaching $60 billion, of interest payments on the debt of $8 billion a year in 1996, when you add it all together, about $200 billion of debt remained unfunded, unpaid super liabilities and interest payments. It took 11 years to pay off that $200 billion, and now, in a stroke of a pen, within 12 months, this government is seeking to put the nation back into the same parlous economic position upon which we have dragged the country after 11 and a half years. Yet the question is, what's caused this panic? What has caused this economic conservative, or should I say social democrat, or was it a Christian democrat? I can't keep up, Madam Deputy Speaker. What's caused the panic? And history going back to October will illuminate a little more. On October the 10th, the Leader of the Opposition and the Shadow Treasurer called on the Rudd government to take three immediate decisions to strengthen the Australian economy. Increase the proposed government-backed deposit guarantee to $100,000. Increase the investment into AAA-rated residential mortgage-backed securities to the Australian Office of Financial Management and announced that it will defer the implementation of an emissions trading scheme. Yet not to be outdone, two days later, on October the 12th, the Prime Minister announced an unlimited deposit guarantee, heaven forbid, if he was to agree with the opposition leader, to operate for a period of three years and a guarantee of wholesale term funding by authorised deposit-taking institutions in return for a fee. The Prime Minister told Australians he was acting on the best advice of the regulators. On the 12th of October, he said in a press release, my officials have done considerable work on the design of these arrangements, and in developing these measures, I've received advice from the Governor of the Reserve Bank. You can imagine our shock, surprise and indeed horror, Madam Deputy Speaker, when on the 21st of October it was confirmed the Prime Minister had not directly consulted with the Governor of the Reserve Bank prior to announcing the unlimited guarantee. On the 22nd of October, during the Senate estimates process, we learned that the decision to increase the deposit guarantee was entirely a political decision in response to the Leader of the Opposition calling for a $100,000 scheme. The government had initially claimed that they had been working on the detail of its bank guarantee policy for over a week, and the weekend meeting was merely to finalise details. With the savings of thousands of Australians frozen due to the unlimited guarantee, the Treasurer said to go to Centrelink. On the 23rd of October, he said in a press conference, and I'll quote, just so you don't get confused. So I say to the people who've been adversely affected by some of these decisions that have been taken in these managed investment funds to fully investigate your eligibility for income support through Centrelink. That's what I say to them, end quote. On the 25th of November, the Treasurer denied ever making his callous and disrespectful remarks. He said on the 25th of November, and I'll quote again, I did not say that all people who manage investment funds who are experiencing problems should go to Centrelink. 
End quote. Well, clearly there's a problem there, isn't there, Mr Treasurer? On the 24th of October, the Treasurer announced a $1 million cap would now apply. The exclusion of foreign bank branches from the guarantee clearly resulted in a rush of transfers from foreign bank branches to banks covered by the guarantee. On October 28, the government finally sorted out the anomaly of foreign bank branches being excluded from the guarantee, while foreign subsidiary banks had been included. Clearly, this caused considerable problems. Panic after panic after panic. But the panic continued, like the running of the bulls of Pamplona. The Labor government then spent $10.4 billion with no economic analysis from Treasury, no modelling, no analysis that could be considered as to the impact of the stimulus. That was half their fallacious forecasted budget surplus, with no modelling. They stated it would create 75,000 jobs, yet every indication is that jobs have disappeared since that time. And now, after all that panic from October the 10th right the way through, not a sound decision throughout, now we move up to the latest curtain raiser. The Prime Minister planning to plunge Australia into debt with a poorly considered, for the most part non productive and ineffective $42 billion fiscal stimulus package with every cent borrowed, every cent to be paid off by the next generation by yours and my children. Furthermore, looking to increase bond issuance by a further $125 million to a total of $200 million to finance the debt. $200 billion in bond issuance to finance the debt. This, combined with the Labor state debt of almost $100 billion, means Labor governments across the country are looking to rack up public debt of almost a third of a trillion dollars—$3,000 million. That must be paid off with interest. That must be paid off by future generations. It took 11 and a half years of the magic of the Howard Costello years to pay off the last $200 billion left by a Labor government. Likewise, the excess of the Whitlam years were paid off by the coalition government that followed it. The Howard government paid off the recklessness of the Hawke-Keating years. And I can see it now. The $200 billion recklessness of Prime Minister Rudd years will again have to be paid off by the real economic conservatives in this country, the coalition. The federal debt of $200 billion is 9,500 for every man, woman and child. The Treasurer has learnt from rolling out will create 75,000 jobs from the last stimulus. This one's only going to support 90,000 jobs. Well, that's $470,000 per job. Great mathematics, Mr Treasurer. And you ask why the coalition steadfastly refused to back this ludicrous plan. We've drawn a line in the sand. And what's the plan to pay it back? Yesterday and today, in question time, the Treasurer stated that as soon as the economy starts to grow above the trend, they'll start to think to pay it back. As soon as the economy automatically recovers. So as if we're praying to the automatic gods that the economy will recover by itself, that when it moves above the trend, what does above the trend actually mean? There is zero plan to pay back a fifth of a trillion dollars of debt, and that is reprehensible. On the other side of the ledger, the real economic managers, the real economic conservatives, have actually proposed permanent tax cuts, currently scheduled for 1 July 2009 and 2010, be brought forward and backdated to 1 January this year. The opposition leader has stated by the middle of 2010 this would leave a two-income household earning $80,000 approximately $1,700 better off. Perhaps the largest gap in the government package is the lack of measures that directly and broadly support employment, particularly employment in the small to medium business sector, as the minister would know across the table, accounts for almost 50 per cent of employment in the country. And whilst accelerated depreciation, which is less than 8 per cent of what the government is proposing, has some merit, 
The coalition believes measures that more directly and immediately improve the cash flow position of small firms and help them protect and create jobs is preferable. One proposal the coalition is seeking to discuss with the government is the Commonwealth paying a portion of the superannuation guarantee levy on behalf of small employers for the next two years. This measure will directly improve the cash position of small firms, directly reduce the costs of employment and directly contribute to preserving jobs. These measures are fairer. They represent a better targeted and more effective stimulus for the economy. They better protect jobs. The Coalition has invited the government to sit down and discuss alternative stimulus measures which would be responsible and allow sufficient capacity in public finances to meet emerging challenges. The silence has been somewhat deafening. The Coalition is committed to sound economic management and to ensuring the government spending is of high quality and reduces the burden on Australian taxpayers and their children, which is why the current package cannot and will not be supported. A line has been drawn in the sand, and the real economic managers will indeed stand up. The question is that this bill be now read a second time.